The Perennial Philosophy Aldous Huxley Contents That Art Thou The Nature of the Ground Personality, Sanctity, Divine Incarnation God in the World Charity Mortification, Non-Attachment, Right Livelihood Truth Religion and Temperament Self-Knowledge Grace and Free Will Good and Evil Time and Eternity Salvation, Deliverance, Enlightenment Immortality and Survival Silence Prayer Suffering Faith God is not mocked Tantum religio potuit suaterum malarum Idolatry Emotionalism The Miraculous Ritual, Symbol, Sacrament Spiritual Exercises Perseverance and Regularity Contemplation, Action and Social Utility Introduction Philosophia Perennis, the phrase was coined by Leibniz, but the thing, the metaphysic that recognizes a divine reality substantial to the world of things and lives and minds, the psychology that finds in the soul something similar to, or even identical with, divine reality, the ethic that places man's final end in the knowledge of the immanent and transcendent ground of all being, the thing is immemorial and universal. Rudiments of the perennial philosophy may be found among the traditionary lore of primitive peoples in every region of the world, and in its fully developed forms it has a place in every one of the higher religions. A version of this highest common factor in all preceding and subsequent theologies was first committed to writing more than 25 centuries ago, and since that time the inexhaustible theme has been treated again and again, from the standpoint of every religious tradition and in all the principal languages of Asia and Europe. In the pages that follow I have brought together a number of selections from these writings, chosen mainly for their significance, because they effectively illustrated some particular point in the general system of the perennial philosophy, but also for their intrinsic beauty and memorableness. These selections are arranged under various heads and embedded, so to speak, in a commentary of my own, designed to illustrate and connect, to develop and, where necessary, to elucidate. Knowledge is a function of being. When there is a change in the being of the knower, there is a corresponding change in the nature and amount of knowing. For example, the being of a child is transformed by growth and education into that of a man, among the results of this transformation is a revolutionary change in the way of knowing and the amount and character of the things known. As the individual grows up, his knowledge becomes more conceptual and systematic in form, and its factual, utilitarian content is enormously increased. But these gains are offset by a certain deterioration in the quality of immediate apprehension, a blunting and a loss of intuitive power. Or consider the change in his being which the scientist is able to induce mechanically by means of his instruments. Equipped with a spectroscope and a 60-inch reflector an astronomer becomes, so far as eyesight is concerned, a superhuman creature, and, as we should naturally expect, the knowledge possessed by this superhuman creature is very different, both in quantity and quality, from that which can be acquired by a stargazer with unmodified, merely human eyes. Nor are changes in the knower's physiological or intellectual being the only ones to affect his knowledge. What we know depends also on what, as moral beings, we choose to make ourselves. Practice, in the words of William James, may change our theoretical horizon, and this in a twofold way, it may lead into new worlds and secure new powers. Knowledge we could never attain, remaining what we are, may be attainable in consequences of higher powers and a higher life, which we may morally achieve. To put the matter more succinctly, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And the same idea has been expressed by the Sufi poet, Jalaluddin Rumi, in terms of a scientific metaphor. The astrolabe of the mysteries of God is love. This book, I repeat, is an anthology of the perennial philosophy, but, though an anthology, it contains but few extracts from the writings of professional men of letters and, though illustrating a philosophy, hardly anything from the professional philosophers. The reason for this is very simple. The perennial philosophy is primarily concerned with the one, divine reality substantial to the manifold world of things and lives and minds. 
but the nature of this one reality is such that it cannot be directly and immediately apprehended except by those who have chosen to fulfill certain conditions, making themselves loving, pure in heart, and poor in spirit. Why should this be so? We do not know. It is just one of those facts which we have to accept, whether we like them or not and however implausible and unlikely they may seem. Nothing in our everyday experience gives us any reason for supposing that water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen, and yet when we subject water to certain rather drastic treatments, the nature of its constituent elements becomes man of saint similarly. Nothing in our everyday experience gives us much reason for supposing that the mind of the average sensual man has, as one of its constituents, something resembling, or identical with, the reality substantial to the manifold world, and yet, when that mind is subjected to certain rather drastic treatments, the divine element, of which it is in part at least composed, becomes manifest, not only to the mind itself, but also, by its reflection in external behavior, to other minds. It is only by making physical experiments that we can discover the intimate nature of matter and its potentialities. And it is only by making psychological and moral experiments that we can discover the intimate nature of mind and its potentialities. In the ordinary circumstances of average sensual life these potentialities of the mind remain latent and unmanifest. If we would realize them, we must fulfill certain conditions and obey certain rules, which experience has shown empirically to be valid. In regard to few professional philosophers and men of letters is there any evidence that they did very much in the way of fulfilling the necessary conditions of direct spiritual knowledge? When poets or metaphysicians talk about the subject matter of the perennial philosophy, it is generally at second hand. But in every age there have been some men and women who chose to fulfill the conditions upon which alone, as a matter of brute empirical fact, such immediate knowledge can be had, and of these a few have left accounts of the reality they were thus enabled to apprehend and have tried to relate, in one comprehensive system of thought, the given facts of this experience with the given facts of their other experiences. To such first-hand exponents of the perennial philosophy those who knew them have generally given the name of saint or prophet, sage or enlightened one. And it is mainly to these, because there is good reason for supposing that they knew what they were talking about, and not to the professional philosophers or men of letters, that I have gone for my selections. In India two classes of scripture are recognized, the Shruti, or inspired writings which are their own authority, since they are the product of immediate insight into ultimate reality, and the Smriti, which are based upon the Shruti and from them derive such authority as they have. The Shruti, in Shankara's words, depends upon direct perception. The Smriti plays a part analogous to induction, since, like induction, it derives its authority from an authority other than itself. This book, then, is an anthology, with explanatory comments, of passages drawn from the Shruti and Smriti of many times and places. Unfortunately, Familiarity with traditionally hallowed writings tends to breed, not indeed contempt, but something which, for practical purposes, is almost as bad, namely a kind of reverential insensibility, a stupor of the spirit, an inward deafness to the meaning of the sacred words. For this reason, when selecting material to illustrate the doctrines of the perennial philosophy, as they were formulated in the West, I have gone almost always to sources other than the Bible. This Christian Smriti, from which I have drawn, is based upon the Shruti of the canonical books, but has the great advantage of being less well known and therefore more vivid and, so to say, more audible than they are. Moreover much of this Smriti is the work of genuinely saintly men and women, who have qualified themselves to know at first hand what they are talking about. Consequently it may be regarded as being itself a form of inspired and self-validating Shruti, and this in a much higher degree than many of the writings now included in the biblical canon. In recent years a number of attempts have been made to work out a system of empirical theology. But in spite of the subtlety and intellectual power of such writers as Sorley, Oman, and Tennant, the effort has met with only a partial success. Even in the hands of its ablest exponents empirical theology is not particularly convincing. The reason, it seems to me, 
must be sought in the fact that the empirical theologians have confined their attention more or less exclusively to the experience of those whom the theologians of an older school called the unregenerate, that is to say, the experience of people who have not gone very far in fulfilling the necessary conditions of spiritual knowledge. But it is a fact, confirmed and reconfirmed during two or three thousand years of religious history, that the ultimate reality is not clearly and immediately apprehended, except by those who have made themselves loving, pure in heart and poor in spirit. This being so, it is hardly surprising that a theology based upon the experience of nice, ordinary, unregenerate people should carry so little conviction. This kind of empirical theology is on precisely the same footing as an empirical astronomy, based upon the experience of naked eye observers. With the unaided eye a small, faint smudge can be detected in the constellation of small, faint smudge can be detected in the constellation of Orion, and doubtless an imposing cosmological theory could be based upon the observation of this smudge. But no amount of such theorizing, however ingenious, could ever tell us as much about the galactic and extragalactic nebulae as can direct acquaintance by means of a good telescope, camera, and spectroscope. Analogously, no amount of theorizing about such hints as may be darkly glimpsed within the ordinary, unregenerate experience of the manifold world can tell us as much about divine reality as can be directly apprehended by a mind in a state of detachment, charity, and humility. Natural science is empirical, but it does not confine itself to the experience of human beings in their merely human and unmodified condition. Why empirical theologians should feel themselves obliged to submit to this handicap, goodness only knows. And of course, so long as they confine empirical experience within these all too human limits, they are doomed to the perpetual stultification of their best efforts. From the material they have chosen to consider, no mind, however brilliantly gifted, can infer more than a set of possibilities or, at the very best, specious probabilities. The self-validating certainty of direct awareness cannot in the very nature of things be achieved except by those equipped with the moral astrolabe of God's mysteries. If one is not oneself a sage or saint, the best thing one can do, in the field of metaphysics, is to study the works of those who were, and who, because they had modified their merely human mode of being were capable of a more than merely human kind and amount of knowledge. Chapter 1 That Art Thou In studying the perennial philosophy we can begin either at the bottom, with practice and morality, or at the top, with the consideration of metaphysical truths, or, finally, in the middle, at the focal point where mind and matter, action and thought have their meeting place in human psychology. The lower gate is that preferred by strictly practical teachers, men who, like Gautama Buddha, have no use for speculation and whose primary concern is to put out in men's hearts the hideous fires of greed, resentment and infatuation. Through the upper gate go those whose vocation it is to think and speculate, the born philosophers and theologians. The middle gate gives entrance to the exponents of what has been called spiritual religion, the devout contemplatives of India, the Sufis of Islam, the Catholic mystics of the later Middle Ages, and, in the Protestant tradition, such men as Denk and Frank and Castellio, as Everard and John Smith and the first Quakers and William Law. It is through this central door, and just because it is central, that we shall make our entry into the subject matter of this book. The psychology of the perennial philosophy has its source in metaphysics and issues logically in a characteristic way of life and system of ethics. Starting from this midpoint of doctrine, it is easy for the mind to move in either direction. In the present section we shall confine our attention to but a single feature of this traditional psychology, the most important, the most emphatically insisted upon by all exponents of the perennial philosophy and, we may add, the least psychological. For the doctrine that is to be illustrated in this section belongs to autology rather than psychology, to the science, not of the personal ego, but of that eternal self in the depth of particular, individualized selves, and identical with, or at least akin to, the divine ground. Based upon the direct experience of those who have fulfilled the necessary conditions of such knowledge, this teaching is expressed most succinctly in the Sanskrit formula, Tati Vam Aci, that art thou, the Atman, or immanent eternal self, is one with Brahman, the absolute principle of all existence, 
and the last end of every human being is to discover the fact for himself, to find out who he really is. The more God is in all things, the more he is outside them. The more he is within, the more without. Eckhart. Only the transcendent, the completely other, can be imminent without being modified by the becoming of that in which it dwells. The perennial philosophy teaches that it is desirable and indeed necessary to know the spiritual ground of things, not only within the soul, but also outside in the world and, beyond world and soul, in its transcendent otherness, in heaven. Though God is everywhere present, yet he is only present to thee in the deepest and most central part of thy soul. The natural senses cannot possess God or unite thee to him, nay, thy inward faculties of understanding, will and memory can only reach after God, but cannot be the place of his habitation in thee. But there is a root or depth of thee from whence all these faculties come forth, as lines from a center, or as branches from the body of the tree. This depth is called the center, the fund, or bottom of the soul. This depth is the unity, the eternity, I had almost said the infinity, of thy soul, for it is so infinite that nothing can satisfy it or give it rest but the infinity of God. William Law This extract seems to contradict what was said above, but the contradiction is not a real one. God within and God without, these are two abstract notions, which can be entertained by the understanding and expressed in words. But the facts to which these notions refer cannot be realized and experienced except in the deepest and most central part of the soul. And this is true no less of God without than of God within. But though the two abstract notions have to be realized, to use a spatial metaphor, in the same place, the intrinsic nature of the realization of God within is qualitatively different from that of the realization of God without and each in turn is different from that of the realization of the ground as simultaneously within and without, as the self of the perceiver and at the same time, in the words of the Bhagavad Gita, as that by which all this world is pervaded. When Svetakata was twelve years old he was sent to a teacher, with whom he studied until he was twenty-four. After learning all the Vedas, he returned home full of conceit in the belief that he was consummately well educated, and very censorious. His father said to him, Svetakatu, my child, you who are so full of your learning and so censorious, have you asked for that knowledge by which we hear the unbearable, by which we perceive what cannot be perceived and know what cannot be known? What is that knowledge, sir? asked Svetakatu. His father replied, as by knowing one lump of clay all that is made of clay is known, the difference being only in name, but the truth being that all is clay, so, my child, is that knowledge, knowing which we know all. But surely these venerable teachers of mine are ignorant of this knowledge, for if they possessed it they would have imparted it to me. Do you, sir, therefore give me that knowledge? So be it, said the father. And he said, Bring me a fruit of the Niagrata tree. Here is one, sir. Break it. It is broken, sir. What do you see there? Some seeds, sir, exceedingly small. Break one of these. It is broken, sir. What do you see there? Nothing at all. The father said, My son, that subtle essence which you do not perceive there, in that very essence stands the being of the huge Niagara tree. In that which is the subtle essence all that exists has itself. That is the true, that is the self, and thou, Svetakatu, art that. Pray, sir, said the son, tell me more. Be it so, my child, the father replied, and he said, place this salt in water, and come to me tomorrow morning. The son did as he was told. Next morning the father said, bring me the salt which you put in the water. The son looked for it, but could not find it, for the salt, of course, had dissolved. The father said, taste some of the water from the surface of the vessel. How is it? Salty. Taste some from the middle. How is it? Salty. Taste some from the bottom. How is it? Salty. The father said, throw the water away and then come back to me again. The son did so, but the salt was not lost, for salt exists forever. Then the father said, 
here likewise in this body of yours, my son, you do not perceive the true, but there in fact it is. In that which is the subtle essence, all that exists has itself. That is the true, that is the self, and thou, Svetakatu, art that. From the Shandochya Upanishad The man who wishes to know the that which is thou may set to work in any one of three ways. He may begin by looking inwards into his own particular thou and, by a process of dying to self, self in reasoning, self in willing, self in feeling, come at last to a knowledge of the self, the kingdom of God that is within. Or else he may begin with the thou's existing outside himself, and may try to realize their essential unity with God and, through God, with one another and with his own being. Or, finally, and this is doubtless the best way, he may seek to approach the ultimate that both from within and from without, so that he comes to realize God experimentally as at once the principle of his own thou and of all other thous, animate and inanimate. The completely illuminated human being knows, with law, that God is present in the deepest and most central part of his own soul, but he is also and at the same time one of those who, in the words of Plotinus, see all things, not in process of becoming, but in being, and see themselves in the other. Each being contains in itself the whole intelligible world. Therefore all is everywhere. Each is their all, and all is each. Man as he now is has ceased to be the all. But when he ceases to be an individual, he raises himself again and penetrates the whole world. It is from the more or less obscure intuition of the oneness that is the ground and principle of all multiplicity that philosophy takes its source. And not alone philosophy, but natural science as well. All science, in Meyerson's phrase, is the reduction of multiplicities to identities. Divining the one within and beyond the many, we find an intrinsic plausibility in any explanation of the diverse in terms of a single principle. The philosophy of the Upanishads reappears, developed and enriched, in the Bhagavad Gita and was finally systematized, in the ninth century of our era, by Shankara. Shankara's teaching, simultaneously theoretical and practical, as is that of all true exponents of the perennial philosophy, is summarized in his versified treatise, Vivka Chudarnani, The Crest Jewel of Wisdom. All the following passages are taken from this conveniently brief and untechnical work. The Atman is that by which the universe is pervaded, but which nothing pervades, which causes all things to shine, but which all things cannot make to shine. The nature of the one reality must be known by one's own clear spiritual perception, it cannot be known through a pandit, learned man. Similarly the form of the moon can only be known through one's own eyes. How can it be known through others? Who but the Atman is capable of removing the bonds of ignorance, passion and self-interested action? Liberation cannot be achieved except by the perception of the identity of the individual spirit with the universal spirit. It can be achieved neither by yoga, physical training, nor by sankhya, speculative philosophy, nor by the practice of religious ceremonies, nor by mere learning. Disease is not cured by pronouncing the name of medicine, but by taking medicine. Deliverance is not achieved by repeating the word Brahman, but by directly experiencing Brahman. The Atman is the witness of the individual mind and its operations. It is absolute knowledge. The wise man is one who understands that the essence of Brahman and of Atman is pure consciousness, and who realizes their absolute identity. The identity of Brahman and Atman is affirmed in hundreds of sacred texts. Caste, creed, family and lineage do not exist in Brahman. Brahman has neither name nor form, transcends merit and demerit, is beyond time, space and the objects of sense experience. Such is Brahman, and thou art that. Meditate upon this truth within your consciousness. Supreme, beyond the power of speech to express Brahman may yet be apprehended by the eye of pure illumination. Pure, absolute and eternal reality, such is Brahman, and thou art that. Meditate upon this truth within your consciousness. Though one, Brahman is the cause of the many. There is no other cause. And yet Brahman is independent of the law of causation. Such is Brahman, and thou art that. Meditate upon this truth within your consciousness. The truth of Brahman may be understood intellectually. 
But, even in those who so understand, the desire for personal separateness is deep-rooted and powerful, for it exists from beginningless time. It creates the notion, I am the actor, I am he who experiences. This notion is the cause of bondage to conditional existence, birth, and death. It can be removed only by the earnest effort to live constantly in union with Brahman. By the sages, the eradication of this notion and the craving for personal separateness is called liberation. It is ignorance that causes us to identify ourselves with the body, the ego, the senses, or anything that is not the Atman. He is a wise man who overcomes this ignorance by devotion to the Atman. When a man follows the way of the world, or the way of the flesh, or the way of tradition, i.e. when he believes in religious rites and the letter of the scriptures, as though they were intrinsically sacred, knowledge of reality cannot arise in him. The wise say that this threefold way is like an iron chain, binding the feet of him who aspires to escape from the prison house of this world. He who frees himself from the chain achieves deliverance. Shankara In the Taoist formulations of the perennial philosophy there is an insistence, no less forcible than in the Upanishads, the Gita, and the writings of Shankara, upon the universal immanence of the transcendent spiritual ground of all existence. What follows is an extract from one of the great classics of Taoist literature, the Book of Chuangtzu, most of which seems to have been written around the turn of the 4th and 3rd centuries BC. Do not ask whether the principle is in this or in that, it is in all beings. It is on this account that we apply to it the epithets of supreme, universal, total. It has ordained that all things should be limited, but is itself unlimited, infinite. As to what pertains to manifestation, the principle causes the succession of its phases, but is not this succession. It is the author of causes and effects, but is not the causes and effects. It is the author of condensations and dissipations, birth and death, changes of state, but is not itself condensations and dissipations. All proceeds from it and is under its influence. It is in all things, but is not identical with beings, for it is neither differentiated nor limited. Chuangtzu From Taoism we pass to that Mahayana Buddhism which, in the Far East, came to be so closely associated with Taoism, borrowing and bestowing until the two came at last to be fused in what is known as Zen. The Langkavatara Sutra, from which the following extract is taken, was the scripture which the founder of Zen Buddhism expressly recommended to his first disciples. Those who vainly reason without understanding the truth are lost in the jungle of the Vijnanas, the various forms of relative knowledge, running about here and there and trying to justify their view of ego substance. The self realized in your inmost consciousness appears in its purity, this is the Tathagatagarbha, literally, Buddha womb which is not the realm of those given over to mere reasoning. Pure in its own nature and free from the category of finite and infinite, universal mind is the undefiled Buddha womb, which is wrongly apprehended by sentient beings. Langkavatara Sutra One nature, perfect and pervading, circulates in all natures, one reality, all comprehensive, contains within itself all realities. The one moon reflects itself wherever there is a sheet of water and all the moons and the waters are embraced within the one moon. The Dharma body, the Absolute, of all the Buddhas enters into my own being. And my own being is found in union with theirs. The inner light is beyond praise and blame. Like space it knows no boundaries. Yet it is even here, within us, ever retaining its serenity and fullness. It is only when you hunt for it that you lose it. You cannot take hold of it but equally you cannot get rid of it. And while you can do neither, it goes on its own way. You remain silent and it speaks, you speak, and it is dumb, the great gate of charity is wide open, with no obstacles before it. Yung Chiatashi I am not competent, nor is this the place to discuss the doctrinal differences between Buddhism and Hinduism. Let it suffice to point out that, when he insisted that human beings are by nature non-Atman, the Buddha was evidently speaking about the personal self and not the universal self. The Brahman controversialists, who appear in certain of the Pali scriptures, never so much as mention the Vedanta doctrine of the identity of Atman and Godhead and the non-identity of ego and Atman. 
What they maintain and Gautama denies is the substantial nature and eternal persistence of the individual psyche. As an unintelligent man seeks for the abode of music in the body of the lute, so does he look for a soul within the skandhas, the material and psychic aggregates, of which the individual mind-body is composed. Dot. About the existence of the Atman that is Brahman, as about most other metaphysical matters, the Buddha declines to speak, on the ground that such discussions do not tend to edification or spiritual progress among the members of a monastic order, such as he had found it. But though it has its dangers, though it may become the most absorbing, because the most serious and noblest, of distractions, metaphysical thinking is unavoidable and finally necessary. Even the Hinayanists found this, and the later Mahayanists were to develop, in connection with the practice of their religion, a splendid and imposing system of cosmological, ethical, and psychological thought. This system was based upon the postulates of a strict idealism and professed to dispense with the idea of God. But moral and spiritual experience was too strong for philosophical theory, and under the inspiration of direct experience, the writers of the Mahayana Sutras found themselves using all their ingenuity to explain why the Tathagata and the Bodhisattvas display an infinite charity towards beings that do not really exi saint at the same time they stretched the framework of subjective idealism so as to make room for universal mind, qualified the idea of soullessness with the doctrine that, if purified, the individual mind can identify itself with the universal mind or Buddha womb, and, while maintaining godlessness, asserted that this realizable universal mind is the inner consciousness of the eternal Buddha and that the Buddha mind is associated with a great compassionate heart which desires the liberation of every sentient being and bestows divine grace on all who make a serious effort to achieve man's final end. In a word, despite their inauspicious vocabulary, the best of the Mahayana Sutras contain an authentic formulation of the perennial philosophy, a formulation which in some respects, as we shall see when we come to the section, God in the world, is more complete than any other. In India, as in Persia, Mohammedan thought came to be enriched by the doctrine that God is immanent as well as transcendent, while to Mohammedan practice were added the moral disciplines and spiritual exercises, by means of which the soul is prepared for contemplation or the unitive knowledge of the Godhead. It is a significant historical fact that the poet Saint Kabir is claimed as a CO religionist both by Muslims and Hindus. The politics of those whose goal is beyond time are always pacific, it is the idolaters of past and future, of reactionary memory and utopian dream, who do the persecuting and make the wars. Behold but one in all things, it is the second that leads you astray. Kabir. That this insight into the nature of things and the origin of good and evil is not confined exclusively to the saint, but is recognized obscurely by every human being is proved by the very structure of our language. For language, as Richard Trench pointed out long ago, is often wiser, not merely than the vulgar, but even than the wisest of those who speak it. Sometimes it locks up truths which were once well known, but have been forgotten. In other cases it holds the germs of truths which, though they were never plainly discerned, the genius of its framers caught a glimpse of in a happy moment of divination. For example, how significant it is that in the Indo-European languages, as Darmstetter has pointed out, the root meaning too should connote badness. The Greek prefix dis, as in dyspepsia, and the Latin dis, as in dishonorable, are both derived from duo. The cognate bis gives a pejorative sense to such modern French words as bevue, blunder, literally to sight. Traces of that second which leads you astray can be found in dubious, doubt and zweeful, for to doubt is to be double-minded. Bunyan has his mister facing both ways, and modern American slang its two-timers. Obscurely and unconsciously wise, our language confirms the findings of the mystics and proclaims the essential badness of division, a word, incidentally, in which our old enemy too makes another decisive appearance. Here it may be remarked that the cult of unity on the political level is only an idolatrous ersatz for the genuine religion of unity on the personal and spiritual levels. Totalitarian regimes justify their existence by means of a philosophy of political monism, according to which the state is God on earth, unification under the heel of the divine state is salvation, and all means to such unification, however intrinsically wicked, are right and may be used without scruple. 
This political monism leads in practice to excessive privilege and power for the few and oppression for the many, to discontent at home and war abroad. But excessive privilege and power are standing temptations to pride, greed, vanity and cruelty, oppression results in fear and envy, war breeds hatred, misery and despair. All such negative emotions are fatal to the spiritual life. Only the pure in heart and poor in spirit can come to the unitive knowledge of God. Hence, the attempt to impose more unity upon societies than their individual members are ready for makes it psychologically almost impossible for those individuals to realize their unity with the divine ground and with one another. Among the Christians and the Sufis, to whose writings we now return, the concern is primarily with the human mind and its divine essence. My me is God, nor do I recognize any other me except my God himself. Saint Catherine of Genoa In those respects in which the soul is unlike God, it is also unlike itself. Saint Bernard I went from God to God, until they cried from me in me, O thou I. Bayezid of Bistun Two of the recorded anecdotes about this Sufi saint deserve to be quoted here. When Bayezid was asked how old he was, he replied, four years. They said, how can that be? He answered, I have been veiled from God by the world for seventy years, but I have seen him during the last four years. The period during which one is veiled does not belong to one's life. On another occasion someone knocked at the saint's door and cried, is Bayezid here? Bayezid answered, is anybody here except God? To gauge the soul we must gauge it with God for the ground of God and the ground of the soul are one and the same. Eckhart The spirit possesses God essentially in naked nature, and God the spirit. Ruiz broke. For though she sink all sinking in the oneness of divinity, she never touches bottom. For it is of the very essence of the soul that she is powerless to plumb the depths of her creator. And here one cannot speak of the soul any more, for she has lost her nature yonder in the oneness of divine essence. There she is no more called soul, but is called immeasurable being. Eckhart The knower and the known are one. Simple people imagine that they should see God, as if he stood there and they hear. This is not so. God and I, we are one in knowledge. Eckhart I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. Or perhaps it might be more accurate to use the verb transitively and say, I live, yet not I for it is the Logos who lives me, lives me as an actor lives his part. In such a case, of course, the actor is always infinitely superior to the role. Where real life is concerned, there are no Shakespearean characters, there are only Addisonian Catos or, more often, grotesque Monsieur Perichons and Charlie's aunts mistaking themselves for Julius Caesar or the Prince of Denmark. But by a merciful dispensation it is always in the power of every dramatis persona to get his low, stupid lines pronounced and supernaturally transfigured by the divine equivalent of Agaric. Oh my God, how does it happen in this poor old world that thou art so great and yet nobody finds thee, that thou callest so loudly and nobody hears thee, that thou art so near and nobody feels thee, that thou givest thyself to everybody and nobody knows thy name. Men flee from thee and say they cannot find thee. They turn their backs and say they cannot see thee, they stop their ears and say they cannot hear thee. Hans Denk Between the Catholic mystics of the 14th and 15th centuries and the Quakers of the 17th there yawns a wide gap of time made hideous, so far as religion is concerned, with interdenominational wars and persecutions. But the gulf was bridged by a succession of men, whom Rufus Jones, in the only accessible English work devoted to their lives and teachings, has called the spiritual reformers. Denk, Frank, Castellio, Weigel, Everard, the Cambridge Platonists, in spite of the murdering and the madness, the apostolic succession remains unbroken. The truths that had been spoken in the Theologia Germanica, that book which Luther professed to love so much and from which, if we may judge from his career, he learned so singularly little, were being uttered once again by Englishmen during the Civil War and under the Cromwellian dictatorship. The mystical tradition, perpetuated by the Protestant spiritual reformers, had become diffused, as it were, in the religious atmosphere of the time when George Fox had his first great opening and knew by direct experience. 
that every man was enlightened by the divine light of Christ, and I saw it shine through all, and that they that believed in it came out of condemnation and came to the light of life, and became the children of it, and that they that hated it and did not believe in it, were condemned by it, though they made a profession of Cresaint this I saw in the pure openings of light, without the help of any man, neither did I then know where to find it in the scriptures, though afterwards. Searching the scriptures, I found it. From Fox's Journal The doctrine of the inner light achieved a clearer formulation in the writings of the second generation of Quakers. There is, wrote William Penn, something nearer to us than scriptures, to wit, the word in the heart from which all scriptures come. And a little later Robert Barclay sought to explain the direct experience of Tativam Aci in terms of an Augustinian theology that had, of course, to be considerably stretched and trimmed before it could fit the facts. Man, he declared in his famous theses, is a fallen being, incapable of good, unless united to the divine light. This divine light is Christ within the human soul, and is as universal as the seed of sin. All men, heathen as well as Christian, are endowed with the inward light, even though they may know nothing of the outward history of Christ's life. Justification is for those who do not resist the inner light and so permit of a new birth of holiness within them. Goodness needeth not to enter into the soul, for it is there already, only it is unperceived. Theologia Germanica When the ten thousand things are viewed in their oneness, we return to the origin and remain where we have always been. Senti sen. It is because we don't know who we are, because we are unaware that the kingdom of heaven is within us, that we behave in the generally silly, the often insane, the sometimes criminal ways that are so characteristically human. We are saved, we are liberated and enlightened, by perceiving the hitherto unperceived good that is already within us, by returning to our eternal ground and remaining where, without knowing it, we have always been. Plato speaks in the same sense when he says, in the Republic, that the virtue of wisdom more than anything else contains a divine element which always remains. And in the Theetetus he makes the point, so frequently insisted upon by those who have practiced spiritual religion, that it is only by becoming godlike that we can know God, and to become godlike is to identify ourselves with the divine element which in fact constitutes our essential nature, but of which, in our mainly voluntary ignorance, we choose to remain unaware. They are on the way to truth who apprehend God by means of the divine, light by the light. Philo Philo was the exponent of the Hellenistic mystery religion which grew up, as Professor Goodenough has shown, among the Jews of the dispersion, between about 200 BC and 100 AD reinterpreting the Pentateuch in terms of a metaphysical system derived from Platonism, Neo-Pythagoreanism and Stoicism, Philo transformed the holy transcendental and almost anthropomorphically personal God of the Old Testament into the imminent transcendent absolute mind of the perennial philosophy. But even from the orthodox scribes and Pharisees of that momentous century which witnessed, along with the dissemination of Philo's doctrines, the first beginnings of Christianity and the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem, even from the guardians of the law we hear significantly mystical utterances. Hillel, the great rabbi whose teachings on humility and the love of God and man read like an earlier, cruder version of some of the gospel sermons, is reported to have spoken these words to an assemblage in the courts of the temple. If I am here, it is Jehovah who is speaking through the mouth of his prophet, everyone is here. If I am not here, no one is here. The beloved is all in all, the lover merely veils him, the beloved is all that lives, the lover a dead thing. Jalaluddin Rumi There is a spirit in the soul, untouched by time and flesh, flowing from the spirit, remaining in the spirit, itself wholly spiritual. In this principle is God ever verdant, ever flowering in all the joy and glory of his actual self. Sometimes I have called this principle the tabernacle of the soul, sometimes a spiritual light, anon I say it is a spark. But now I say that it is more exalted over this and that than the heavens are exalted above the earth. So now I name it in a nobler fashion. It is free of all names and void of all forms. It is one and simple, as God is one and simple, and no man can in any wise behold it. Eckhart
Crude formulations of some of the doctrines of the perennial philosophy are to be found in the thought systems of the uncivilized and so-called primitive peoples of the world. Among the Maoris, for example, every human being is regarded as a compound of four elements, a divine eternal principle, known as the toy aura, an ego, which disappears at death, a ghost shadow, or psyche, which survives death, and finally a body. Among the Oglala Indians the divine element is called the Sikhan, and this is regarded as identical with the Tun, or divine essence of the world. Other elements of the self are the Nagi, or personality, and Naya, or vital soul. After death the Sikhan is reunited with the divine ground of all things, the Nagi survives in the ghost world of psychic phenomena and the Naya disappears into the material universe. In regard to no 20th century primitive society can we rule out the possibility of influence by, or borrowing from, some higher culture. Consequently, we have no right to argue from the present to the passant because many contemporary savages have an esoteric philosophy that is monotheistic with a monotheism that is sometimes of the that art thou variety, we are not entitled to infer offhand that Neolithic or Paleolithic men held similar views. More legitimate and more intrinsically plausible are the inferences that may be drawn from what we know about our own physiology and psychology. We know that human minds have proved themselves capable of everything from imbecility to quantum theory, from main camp and sadism to the sanctity of Philip Neri, from metaphysics to crossword puzzles, power politics and the Mrs. Solemnus. We also know that human minds are in some way associated with human brains, and we have fairly good reasons for supposing that there have been no considerable changes in the size and conformation of human brains for a good many thousands of years. Consequently it seems justifiable to infer that human minds in the remote past were capable of as many and as various kinds and degrees of activity as our minds at the present time. It is, however, certain that many activities undertaken by some minds at the present time were not, in the remote past, undertaken by any minds at all. For this there are several obvious reasons. Certain thoughts are practically unthinkable except in terms of an appropriate language and within the framework of an appropriate system of classification. Where these necessary instruments do not exist, the thoughts in question are not expressed and not even conceived. Nor is this all, the incentive to develop the instruments of certain kinds of thinking is not always present. For long periods of history and prehistory it would seem that men and women, though perfectly capable of doing so, did not wish to pay attention to problems, which their descendants found absorbingly interesting. For example, there is no reason to suppose that, between the 13th century and the 20th, the human mind underwent any kind of evolutionary change, comparable to the change, let us say, in the physical structure of the horse's foot during an incomparably longer span of geological time. What happened was that men turned their attention from certain aspects of reality to certain other aspects. The result, among other things, was the development of the natural sciences. Our perceptions and our understanding are directed, in large measure, by our will. We are aware of, and we think about, the things which, for one reason or another, we want to see and understand. Where there's a will there is always an intellectual way. The capacities of the human mind are almost indefinitely great. Whatever we will to do, whether it be to come to the unitive knowledge of the Godhead, or to manufacture self-propelled flamethrowers, that we are able to do, provided always that the willing be sufficiently intense and sustained. It is clear that many of the things to which modern men have chosen to pay attention were ignored by their predecessors. Consequently the very means for thinking clearly and fruitfully about those things remained uninvented not merely during prehistoric times, but even to the opening of the modern era. The lack of a suitable vocabulary and an adequate frame of reference, and the absence of any strong and sustained desire to invent these necessary instruments of thought, here are two sufficient reasons why so many of the almost endless potentialities of the human mind remained for so long unactualized. Another and, on its own level, equally cogent reason is this, much of the world's most original and fruitful thinking is done by people of poor physique and of a thoroughly unpractical turn of mind. Because this is so, and because the value of pure thought, whether analytical or integral, 
has everywhere been more or less clearly recognized, provision was, and still is made by every civilized society for giving thinkers a measure of protection from the ordinary strains and stresses of social life. The hermitage, the monastery, the college, the academy, and the research laboratory, the begging bowl, the endowment, patronage, and the grant of taxpayers' money, such are the principal devices that have been used by actives to conserve that rare bird, the religious, philosophical, artistic or scientific contemplative. In many primitive societies conditions are hard and there is no surplus wealth. The born contemplative has to face the struggle for existence and social predominance without protection. The result, in most cases, is that he either dies young or is too desperately busy merely keeping alive to be able to devote his attention to anything else. When this happens the prevailing philosophy will be that of the hardy, extrovert man of action. All this sheds some light, dim, it is true, and merely inferential, on the problem of the perennialness of the perennial philosophy. In India the scriptures were regarded, not as revelations made at some given moment of history, but as eternal gospels, existent from everlasting to everlasting, inasmuch as coeval with man, or for that matter with any other kind of corporeal or incorporeal being possessed of reason. A similar point of view is expressed by Aristotle, who regards the fundamental truths of religion as everlasting and indestructible. There have been ascents and falls, periods, literally roads around or cycles, of progress and regress, but the great fact of God as the first mover of a universe which partakes of his divinity has always been recognized. In the light of what we know about prehistoric man, and what we know amounts to nothing more than a few chipped stones, some paintings, drawings, and sculptures, and of what we may legitimately infer from other, better documented fields of knowledge, what are we to think of these traditional doctrines? My own view is that they may be true. We know that born contemplatives in the realm both of analytic and of integral thought have turned up in fair numbers and at frequent intervals during recorded history. There is therefore every reason to suppose that they turned up before history was recorded. That many of these people died young or were unable to exercise their talents is certain. But a few of them must have survived. In this context it is highly significant that, among many contemporary primitives, two thought patterns are found an exoteric pattern for the unphilosophic many and an esoteric pattern, often monotheistic, with a belief in a god not merely of power, but of goodness and wisdom, for the initiated few. There is no reason to suppose that circumstances were any harder for prehistoric men than they are for many contemporary savages. But if an esoteric monotheism of the kind that seems to come natural to the born thinker is possible in modern savage societies, the majority of whose members accept the sort of polytheistic philosophy that seems to come natural to men of action, a similar esoteric doctrine might have been current in prehistoric societies. True, the modern esoteric doctrines may have been derived from higher cultures. But the significant fact remains that, if so derived, they yet had a meaning for certain members of the primitive society and were considered valuable enough to be carefully preserved. We have seen that many thoughts are unthinkable apart from an appropriate vocabulary and frame of reference. But the fundamental ideas of the perennial philosophy can be formulated in a very simple vocabulary, and the experiences to which the ideas refer can and indeed must be had immediately and apart from any vocabulary whatsoever. Strange openings and theophanies are granted to quite small children, who are often profoundly and permanently affected by these experiences. We have no reason to suppose that what happens now to persons with small vocabularies did not happen in remote antiquity. In the modern world, as von Intrahern and Wordsworth, among others, have told us, the child tends to grow out of his direct awareness of the one ground of things, for the habit of analytical thought is fatal to the intuitions of integral thinking, whether on the psychic or the spiritual level. Psychic preoccupations may be and often are a major obstacle in the way of genuine spirituality. In primitive societies now, and, presumably, in the remote past, there is much preoccupation with, and a widespread talent for, psychic thinking. But a few people may have worked their way through psychic into genuinely spiritual experience, just as, even in modern industrialized societies, 
a few people work their way out of the prevailing preoccupation with matter and through the prevailing habits of analytical thought into the direct experience of the spiritual ground of things. Such, then, very briefly are the reasons for supposing that the historical traditions of Oriental and our own classical antiquity may be true. It is interesting to find that at least one distinguished contemporary ethnologist is in agreement with Aristotle and the Vedantists. Orthodox ethnology, writes Dr. Paul Radin in his Primitive Man as Philosopher, has been nothing but an enthusiastic and quite uncritical attempt to apply the Darwinian theory of evolution to the facts of social experience. And he adds that no progress in ethnology will be achieved until scholars rid themselves once and for all of the curious notion that everything possesses a history, until they realize that certain ideas and certain concepts are as ultimate for man, as a social being, as specific physiological reactions are ultimate for him, as a biological being. Among these ultimate concepts, in Dr. Radin's view, is that of monotheism. Such monotheism is often no more than the recognition of a single dark and numinous power ruling the world. But it may sometimes be genuinely ethical and spiritual. The 19th century's mania for history and prophetic utopianism tended to blind the eyes of even its acutest thinkers to the timeless facts of eternity. Thus we find T. H. Green writing of mystical union as though it were an evolutionary process and not, as all the evidence seems to show, a state which man, as man, has always had it in his power to realize. An animal organism, which has its history in time, gradually becomes the vehicle of an eternally complete consciousness, which in itself can have no history, but a history of the process by which the animal organism becomes its vehicle. But in actual fact it is only in regard to peripheral knowledge that there has been a genuine historical development. Without much lapse of time and much accumulation of skills and information, there can be but an imperfect knowledge of the material world. But direct awareness of the eternally complete consciousness, which is the ground of the material world, is a possibility occasionally actualized by some human beings at almost any stage of their own personal development, from childhood to old age, and at any period of the race's history. Chapter 2 The Nature of the Ground Our starting point has been the psychological doctrine, that art thou. The question that now quite naturally presents itself is a metaphysical one, what is the that to which the thou can discover itself to be akin? To this the fully developed perennial philosophy has at all times and in all places given fundamentally the same answer. The divine ground of all existence is a spiritual absolute, ineffable in terms of discursive thought, but, in certain circumstances, susceptible of being directly experienced and realized by the human being. This absolute is the god without form of Hindu and Christian mystical phraseology. The last end of man, the ultimate reason for human existence, is unitive knowledge of the divine ground, the knowledge that can come only to those who are prepared to the to self and so make room, as it were, for God. Out of any given generation of men and women very few will achieve the final end of human existence, but the opportunity for coming to unitive knowledge will, in one way or another, continually be offered until all sentient beings realize who in fact they are. The absolute ground of all existence has a personal aspect. The activity of Brahman is Isvara, and Isvara is further manifested in the Hindu trinity and, at a more distant remove, in the other deities or angels of the Indian pantheon. Analogously, for Christian mystics, the ineffable, attributeless Godhead is manifested in a trinity of persons, of whom it is possible to predicate such human attributes as goodness, wisdom, mercy, and love, but in a supereminent degree. Finally there is an incarnation of God in a human being, who possesses the same qualities of character as the personal God, but who exhibits them under the limitations necessarily imposed by confinement within a material body born into the world at a given moment of time. For Christians there has been and, ex hypodice, can be but one such divine incarnation, for Indians there can be and have been many. In Christendom as well as in the East, contemplatives who follow the path of devotion conceive of, and indeed directly perceive the Incarnation as a constantly renewed fact of experience. Christ is forever being begotten within the soul by the Father, and the play of Krishna is the pseudo-historical symbol of an everlasting truth of psychology and metaphysics, the fact that, in relation to God, the personal soul is always feminine and passive. 
Mahayana Buddhism teaches these same metaphysical doctrines in terms of the three bodies of Buddha, the Absolute Dharmakaya, known also as the Primordial Buddha, or Mind, or the Clear Light of the Void, the Samagakaya, corresponding to Isvara or the personal god of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and finally the Nirmanakaya, the material body, in which the Logos is incarnated upon earth as a living, historical Buddha. Among the Sufis, al haqt the real, seems to be thought of as the abyss of Godhead underlying the personal Allah, while the Prophet is taken out of history and regarded as the incarnation of the Logos. Some idea of the inexhaustible richness of the divine nature can be obtained by analyzing, word by word, the invocation with which the Lord's Prayer begins, Our Father who art in heaven. God is ours, ours in the same intimate sense that our consciousness and life are ours. But as well as imminently ours, God is also transcendently the personal Father, who loves his creatures and to whom love and allegiance are owed by them in return. Our Father who art, when we come to consider the verb in isolation, we perceive that the immanent transcendent personal God is also the immanent transcendent one, the essence and principle of all existence. And finally God's being is in heaven, the divine nature is other than, and incommensurable with, the nature of the creatures in whom God is immanent. That is why we can attain to the unitive knowledge of God only when we become in some measure God-like, only when we permit God's kingdom to come by making our own creaturely kingdom go. God may be worshipped and contemplated in any of his aspects. But to persist in worshipping only one aspect to the exclusion of all the rest is to run into grave spiritual peril. Thus, if we approach God with the preconceived idea that he is exclusively the personal, transcendental, all-powerful ruler of the world, we run the risk of becoming entangled in a religion of rites, propitiatory sacrifices, sometimes of the most horrible nature, and legalistic observances. Inevitably so, for if God is an unapproachable potentate out there, giving mysterious orders, this kind of religion is entirely appropriate to the cosmic situation. The best that can be said for ritualistic legalism is that it improves conduct. It does little, however, to alter character and nothing of itself to modify consciousness. Things are a great deal better when the transcendent, omnipotent personal God is regarded as also a loving father. The sincere worship of such a God changes character as well as conduct, and does something to modify consciousness. But the complete transformation of consciousness, which is enlightenment, deliverance, salvation, comes only when God is thought of as the perennial philosophy affirms him to be, imminent as well as transcendent, superpersonal as well as personal, and when religious practices are adapted to this conception. When God is regarded as exclusively imminent, legalism and external practices are abandoned and there is a concentration on the inner light. The dangers now are quietism and antinomianism, a partial modification of consciousness that is useless or even harmful, because it is not accompanied by the transformation of character which is the necessary prerequisite of a total, complete, and spiritually fruitful transformation of consciousness. Finally it is possible to think of God as an exclusively superpersonal being. For many persons this conception is too philosophical to provide an adequate motive for doing anything practical about their beliefs. Hence, for them, it is of no value. It would be a mistake, of course, to suppose that people who worship one aspect of God to the exclusion of all the rest must inevitably run into the different kinds of trouble described above. If they are not too stubborn in their ready-made beliefs, if they submit with docility to what happens to them in the process of worshipping, the God who is both immanent and transcendent, personal and more than personal, may reveal himself to them in his fullness. Nevertheless, the fact remains that it is easier for us to reach our goal if we are not handicapped by a set of erroneous or inadequate beliefs about the right way to get there and the nature of what we are looking for. Who is God? I can think of no better answer than, He who is. Nothing is more appropriate to the eternity which God is. If you call God good, or great, or blessed, or wise, or anything else of this sort, it is included in these words, namely, He is. Saint Bernard The purpose of all words is to illustrate the meaning of an object. When they are heard, they should enable the hearer to understand this meaning, 
and this according to the four categories of substance, of activity, of quality, and of relationship. For example cow and horse belong to the category of substance. He cooks or he prays belongs to the category of activity. White and black belong to the category of quality. Having money or possessing cows belongs to the category of relationship. Now there is no class of substance to which the Brahman belongs, no common genus. It cannot therefore be denoted by words which, like being in the ordinary sense, signify a category of things. Nor can it be denoted by quality, for it is without qualities, nor yet by activity because it is without activity, at rest, without parts, or activity, according to the scriptures. Neither can it be denoted by relationship, for it is without a second and is not the object of anything but its own self. Therefore it cannot be defined by word or idea, as the scripture says, it is the one before whom words recoil. Shankara It was from the nameless that heaven and earth sprang. The named is but the mother that rears the ten thousand creatures, each after its kind. Truly, only he that rids himself forever of desire can see the secret essences. He that has never rid himself of desire can see only the outcomes. Lao Tzu One of the greatest favors bestowed on the soul transiently in this life is to enable it to see so distinctly and to feel so profoundly that it cannot comprehend God at all. These souls are herein somewhat like the saints in heaven, where they who know him most perfectly perceive most clearly that he is infinitely incomprehensible, for those who have the less clear vision do not perceive so clearly as do these others how greatly he transcends their vision. Saint John of the Cross When I came out of the Godhead into multiplicity, then all things proclaimed, there is a God, the personal creator. Now this cannot make me blessed, for hereby I realize myself as creature. But in the breaking through I am more than all creatures, I am neither God nor creature, I am that which I was and shall remain, now and forevermore. There I receive a thrust which carries me above all angels. By this thrust I become so rich that God is not sufficient for me, in so far as he is only God in his divine works. For in thus breaking through, I perceive what God and I are in common. There I am what I was. There I neither increase or decrease. For there I am the immovable which moves all things. Here man has won again what he is eternally and ever shall be. Here God is received into the soul. Eckhart The Godhead gave all things up to God. The Godhead is poor, naked, and empty as though it were not, it has not, wills not, wants not, works not, gets not. It is God who has the treasure and the bride in him, the Godhead is as void as though it were not. Eckhart we can understand something of what lies beyond our experience by considering analogous cases lying within our experience. Thus, the relations subsisting between the world and God, and between God and the Godhead seem to be analogous, in some measure at least, to those that hold between the body, with its environment, and the psyche, and between the psyche and the spirit. In the light of what we know about the second, and what we know is not, unfortunately, very much, we may be able to form some not too hopelessly inadequate notions about the first ain't. Mind affects its body in four ways, subconsciously, through that unbelievably subtle physiological intelligence, which Drish hypostatized under the name of the ent leche, consciously, by deliberate acts of will, subconsciously again, by the reaction upon the physical organism of emotional states having nothing to do with the organs or processes reacted upon, and, either consciously or subconsciously, in certain supernormal manifestations. Outside the body matter can be influenced by the mind in two ways, first, by means of the body and, second, by a supernormal process, recently stoothed under laboratory conditions and described as the PK effect. Similarly, the mind can establish relations with other minds either indirectly, by willing its body to undertake symbolic activities, such as speech or writing, or supernormally, by the direct approach of mind reading, telepathy, extrasensory perception. Let us now consider these relationships a little more closely. In some fields the physiological intelligence works on its own initiative, as when it directs the never-ceasing processes of breathing, say, or assimilation. 
In others it acts at the behest of the conscious mind, as when we will to accomplish some action, but do not and cannot will the muscular, glandular, nervous, and vascular means to the desired end. The apparently simple act of mimicry well illustrates the extraordinary nature of the feats performed by the physiological intelligence. When a parrot, making use, let us remember, of the beak, tongue, and throat of a bird, imitates the sounds produced by the lips, teeth, palate, and vocal cords of a man articulating words, what precisely happens? Responding in some as yet entirely uncomprehended way to the conscious mind's desire to imitate some remembered or immediately perceived event, the physiological intelligence sets in motion large numbers of muscles, coordinating their efforts with such exquisite skill that the result is a more or less perfect copy of the original. Working on its own level, the conscious mind not merely of a parrot, but of the most highly gifted of human beings, would find itself completely baffled by a problem of comparable complexity. As an example of the third way in which our minds affect matter, we may cite the all too familiar phenomenon of nervous indigestion. In certain persons symptoms of dyspepsia make their appearance when the conscious mind is troubled by such negative emotions as fear, envy, anger, or hatred. These emotions are directed towards events or persons in the outer environment, but in some way or other they adversely affect the physiological intelligence and this derangement results, among other things, in nervous indigestion. From tuberculosis and gastric ulcer to heart disease and even dental caries, numerous physical ailments have been found to be closely correlated with certain undesirable states of the conscious mind. Conversely, Every physician knows that a calm and cheerful patient is much more likely to recover than one who is agitated and depressed. Finally we come to such occurrences as faith healing and levitation, occurrences supernormally strange, but nevertheless attested by masses of evidence which it is hard to discount completely. Precisely how faith cures diseases, whether at Lourdes or in the hypnotist's consulting room, or how Saint Joseph of Cupertino was able to ignore the laws of gravitation, we do not know. But let us remember that we are no less ignorant of the way in which minds and bodies are related in the most ordinary of everyday activities. In the same way we are unable to form any idea of the modus operandi of what Professor Ryan has called the PK effect. Nevertheless the fact that the fall of dice can be influenced by the mental states of certain individuals seems now to have been established beyond the possibility of doubt. And if the PK effect can be demonstrated in the laboratory and measured by statistical methods, then, obviously, the intrinsic credibility of the scattered anecdotal evidence for the direct influence of mind upon matter, not merely within the body, but outside in the external world, is thereby notably increased. The same is true of extrasensory perception. Apparent examples of it are constantly turning up in ordinary life. But science is almost impotent to cope with the particular case, the isolated instance promoting their methodological ineptitude to the rank of a criterion of truth, dogmatic scientists have often branded everything beyond the pale of their limited competence as unreal and even impossible. But when tests for ESP can be repeated under standardized conditions, the subject comes under the jurisdiction of the law of probabilities and achieves, in the teeth of what passionate opposition, a measure of scientific respectability. Such, very baldly and briefly, are the most important things we know about mind in regard to its capacity to influence matter. From this modest knowledge about ourselves, what are we entitled to conclude in regard to the divine object of our nearly total ignorance? First, as to creation, if a human mind can directly influence matter not merely within, but even outside its body, then a divine mind, imminent in the universe or transcendent to it may be presumed to be capable of imposing forms upon a pre-existing chaos of formless matter, or even, perhaps, of thinking substance as well as forms into existence. Once created or divinely informed, the universe has to be sustained. The necessity for a continuous recreation of the world becomes manifest, according to Descartes, when we consider the nature of time, or the duration of things for this is of such a kind that its parts are not mutually dependent and never co-existent, and, accordingly, from the fact that we are now it does not necessarily follow that we shall be a moment afterwards, unless some cause, viz that which first produced us, shall, as it were, continually reproduce us, that is, conserve us. 
Here we seem to have something analogous, on the cosmic level, to that physiological intelligence which, in men and the lower animals, unsleepingly performs the task of seeing that bodies behave as they should. Indeed, the physiological intelligence may plausibly be regarded as a special aspect of the general recreating logos. In Chinese phraseology it is the Tao as it manifests itself on the level of living bodies. The bodies of human beings are affected by the good or bad states of their minds. Analogously, the existence at the heart of things of a divine serenity and good will may be regarded as one of the reasons why the world's sickness, though chronic, has not proved fatal. And if, in the psychic universe, there should be other and more than human consciousnesses obsessed by thoughts of evil and egotism and rebellion, this would account, perhaps, for some of the quite extravagant and improbable wickedness of human behavior. The acts willed by our minds are accomplished either through the instrumentality of the physiological intelligence in the body, or, very exceptionally, and to a limited extent, by direct supernormal means of the PK variety. Analogously the physical situations willed by a divine providence may be arranged by the perpetually creating mind that sustains the universe, in which case providence will appear to do its work by wholly natural means, or else, very exceptionally, the divine mind may act directly on the universe from the outside, as it were, in which case the workings of providence and the gifts of grace will appear to be miraculous. Similarly, the divine mind may choose to communicate with finite minds either by manipulating the world of men and things in ways, which the particular mind to be reached at that moment will find meaningful, or else there may be direct communication by something resembling thought transference. In Eckhart's phrase, God, the creator and perpetual recreator of the world, becomes and disbecomes. In other words he is, to some extent at least, in time. A temporal God might have the nature of the traditional Hebrew God of the Old Testament, or he might be a limited deity of the kind described by certain philosophical theologians of the present century, or alternatively he might be an emergent god, starting unspiritually at alpha and becoming gradually more divine as the eons rolled on towards some hypothetical omega. Why the movement should be towards more and better rather than less and worse, upwards rather than downwards or in undulations, onwards rather than round and round, one really doesn't know. There seems to be no reason why a god who is exclusively temporal, a god who merely becomes and is ungrounded in eternity, should not be as completely at the mercy of time as is the individual mind apart from the spirit. A god who becomes is a god who also disbecomes, and it is the disbecoming which may ultimately prevail, so that the last state of emergent deity may be worse than the first ain't. The ground in which the multifarious and time-bound psyche is rooted is a simple, timeless awareness. By making ourselves pure in heart and poor in spirit we can discover and be identified with this awareness. In the spirit we not only have, but are, the unitive knowledge of the divine ground. Analogously, God in time is grounded in the eternal now of the modeless Godhead. It is in the Godhead that things, lives, and minds have their being, it is through God that they have their becoming, a becoming whose goal and purpose is to return to the eternity of the ground. Meanwhile, I beseech you by the eternal and imperishable truth, and by my soul, consider, grasp the unheard of. God and Godhead are as distinct as heaven and earth. Heaven stands a thousand miles above the earth, and even so the Godhead is above God. God becomes and disbecomes. Whoever understands this preaching, I wish him well. But even if nobody had been here, I must still have preached this to the poor box. Eckhart Like Saint Augustine, Eckhart was to some extent the victim of his own literary talents. L.E. style say I am. No doubt. But the converse is also partly true. Lahom say L.E. style. Because we have a gift for writing in a certain way, we find ourselves, in some sort, becoming our way of writing. We mold ourselves in the likeness of our particular brand of eloquence. Eckhart was one of the inventors of German prose, and he was tempted by his newfound mastery of forceful expression to commit himself to extreme positions to be doctrinally the image of his powerful and over-emphatic sentences. A statement like the foregoing would lead one to believe that he despised what the Vedantists call the lower knowledge of Brahman, not as the absolute ground of all things, but as the personal God.
In reality he, like the Vedantists, accepts the lower knowledge as genuine knowledge and regards devotion to the personal God as the best preparation for the unitive knowledge of the Godhead. Another point to remember is that the attributeless Godhead of Vedanta, of Mahayana Buddhism, of Christian and Sufi mysticism is the ground of all the qualities possessed by the personal God and the Incarnation. God is not good, I am good, says Eckhart in his violent and excessive way. What he really meant was, I am just humanly good, God is supereminently good, the Godhead is, and his isness, is to kite, in Eckhart's German, contains goodness, love, wisdom, and all the rest in their essence and principle. In consequence, the Godhead is never, for the exponent of the perennial philosophy, the mere absolute of academic metaphysics, but something more purely perfect, more reverently to be adored than even the personal God or his human incarnation, a being towards whom it is possible to feel the most intense devotion and in relation to whom it is necessary, if one is to come to that unitive knowledge which is man's final end, to practice a discipline more arduous and unremitting than any imposed by ecclesiastical authority. There is a distinction and differentiation, according to our reason, between God and the Godhead, between action and resaint the fruitful nature of the persons ever worketh in a living differentiation. But the simple being of God, according to the nature thereof, is an eternal rest of God and of all created things. Ruiz broke. In the reality unitively known by the mystic, we can speak no more of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, nor of any creature, but only one being, which is the very substance of the divine persons. There were we all one before our creation, for this is our super essence. There the Godhead is in simple essence without activity. Ruiz broke. The holy light of faith is so pure that, compared with it, particular lights are but impurities, and even ideas of the saints, of the Blessed Virgin, and the sight of Jesus Christ in his humanity are impediments in the way of the sight of God in his purity. J. J. Olyer Coming as it does from a devout Catholic of the Counter-Reformation, this statement may seem somewhat startling. But we must remember that Olyer, who was a man of saintly life and one of the most influential religious teachers of the 17th century, is speaking here about a state of consciousness, to which few people ever come. To those on the ordinary levels of being he recommends other modes of knowledge. One of his penitents, for example, was advised to read, as a corrective to St. John of the Cross and other exponents of pure mystical theology, St. Gertrude's revelations of the incarnate and even physiological aspects of the deity. In Olyer's opinion, as in that of most directors of souls, whether Catholic or Indian, it was mere folly to recommend the worship of God without form to persons who are in a condition to understand only the personal and the incarnate aspects of the divine ground. This is a perfectly sensible attitude, and we are justified in adopting a policy in accordance with it, provided always that we clearly remember that its adoption may be attended by certain spiritual dangers and disadvantages. The nature of these dangers and disadvantages will be illustrated and discussed in another section. For the present it will suffice to quote the warning words of Philo, he who thinks that God has any quality and is not the one, injures not God, but himself. Thou must love God as not God, not spirit, not person, not image, but as he is, a sheer, pure absolute one, sundered from all two-ness, and in whom we must eternally sink from nothingness to nothingness. Eckhart What Eckhart describes as the pure one, the absolute not God in whom we must sink from nothingness to nothingness is called in Mahayana Buddhism the clear light of the void. What follows is part of a formula addressed by the Tibetan priest to a person in the act of death. O nobly born, the time has now come for thee to seek the path. Thy breathing is about to cease. In the past thy teacher hath set thee face to face with the clear light, and now thou art about to experience it in its reality in the bardo state, the intermediate state immediately following death, in which the soul is judged, or rather judges itself by choosing, in accord with the character formed during its life on earth, what sort of an afterlife it shall have. In this bardo state all things are like the cloudless sky, and the naked, immaculate intellect is like unto a translucent void without circumference or center. At this moment know thou thyself and abide in that state. I too, at this time, am setting thee face to face. 
The Tibetan Book of the Dead Going back further into the past, we find in one of the earliest Upanishads the classical description of the Absolute One as a super-essential no-thing. The significance of Brahman is expressed by Nidhi Nidhi, not so, not so, for beyond this, that you say it is not so, there is nothing further. Its name, however, is the reality of reality. That is to say, the senses are real, and the Brahman is their reality. Pradharanyaka Upanishad In other words, there is a hierarchy of the real. The manifold world of our everyday experience is real with a relative reality that is, on its own level, unquestionable, but this relative reality has its being within and because of the absolute reality, which, on account of the incommensurable otherness of its eternal nature, we can never hope to describe, even though it is possible for us directly to apprehend it. The extract which follows next is of great historical significance, since it was mainly through the mystical theology and the divine names of the 5th century author who wrote under the name of Dionysius the Areopagite that medieval Christendom established contact with Neoplatonism and thus, at several removes, with the metaphysical thought and discipline of India. In the 9th century Scotus Origina translated the two books into Latin and from that time forth their influence upon the philosophical speculations and the religious life of the West was wide, deep, and beneficent. It was to the authority of the Areopagite that the Christian exponents of the perennial philosophy appealed, whenever they were menaced, and they were always being menaced, by those whose primary interest was in ritual, legalism, and ecclesiastical organization. And because Dionysius was mistakenly identified with St. Paul's first Athenian convert, his authority was regarded as all but apostolic, therefore, according to the rules of the Catholic game, the appeal to it could not lightly be dismissed even by those to whom the books meant less than nothing. In spite of their maddening eccentricity, the men and women who followed the Dionysian path had to be tolerated. And once left free to produce the fruits of the Spirit, a number of them arrived at such a conspicuous degree of sanctity that it became impossible even for the heads of the Spanish Inquisition to condemn the tree from which such fruits had sprung. The simple, absolute, and immutable mysteries of divine truth are hidden in the superluminous darkness of that silence which revealeth in secret. For this darkness, though of deepest obscurity, is yet radiantly clear, and, though beyond touch and sight, it more than fills our unseeing minds with splendors of transcendent beauty. We long exceedingly to dwell in this translucent darkness and, through not seeing and not knowing, to see him who is beyond both vision and knowledge by the very fact of neither seeing him nor knowing him. For this is truly to see and to know and, through the abandonment of all things, to praise him who is beyond and above all things. For this is not unlike the art of those who carve a lifelike image from stone, removing from around it all that impedes clear vision of the latent form, revealing its hidden beauty solely by taking away. For it is, as I believe, more fitting to praise him by taking away than by ascription, for we ascribe attributes to him, when we start from universals and come down through the intermediate to the particulars. But here we take away all things from him going up from particulars to universals, that we may know openly the unknowable, which is hidden in and under all things that may be known. And we behold that darkness beyond being, concealed under all natural light. Dionysius the Areopagite the world as it appears to common sense consists of an indefinite number of successive and presumably causally connected events, involving an indefinite number of separate, individual things, lives and thoughts, the whole constituting a presumably orderly cosmos. It is in order to describe, discuss, and manage this common sense universe that human languages have been developed. Whenever, for any reason, we wish to think of the world, not as it appears to common sense, but as a continuum, we find that our traditional syntax and vocabulary are quite inadequate. Mathematicians have therefore been compelled to invent radically new symbol systems for this express purpose. But the divine ground of all existence is not merely a continuum, it is also out of time, and different, not merely in degree, but in kind from the worlds to which traditional language and the languages of mathematics are adequate. Hence, in all expositions of the perennial philosophy, the frequency of paradox, of verbal extravagance, sometimes even of seeming blasphemy. Nobody has yet invented a spiritual calculus, 
in terms of which we may talk coherently about the divine ground and of the world conceived as its manifestation. For the present, therefore, we must be patient with the linguistic eccentricities of those who are compelled to describe one order of experience in terms of a symbol system, whose relevance is to the facts of another and quite different order. So far, then, as a fully adequate expression of the perennial philosophy is concerned, there exists a problem in semantics that is finally insoluble. The fact is one which must be steadily borne in mind by all who read its formulations. Only in this way shall we be able to understand even remotely what is being talked about. Consider, for example, those negative definitions of the transcendent and immanent ground of being. In statements such as Eckhart's, God is equated with nothing. And in a certain sense the equation is exact, for God is certainly no thing. In the phrase used by Scotus origina God is not a what, he is a that. In other words, the ground can be denoted as being there, but not defined as having qualities. This means that discursive knowledge about the ground is not merely, like all inferential knowledge, a thing at one remove, or even at several removes, from the reality of immediate acquaintance, it is and, because of the very nature of our language and our standard patterns of thought, it must be, paradoxical knowledge. Direct knowledge of the ground cannot be had except by union, and union can be achieved only by the annihilation of the self-regarding ego, which is the barrier separating the thou from the that. Chapter 3 Personality, Sanctity, Divine Incarnation In English, words of Latin origin tend to carry overtones of intellectual, moral, and aesthetic classiness, overtones which are not carried, as a rule, by their Anglo-Saxon equivalents. Maternal, for instance, means the same as motherly, intoxicated as drunk, but with what subtly important shades of difference. And when Shakespeare needed a name for a comic character, it was Sir Toby Belch that he chose, not Cavalier Tobias Eructation. The word personality is derived from the Latin, and its upper partials are in the highest degree respectable. For some odd philological reason, the Saxon equivalent of personality is hardly ever used. Which is a pity. For if it were used, used as currently as Belch is used for eruptation, would people make such a reverential fuss about the thing connoted as certain English-speaking philosophers, moralists, and theologians have recently done? Personality, we are constantly being assured, is the highest form of reality, with which we are acquainted. But surely people would think twice about making or accepting this affirmation if, instead of personality, the word employed had been its Teutonic synonym, selfness. For selfness, though it means precisely the same, carries none of the high-class overtones that go with personality. On the contrary, its primary meaning comes to us embedded, as it were, in discords, like the note of a cracked bell. For, as all exponents of the perennial philosophy have constantly insisted, man's obsessive consciousness of, and insistence on being, a separate self is the final and most formidable obstacle to the unitive knowledge of God. To be a self is, for them, the original sin, and to the to-self, in feeling, will and intellect, is the final and all-inclusive virtue. It is the memory of these utterances that calls up the unfavorable overtones with which the word selfness is associated. The all too favorable overtones of personality are evoked in part by its intrinsically solemn laudinity, but also by reminiscences of what has been said about the persons of the Trinity. But the persons of the Trinity have nothing in common with the flesh and blood persons of our everyday acquaintance, nothing, that is to say, except that indwelling spirit, with which we ought and are intended to identify ourselves, but which most of us prefer to ignore in favor of our separate selfness. That this God-eclipsing and anti-spiritual selfness, should have been given the same name as is applied to the God who is a spirit, is, to say the least of it, unfortunate. Like all such mistakes it is probably, in some obscure and subconscious way, voluntary and purposeful. We love our selfness, we want to be justified in our love, therefore we christen it with the same name as is applied by theologians to Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But now thou askest me how thou mayest destroy this naked knowing and feeling of thine own being. For peradventure thou thinkest that if it were destroyed, all other hindrances were destroyed, 
and if thou thinkest thus, thou thinkest right truly. But to this I answer thee and I say, that without a full special grace full freely given by God, and also a full according ableness on thy part to receive this grace, this naked knowing and feeling of thy being may in no wise be destroyed. And this ableness is not else but a strong and a deep ghostly sorrow. All men have matter of sorrow, but most specially he feeleth matter of sorrow that know it and feeleth that he is. All other sorrows in comparison to this be but as it were game to earn saint for he may make sorrow earnestly that know it and feeleth not only what he is, but that he is. And whoso felt never this sorrow, let him make sorrow, for he hath never yet felt perfect sorrow. This sorrow, when it is had, cleanseth the soul, not only of sin, but also of pain that it hath deserved for sin, and also it make the soul able to receive that joy, the which reaveth from a man all knowing and feeling of his being. This sorrow, if it be truly conceived, is full of holy desire, and else a man might never in this life abide it or bear it. For were it not that a soul were somewhat fed with a manner of comfort by his right working, he should not be able to bear that pain that he hath by the knowing and feeling of his being. For as oft as he would have a true knowing and a feeling of his God in purity of spirit, as it may be here, and then feeleth that he may not, for he findeth evermore his knowing and his feeling as it were occupied and filled with a foul stinking lump of himself, the which must always be hated and despised and forsaken, if he shall be God's perfect disciple, taught by himself in the mount of perfection, so oft he goeth nigh mad for sorrow. This sorrow and this desire must every soul have and feel in itself, either in this manner or in another, as God vouchsafeth to teach his ghostly disciples according to his good will and their according ableness in body and in soul, in degree and disposition, ere the time be that they may perfectly be won unto God in perfect charity, such as may be had here, if God vouchsafeth. The Cloud of Unknowing what is the nature of this stinking lump of selfness or personality, which has to be so passionately repented of and so completely died to, before there can be any true knowing of God in purity of spirit? The most meager and noncommittal hypodiasis is that of Hume. Mankind, he says, are nothing but a bundle or collection of different perceptions, which succeed each other with an inconceivable rapidity and are in a perpetual flux and movement. An almost identical answer is given by the Buddhists, whose doctrine of anatta is the denial of any permanent soul, existing behind the flux of experience and the various psychophysical skandhas, closely corresponding to Hume's bundles, which constitute the more enduring elements of personality. Hume and the Buddhists give a sufficiently realistic description of selfness in action, but they fail to explain how or why the bundles ever became bundles. Did their constituent atoms of experience come together of their own accord? And, if so, why, or by what means, and within what kind of a non-spatial universe? To give a plausible answer to these questions in terms of an ita is so difficult that we are forced to abandon the doctrine in favor of the notion that, behind the flux and within the bundles, there exists some kind of permanent soul by which experience is organized and which in turn makes use of that organized experience to become a particular and unique personality. This is the view of the orthodox Hinduism, from which Buddhist thought parted company, and of almost all European thought from before the time of Aristotle to the present day. But whereas most contemporary thinkers make an attempt to describe human nature in terms of a dichotomy of interacting psyche and physique, or an inseparable wholeness of these two elements within particular embothed selves, all the exponents of the perennial philosophy make, in one form or another, the affirmation that man is a kind of trinity composed of body, psyche, and spirit. Selfness or personality is a product of the first two elements. The third element, that quid quid in credum et in creabile, as Eckhart called it, is akin to, or even identical with, the divine spirit that is the ground of all being. Man's final end, the purpose of his existence, is to love, know, and be united with the immanent and transcendent Godhead. And this identification of self with spiritual not-self can be achieved only by dying to selfness and living to spirit. What could begin to deny self, if there were not something in man different from self? William Law What is man? An angel, an animal, a void a world, a nothing surrounded by God, indigent of God, capable of God, filled with God, if it so desires. Birol. 
The separate creaturely life, as opposed to life in union with God, is only a life of various appetites, hungers and wants, and cannot possibly be anything else. God himself cannot make a creature to be in itself, or in its own nature, anything else but a state of emptiness. The highest life that is natural and creaturely can go no higher than this, it can only be a bare capacity for goodness and cannot possibly be a good and happy life but by the life of God dwelling in and in union with it. And this is the twofold life that, of all necessity, must be united in every good and perfect and happy creature. William Law The scriptures say of human beings that there is an outward man and along with him an inner man. To the outward man belong those things that depend on the soul, but are connected with the flesh and are blended. With it, and the cooperative functions of the several members, such as the eye, the ear, the tongue, the hand, and so on. The scripture speaks of all this as the old man, the earthy man, the outward person, the enemy, the servant. Within us all is the other person, the inner man, whom the scripture calls the new man, the heavenly man, the young person, the friend, the aristocrat. Eckhart The seed of God is in us. Given an intelligent and hard-working farmer, it will thrive and grow up to God, whose seed it is, and accordingly its fruits will be God nature. Pear seeds grow into pear trees, nut seeds into nut trees, and God seed into God. Eckhart The will is free and we are at liberty to identify our being either exclusively with our selfness and its interests, regarded as independent of indwelling spirit and transcendent Godhead, in which case we shall be passively damned or actively fiendish, or exclusively with the divine within us and without, in which case we shall be saints, or finally with self at one moment or in one context and with spiritual not-self at other moments and in other contexts, in which case we shall be average. Citizens, too theocentric to be wholly lost, and too egocentric to achieve enlightenment and a total deliverance. Since human craving can never be satisfied except by the unitive knowledge of God and since the mind-body is capable of an enormous variety of experiences, we are free to identify ourselves with an almost infinite number of possible objects, with the pleasures of gluttony, for example, or intemperance, or sensuality, with money, power, or fame, with our family, regarded as a possession or actually an extension and projection of our own selfness, with our goods and chattels, our hobbies, our collections, with our artistic or scientific talents, with some favorite branch of knowledge, some fascinating special subject, with our professions, our political parties, our churches, with our pains and illnesses, with our memories of success or misfortune, our hopes, fears and schemes for the future, and finally with the eternal reality within which and by which all the rest has its being. And we are free, of course, to identify ourselves with more than one of these things simultaneously or in succession. Hence the quite astonishingly improbable combination of traits making up a complex personality. Thus a man can be at once the craftiest of politicians and the dupe of his own verbiage, can have a passion for brandy and money, and an equal passion for the poetry of George Meredith and underage girls and his mother, for horse racing and detective stories and the good of his country, the whole accompanied by a sneaking fear of hell fire, a hatred of Spinoza and an unblemished record for Sunday church going. A person born with one kind of psychophysical constitution will be tempted to identify himself with one set of interests and passions, while a person with another kind of temperament will be tempted to make very different identifications. But these temptations, though extremely powerful, if the constitutional bias is strongly marked, do not have to be succumbed to. People can and do resist them, can and do refuse to identify themselves with what it would be all too easy and natural for them to be, can and do become better and quite other than their own selves. In this context the following brief article on how men behave in crisis, published in a recent issue of Harper's Magazine, is highly significant. A young psychiatrist, who went as a medical observer on five combat missions of the 8th Air Force in England says that in times of great stress and danger men are likely to react quite uniformly, even though under normal circumstances, they differ widely in personality. He went on one mission, during which the B-17 plane and crew were so severely damaged that survival seemed impossible. 
He had already studied the on-the-ground personalities of the crew and had found that they represented a great diversity of human types. Of their behavior in crisis he reported. Their reactions were remarkably alike. During the violent combat and in the acute emergencies that arose during it, they were all quietly precise on the interphone and decisive in action. The tail gunner, right waist gunner and navigator were severely wounded early in the fight, but all three kept at their duties efficiently and without cessation. The burden of emergency work fell on the pilot, engineer and ball turret gunner, and all functioned with rapidity, skillful effectiveness and no lost motion. The burden of the decisions, during, but particularly after the combat, rested essentially on the pilot and, in secondary details, on the co-pilot and bomb Artha. The decisions, arrived at with care and speed, were unquestioned once they were made, and proved excellent. In the period when disaster was momentarily expected, the alternative plans of action were made clearly and with no thought other than the safety of the entire crew. All at this point were quiet, unobtrusively cheerful, and ready for anything. There was at no time paralysis, panic, unclear thinking, faulty or confused judgment, or self-seeking in any one of them. One could not possibly have inferred from their behavior that this one was a man of unstable moods and that that one was a shy, quiet, introspective man. They all became outwardly calm, precise in thought and rapid in action. Such action is typical of a crew who know intimately what fear is, so that they can use, without being distracted by, its physiological concomitants, who are well trained, so that they can direct their action with clarity, and who have all the more than personal trust inherent in a unified team. We see then that, when the crisis came, each of these young men forgot the particular personality, which he had built up out of the elements provided by his heredity and the environment in which he had grown up that one resisted the normally irresistible temptation to identify himself with his mood of the moment, another the temptation to identify himself with his private daydreams, and so on with the rest, and that all of them behaved in the same strikingly similar and wholly admirable way. It was as though the crisis and the preliminary training for crisis had lifted them out of their divergent personalities and raised them to the same higher level. Sometimes crisis alone, without any preparatory training, is sufficient to make a man forget to be his customary self and become, for the time being, something quite different. Thus the most unlikely people will, under the influence of disaster, temporarily turn into heroes, martyrs, selfless laborers for the good of their fellows. Very often, too, the proximity of death produces similar results. For example, Samuel Johnson behaved in one way during almost the whole of his life and in quite another way during his last illness. The fascinatingly complex personality, in which six generations of Boswellians have taken so much delight, the learned boar and glutton, the kind-hearted bully, the superstitious intellectual, the convinced Christian who was a fetishist, the courageous man who was terrified of death, became, while he was actually dying, simple, single, serene and God-centered. Paradoxical as it may seem, it is, for very many persons, much easier to behave selflessly in time of crisis than it is when life is taking its normal course in undisturbed tranquility. When the going is easy, there is nothing to make us forget our precious selfness, nothing, except our own will to mortification and the knowledge of God, to distract our minds from the distractions with which we have chosen to be identified we are at perfect liberty to wallow in our personality to our heart's content. And how we wallow. It is for this reason that all the masters of the spiritual life insist so strongly upon the importance of little things. God requires a faithful fulfillment of the merest trifle given us to do, rather than the most ardent aspiration to things to which we are not called. Saint Francois de Sales there is no one in the world who cannot arrive without difficulty at the most eminent perfection by fulfilling with love obscure and common duties. J.P. de Sada. Some people measure the worth of good actions only by their natural qualities or their difficulty, giving the preference to what is conspicuous or brilliant. Such men forget that Christian virtues, which are God's inspirations, should be viewed from the side of grace, not that of nature. The dignity and difficulty of a good action certainly affects what is technically called its accidental worth, 
but all its essential worth comes from love alone. Jean-Pierre Camus, quoting Saint François de Sales. The saint is one who knows that every moment of our human life is a moment of crisis, for at every moment we are called upon to make an all-important decision, to choose between the way that leads to death and spiritual darkness and the way that leads towards light and life, between interests exclusively temporal and the eternal order, between our personal will, or the will of some projection of our personality, and the will of God. In order to fit himself to deal with the emergencies of his way of life, the saint undertakes appropriate training of mind and body, just as the soldier does. But whereas the objectives of military training are limited and very simple, namely, to make men courageous, cool-headed, and cooperatively efficient in the business of killing other men, with whom, personally, they have no quarrel, the objectives of spiritual training are much less narrowly specialized. Here the aim is primarily to bring human beings to a state in which, because there are no longer any God-eclipsing obstacles between themselves and reality, they are able to be aware continuously of the divine ground of their own and all other beings, secondarily, as a means to this end, to meet all, even the most trivial circumstances of daily living without malice, greed, self-assertion or voluntary ignorance, but consistently with love and understanding. Because its objectives are not limited, because, for the lover of God, every moment is a moment of crisis, spiritual training is incomparably more difficult and searching than military training. There are many good soldiers, few saints. We have seen that, in critical emergencies, soldiers specifically trained to cope with that kind of thing tend to forget the inborn and acquired idiosyncrasies with which they normally identify their being and, transcending selfness, to behave in the same, one-pointed, better-than-personal way. What is true of soldiers is also true of saints, but with this important difference, that the aim of spiritual training is to make people become selfless in every circumstance of life, while the aim of military training is to make them selfless only in certain very special circumstances and in relation to only certain classes of human beings. This could not be otherwise, for all that we are and will and do depends, in the last analysis, upon what we believe the nature of things to be. The philosophy that rationalizes power politics and justifies war and military training is always, whatever the official religion of the politicians and war makers, some wildly unrealistic doctrine of national, racial, or ideological idolatry, having, as its inevitable corollaries, the notions of heron folk and the lesser breeds without the law. The biographies of the saints testify unequivocally to the fact that spiritual training leads to a transcendence of personality, not merely in the special circumstances of battle, but in all circumstances and in relation to all creatures, so that the saint loves his enemies or, if he is a Buddhist, does not even recognize the existence of enemies, but treats all sentient beings, subhuman as well as human, with the same compassion and disinterested goodwill. Those who went through to the unitive knowledge of God set out upon their course from the most diverse starting points. One is a man, another a woman, one a born active, another a born contemplative. No two of them inherit the same temperament and physical constitution, and their lives are passed in material, moral and intellectual environments that are profoundly dissimilar. Nevertheless, insofar as they are saints, insofar as they possess the unitive knowledge that makes them perfect as their Father which is in heaven is perfect, they are all astonishingly alike. Their actions are uniformly selfless and they are constantly recollected, so that at every moment they know who they are and what is their true relation to the universe and its spiritual ground. Of even plain average people it may be said that their name is legion, much more so of exceptionally complex personalities, who identify themselves with a wide diversity of moods, cravings, and opinions. Saints, on the contrary, are neither double-minded nor half-hearted, but single and, however great their intellectual gifts, profoundly simple. The multiplicity of legion has given place to one-pointedness, not to any of those evil one-pointednesses of ambition or covetousness, or lust for power and fame, not even to any of the nobler, but still all too human one-pointednesses of art, scholarship, and science, regarded as ends in themselves, but to the supreme, more than human one-pointedness that is the very being of those souls who consciously and consistently pursue man's final end, the knowledge of eternal reality. 
In one of the Pali scriptures there is a significant anecdote about the Brahmin Drona who, seeing the Blessed One sitting at the foot of a tree, asked him, Are you a Deva? And the Exalted One answered, I am not. Are you a Gandharva? I am not, are you a Yaksha? I am not. Are you a man? I am not a man. On the Brahmin asking what he might be, the Blessed One replied, Those evil influences, those cravings, whose non-destruction would have individualized me as a Deva, a Gandharva, a Yaksha, three types of supernatural being, or a man, I have completely annihilated. Know therefore that I am Buddha. Here we may remark in passing that it is only the one-pointed, who are truly capable of worshipping one god. Monotheism as a theory can be entertained even by a person whose name is Legion. But when it comes to passing from theory to practice, from discursive knowledge about to immediate acquaintance with the one god, there cannot be monotheism except where there is singleness of heart. Knowledge is in the knower according to the mode of the knower. Where the knower is polypsychic they, Universe he knows by immediate experience is polytheistic. The Buddha declined to make any statement in regard to the ultimate divine reality. All he would talk about was nirvana, which is the name of the experience that comes to the totally selfless and one-pointed. To this same experience others have given the name of union with Brahman, with al -Hakt, with the immanent and transcendent Godhead. Maintaining, in this matter, the attitude of a strict operationalist, the Buddha would speak only of the spiritual experience, not of the metaphysical entity presumed by the theologians of other religions, as also of later Buddhism, to be the object and, since in contemplation the knower, the known and the knowledge are all one, at the same time the subject and substance of that experience. When a man lacks discrimination, his will wanders in all directions, after innumerable aims. Those who lack discrimination may quote the letter of the scripture, but they are really denying its inner truth. They are full of worldly desires and hungry for the rewards of heaven. They use beautiful figures of speech, they teach elaborate rituals, which are supposed to obtain pleasure and power for those who practice them. But, actually, they understand nothing except the law of karma that chains men to rebirth. Those whose discrimination is stolen away by such talk grow deeply attached to pleasure and power and so they are unable to develop that one-pointed concentration of the will, which leads a man to absorption in God. Bhagavad Gita Among the cultivated and mentally active, hagiography is now a very unpopular form of literature. The fact is not at all surprising. The cultivated and the mentally active have an insatiable appetite for novelty, diversity, and distraction. But the saints, however commanding their talents and whatever the nature of their professional activities, are all incessantly preoccupied with only one subject, spiritual reality and the means by which they and their fellows can come to the unitive knowledge of that reality. And as for their actions, these are as monotonously uniform as their thoughts, for in all circumstances they behave selflessly, patiently and with indefatigable charity. No wonder, then, if the biographies of such men and women remain unread. For one well-educated person who knows anything about William Law there are two or three hundred who have read Boswell's life of his younger contemporary. Why? Because, until he actually lay dying, Johnson indulged himself in the most fascinating of multiple personalities, whereas Law, for all the superiority of his talents was almost absurdly simple and single-minded. Legion prefers to read about Legion. It is for this reason that, in the whole repertory of epic, drama, and the novel there are hardly any representations of true theocentric saints. O oh friend, hope for him whilst you live, know whilst you live, understand whilst you live. For in life deliverance abides. If your bonds be not broken whilst living, what hope of deliverance in death? It is but an empty dream that the soul shall have union with him because it has passed from the body. If he is found now, he is found then. If not, we do but go to dwell in the city of death. Kabir. This figure in the form of a sun, the description is of the engraved frontispiece to the first edition of the rule of perfection, represents the will of God. The faces placed here in the sun represent souls living in the divine will. These faces are arranged in three concentric circles, showing the three degrees of this divine will. 
The first, or outermost degree signifies the souls of the active life, the second, those of the life of contemplation, the third, those of the life of supereminence. Outside the first circle are many tools, such as pincers and hammers, denoting the active life. But round the second circle we have placed nothing at all, in order to signify that in this kind of contemplative life, without any other speculations or practices, one must follow the leading of the will of God. The tools are on the ground and in shadow, inasmuch as outward works are in themselves full of darkness. These tools, however, are touched by a ray of the sun, to show that works may be enlightened and illuminated by the will of God. The light of the divine will shines but little on the faces of the first circle, much more on those of the second, while those of the third, or innermost circle are resplendent. The features of the first show up most clearly, the second, less, the third, hardly at all. This signifies that the souls of the first degree are much in themselves, those of the second degree are less in themselves and more in God, those in the third degree are almost nothing in themselves and all in God, absorbed in his essential will. All these faces have their eyes fixed on the will of God. Bennett of Canfield It is in virtue of his absorption in God and just because he has not identified his being with the inborn and acquired elements of his private personality, that the saint is able to exercise his entirely non-coercive and therefore entirely beneficent influence on individuals and even on whole societies. Or, to be more accurate, it is because he has purged himself of selfness that divine reality is able to use him as a channel of grace and power. I live, yet not I, but Christ, the eternal Logos, liveth in me. True of the saint, this must a fortiori be true of the avatar, or incarnation of God. If, in so far as he was a saint, Saint Paul was not I, then certainly Christ was not I, and to talk, as so many liberal churchmen now do, of worshipping the personality of Jesus, is an absurdity. For, obviously, had Jesus remained content merely to have a personality, like the rest of us, he would never have exercised the kind of influence which in fact he did exercise and it would never have occurred to anyone to regard him as a divine incarnation and to identify him with the Logos. That he came to be thought of as the Christ was due to the fact that he had passed beyond selfness and had become the bodily and mental conduit through which a more than personal, supernatural life flowed down into the world. Souls which have come to the unitive knowledge of God, are, in Bennett of Canfield's phrase, almost nothing in themselves and all in God. This vanishing residue of selfness persists because, in some slight measure, they still identify their being with some innate psychophysical idiosyncrasy, some acquired habit of thought or feeling, some convention or unanalyzed prejudice current in the social environment. Jesus was almost wholly absorbed in the essential will of God, but in spite of this, he may have retained some elements of selfness. To what extent there was any I associated with the more than personal, divine not I, it is very difficult, on the basis of the existing evidence, to judge. For example, did Jesus interpret his experience of divine reality and his own spontaneous inferences from that experience in terms of those fascinating apocalyptic notions current in contemporary Jewish circles? Some eminent scholars have argued that the doctrine of the world's imminent dissolution was the central core of his teaching. Others, equally learned, have held that it was attributed to him by the authors of the Synoptic Gospels, and that Jesus himself did not identify his experience and his theological thinking with locally popular opinions. Which party is right? Goodness knows. On this subject, as on so many others, the existing evidence does not permit of a certain and unambiguous answer. The moral of all this is plain. The quantity and quality of the surviving biographical documents are such that we have no means of knowing what the residual personality of Jesus was really like. But if the Gospels tell us very little about the I which was Jesus, they make up for this deficiency by telling us inferentially, in the parables and discourses, a good deal about the spiritual not I, whose manifest presence in the mortal man was the reason why his disciples called him the Christ and identified him with the eternal Logos. The biography of a saint or avatar is valuable only insofar as it throws light upon the means by which, in the circumstances of a particular human life, the I was purged away so as to make room for the divine not I. 
The authors of the Synoptic Gospels did not choose to write such a biography, and no amount of textual criticism or ingenious surmise can call it into existence. In the course of the last hundred years an enormous sum of energy has been expended on the attempt to make documents yield more evidence than in fact they contain. However regrettable may be the synoptists lack of interest in biography, and whatever objections may be raised against the theologies of Paul and John, there can still be no doubt that their instinct was essentially sound. Each in his own way wrote about the eternal not eye of Christ rather than the historical eye, each in his own way stressed that element in the life of Jesus, in which, because it is more than personal, all persons can participate. The nature of selfness is such that one person cannot be a part of another person. A self can contain or be contained by something that is either less or more than a self, it can never contain or be contained by a self. The doctrine that God can be incarnated in human form is found in most of the principal historic expositions of the perennial philosophy, in Hinduism, in Mahayana Buddhism, in Christianity and in the Mohammedanism of the Sufis, by whom the Prophet was equated with the eternal Logos. When goodness grows weak, when evil increases, I make myself a body. In every age I come back to deliver the holy, to destroy the sin of the sinner, to establish righteousness. He who knows the nature of my task and my holy birth is not reborn. When he leaves this body, he comes to me. Flying from fear, from lust and anger, he hides in me. His refuge and safety Burnt clean in the blaze of my being, in me many find home. Bhagavad Gita Then the Blessed One spoke and said, No, Vaistha, that from time to time a Tathagata is born into the world, a fully enlightened one, blessed and worthy, abounding in wisdom and goodness, happy with knowledge of the worlds, unsurpassed as a guide to erring mortals, a teacher of gods and men, a blessed Buddha. He thoroughly understands this universe, as though he saw it face to face. The truth does he proclaim both in its letter and in its spirit, lovely in its origin, lovely in its progress, lovely in its consummation. A higher life doth he make known in all its purity and in all its perfectness. Tevagasutta Krishna is an incarnation of Brahman, Gautama Buddha of what the Mahayanists called the Dharmakaya, suchness, mind, the spiritual ground of all being. The Christian doctrine of the incarnation of the Godhead in human form differs from that of India and the Far East in as much as it affirms that there has been and can be only one avatar. What we do depends in large measure upon what we think, and if what we do is evil, there is good empirical reason for supposing that our thought patterns are inadequate to material, mental or spiritual reality. Because Christians believed that there had been only one avatar, Christian history has been disgraced by more and blew their crusades, interdenominational wars, persecutions and proselytizing imperialism than has the history of Hinduism and Buddhism. Absurd and idolatrous doctrines, affirming the quasi-divine nature of sovereign states and their rulers, have led Oriental, no less than Western, peoples into innumerable political wars, but because they have not believed in an exclusive revelation at one sole instant of time, or in the quasi-divinity of an ecclesiastical organization, Oriental peoples have kept remarkably clear of the mass murder for religion's sake, which has been so dreadfully frequent in Christendom. And while, in this important respect, the level of public morality has been lower in the West than in the East, the levels of exceptional sanctity and of ordinary individual morality have not, so far as one can judge from the available evidence, been any higher. If the tree is indeed known by its fruits, Christianity's departure from the norm of the perennial philosophy would seem to be philosophically unjustifiable. The Logos passes out of eternity into time for no other purpose than to assist the beings, whose bodily form he takes, to pass out of time into eternity. If the Avatar's appearance upon the stage of history is enormously important, this is due to the fact that by his teaching he points out, and by his being a channel of grace and divine power he actually is, the means by which human beings may transcend the limitations of history. The author of the fourth gospel affirms that the word became flesh, but in another passage he adds that the flesh profiteth nothing, nothing, that is to say, in itself, but a great deal, of course, as a means to the union with immanent and transcendent spirit.
In this context it is very interesting to consider the development of Buddhism. Under the forms of religious or mystical imagery, writes R. E. Johnston in his Buddhist China, the Mahayana expresses the universal, whereas Hinayana cannot set itself free from the domination of historical fact. In the words of an eminent Orientalist, Ananda K. Kumare Swami, the Mahayanist believer is warned, precisely as the worshipper of Krishna is warned in the Vaishnavite scriptures that the Krishna Lila is not a history, but a process forever unfolded in the heart of man, that matters of historical fact are without religious significance, except, we should add, insofar as they point to or themselves constitute the means, whether remote or proximate, whether political, ethical, or spiritual, by which men may come to deliverance from selfness in the temporal order. In the West, the mystics went some way towards liberating Christianity from its unfortunate servitude to historic fact. Or, to be more accurate, to those various mixtures of contemporary record with subsequent inference and fantasy, which have, at different epochs, been accepted as historic fact. From the writings of Eckhart, Toller, and Ruiz Broke, of Boma, William Law and the Quakers, it would be possible to extract a spiritualized and universalized Christianity, whose narratives should refer, not to history as it was, or as someone afterwards thought it ought to be, but to processes forever unfolded in the heart of man. But unfortunately the influence of the mystics was never powerful enough to bring about a radical Mahayanist revolution in the We Saint in spite of them, Christianity has remained a religion in which the pure perennial philosophy has been overlaid, now more, now less, by an idolatrous preoccupation with events and things in time, events and things regarded not merely as useful means, but as ends, intrinsically sacred and indeed divine. Moreover such improvements on history as were made in the course of centuries were, most imprudently, treated as though they themselves were a part of history, a procedure which put a powerful weapon into the hands of Protestant and, later, of rationalist controversialists. How much wiser it would have been to admit the perfectly avowable fact that, when the sternness of Christ the Judge had been unduly emphasized, men and women felt the need of personifying the divine compassion in a new form, with the result that the figure of the Virgin, mediatrix to the mediator, came into increased prominence. And when, in course of time, the Queen of Heaven was felt to be too awe-inspiring, compassion was re-personified in the homely figure of Saint Joseph who thus became Methator to the Methatrix to the Methator. In exactly the same way Buddhist worshippers felt that the historic Sakyamuni, with his insistence on recollectedness, discrimination, and a total dying to self as the principal means of liberation, was too stern and too intellectual. The result was that the love and compassion which Sakyamuni had also inculcated came to be personified in Buddhas such as Amida and Maitreya, divine characters completely removed from history inasmuch as their temporal career was situated somewhere in the distant past or distant future. Here it may be remarked that the vast numbers of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, of whom the Mahayanist theologians speak, are commensurate with the vastness of their cosmology. Time, for them, is beginningless, and the innumerable universes, every one of them supporting sentient beings of every possible variety, are born, evolve, decay and they, only to repeat the same cycle, again and again, until the final inconceivably remote consummation, when every sentient being in all the worlds shall have won to deliverance out of time into eternal suchness or Buddhahood this cosmological background to Buddhism has affinities with the world picture of modern astronomy. Especially with that version of it offered in the recently published theory of Dr. Weisacher regarding the formation of planets. If the Weisacher hypothesis is correct, the production of a planetary system would be a normal episode in the life of every star. There are 40,000 million stars in our own galactic system alone, and beyond our galaxy other galaxies, indefinitely. If, as we have no choice but to believe, spiritual laws governing consciousness are uniform throughout the whole planet-bearing and presumably life-supporting universe, then certainly there is plenty of room, and at the same time, no doubt, the most agonizing and desperate need, for those innumerable redemptive incarnations of suchness, upon whose shining multitudes the Mahayanists love to dwell. For my part, I think the chief reason which prompted the invisible God to become visible in the flesh and to hold converse with men was to lead carnal men, who are only able to love carnally, 
to the healthful love of his flesh, and afterwards, little by little, to spiritual love. Saint Bernard Saint Bernard's doctrine of the carnal love of Christ has been admirably summed up by Professor Etienne Gilson in his book, The Mystical Theology of Saint Bernard. Knowledge of self already expanded into social carnal love of the neighbor, so like oneself in misery, is now a second time expanded into a carnal love of Christ, the model of compassion, since for our salvation he has become the man of sorrows. Here then is the place. Occupied in Cistercian mysticism by the meditation on the visible humanity of Cree Saint it is but a beginning, but an absolutely necessary beginning. Charity, of course, is essentially spiritual, and a love of this kind can be no more than its first moment. It is too much bound up with the senses, unless we know how to make use of it with prudence, and to lean on it only as something to be surpassed. In expressing himself thus, Bernard merely codified the teachings of his own experience, for we have it from him that he was much given to the practice of this sensitive love at the outset of his conversion, later on he was to consider it an advance to have passed beyond it, not, that is to say, to have forgotten it, but to have added another, which outweighs it as the rational and spiritual outweigh the carnal. Nevertheless, this beginning is already a summit. This sensitive affection for Christ was always presented by Saint Bernard as love of a relatively inferior order. It is so precisely on account of its sensitive character, for charity is of a purely spiritual essence. In right the soul should be able to enter directly into union, in virtue of its spiritual powers, with a God who is pure spirit. The Incarnation, moreover, should be regarded as one of the consequences of man's transgression, so that love for the person of Christ is, as a matter of fact, bound up with the history of a fall which need not, and should not, have happened. Saint Bernard furthermore, and in several places, notes that this affection cannot stand safely alone, but needs to be supported by what he calls science. He had examples before him of the deviations into which even the most ardent devotion can fall, when it is not allied with, and ruled by, a sane theology. Can the many fantastic and mutually incompatible theories of expiation and atonement, which have been grafted onto the Christian doctrine of divine incarnation, be regarded as indispensable elements in a sane theology? I find it difficult to imagine how anyone who has looked into a history of these notions, as expounded, for example, by the author of the Epistle to the Hebrews, by Athanasius and Augustine, by Anselm and Luther, by Calvin and Grotius, can plausibly answer this question in the affirmative. In the present context, it will be enough to call attention to one of the bitterest of all the bitter ironies of history. For the Christ of the Gospels, lawyers seemed further from the kingdom of heaven, more hopelessly impervious to reality, than almost any other class of human beings except the rich. But Christian theology, especially that of the Western churches, was the product of minds imbued with Jewish and Roman legalism. In all too many instances the immediate insights of the avatar and the theocentric saint were rationalized into a system, not by philosophers, but by speculative barristers and metaphysical jurists. Why should what Abbot John Chapman calls the problem of reconciling, not merely uniting, mysticism and Christianity be so extremely difficult. Simply because so much Roman and Protestant thinking was done by those very lawyers whom Christ regarded as being peculiarly incapable of understanding the true nature of things. The abbot, Chapman is apparently referring to Abbot Marmion, says Saint John of the Cross is like a sponge full of Christianity. You can squeeze it all out, and the full mystical theory, in other words, the pure perennial philosophy, remains. Consequently for fifteen years or so I hated Saint John of the Cross and called him a Buddha saint I loved Saint Teresa and read her over and over again. She is first a Christian, only secondarily a mystic. Then I found I had wasted fifteen years, so far as prayer was concerned. Now see the meaning of these two sayings of Christ's. The one, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, that is through my life. The other saying, no man cometh unto me except the Father draw him, that is, he does not take my life upon him and follow after me, except he is moved and drawn of my Father, that is, of the simple and perfect good, of which Saint Paul saith, when that which is perfect is come, 
that which is in part shall be done away. Theologia Germanica In other words there must be imitation of Christ before there can be identification with the Father, and there must be essential identity or likeness between the human spirit and the God who is spirit in order that the idea of imitating the earthly behavior of the incarnate Godhead should ever cross anybody's mind. Christian theologians speak of the possibility of deification, but deny that there is identity of substance between spiritual reality and the human spirit. In Vedanta and Mahayana Buddhism, as also among the Sufis, spirit and spirit are held to be the same substance, Atman is Brahman, that art thou. When not enlightened, Buddhas are no other than ordinary beings, when there is enlightenment, ordinary beings at once turn into Buddhas. Away. Nang. Every human being can thus become an avatar by adoption, but not by his unaided efforts. He must be shown the way, and he must be aided by divine grace. That men and women may be thus instructed and helped, the Godhead assumes the form of an ordinary human being, who has to earn deliverance and enlightenment in the way that is prescribed by the divine nature of things, namely, by charity, by a total dying to self and a total, one-pointed awareness. Thus enlightened, the avatar can reveal the way of enlightenment to others and help them actually to become what they already potentially are. Tell Chuen Luimim Enfin El Eternite El E Change. And of course the eternity which transforms us into ourselves is not the experience of mere persistence after bodily death. There will be no experience of timeless reality then, unless there is the same or a similar knowledge within the world of time and matter. By precept and by example, the avatar teaches that this transforming knowledge is possible, that all sentient beings are called to it and that, sooner or later, in one way or another, all must finally come to it. Chapter 4 God in the World That art thou, behold but one in all things, God within and God without. There is a way to reality in and through the soul, and there is a way to reality in and through the world. Whether the ultimate goal can be reached by following either of these ways to the exclusion of the other is to be doubted. The third, best, and hardest way is that which leads to the divine ground simultaneously in the perceiver and in that which is perceived. The mind is no other than the Buddha, and Buddha is no other than sentient being. When mind assumes the form of a sentient being, it has suffered no decrease, when it has become a Buddha, it has added nothing to itself. Huang Po all creatures have existed eternally in the divine essence, as in their exemplar. So far as they conform to the divine idea, all beings were, before their creation, one thing with the essence of God. God creates into time what was and is in eternity. Eternally, all creatures are God in God. So far as they are in God, they are the same life, the same essence, the same power, the same one, and nothing less. So, so. The image of God is found essentially and personally in all mankind. Each possesses it whole, entire, and undivided, and altogether not more than one alone. In this way we are all one, intimately united in our eternal image, which is the image of God and the source in us of all our life. Our created essence and our life are attached to it without mediation as to their eternal cause. Ruiz broke. God who, in his simple substance, is all everywhere equally, nevertheless, in efficacy, is in rational creatures in another way than in irrational, and in good rational creatures in another way than in the bad. He is in irrational creatures in such a way as not to be comprehended by them, by all rational ones, however, he can be comprehended through knowledge, but only by the good is he to be comprehended also through love. Saint Bernard When is a man in mere understanding? I answer, when a man sees one thing separated from another. And when is a man above mere understanding? That I can tell you, when a man sees all in all, then a man stands beyond mere understanding. Eckhart There are four kinds of Tahayana, spiritual disciplines. What are these four? They are, first, the Tahayana practiced by the ignorant, second, the Tahayana devoted to the examination of meaning, third, the Tahayana with suchness for its object, fourth, the Tahayana of the Tathagatas, Buddhas. What is meant by the Tahayana practiced by the ignorant? 
It is the one resorted to by the yogins who exercise themselves in the disciplines of Sravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas, contemplatives and solitary Buddhas of the Hinayana school, who perceiving that there is no ego substance, that the body is a shadow and a skeleton which is transient, impure, and full of suffering, persistently cling to these notions, which are regarded as just so and not otherwise, and who, starting from them, advance by stages until they reach the cessation, where there are no thoughts. This is called the Dhyana practiced by the ignorant. What then is the Dhyana devoted to the examination of meaning? It is the one practiced by those who, having gone beyond the egolessness of things, beyond individuality and generality, beyond the untenability of such ideas as self, other and both, which are held by the philosophers, proceed to examine and follow up the meaning of the various aspects of bodhisattvahood. This is the Dhyana devoted to the examination of meaning. What is the Dhyana with Tathata, or suchness, as its object? When the yogin recognizes that the discrimination of the two forms of egolessness is mere imagination and that where he establishes himself in the reality of suchness there is no rising of discrimination, this I call the Dhyana with suchness for its object. What is the Dhyana of the Tathagata? When the yogin, entering upon the stage of Tathagatahood and abiding in the triple bliss characterizing self-realization attained by noble wisdom, devotes himself for the sake of all beings to the accomplishment of incomprehensible works, this I call the Dhyana of the Tathagata. Langkavatara Sutra When followers of Zen fail to go beyond the world of their senses and thoughts, all their doings and movements are of no significance. But when the senses and thoughts are annihilated, all the passages to universal mind are blocked, and no entrance then becomes possible. The original mind is to be recognized along with the working of the senses and thoughts, only it does not belong to them nor yet is it independent of them. Do not build up your views upon your senses and thoughts, do not base your understanding upon your senses and thoughts, but at the same time do not seek the mind away from your senses and thoughts, do not try to grasp reality by rejecting your senses and thoughts. When you are neither attached to, nor detached from, them, then you enjoy your perfect unobstructed freedom, then you have your seat of enlightenment. Huang Po Every individual being, from the atom up to the most highly organized of living bodies and the most exalted of finite minds may be thought of, in René Ganon's phrase, as a point where a ray of the primordial Godhead meets one of the differentiated, creaturely emanations of that same Godhead's creative energy. The creature, as creature, may be very far from God, in the sense that it lacks the intelligence to discover the nature of the divine ground of its being. But the creature in its eternal essence, as the meeting place of creatureliness and primordial Godhead, is one of the infinite number of points where divine reality is holy and eternally present. Because of this, rational beings can come to the unitive knowledge of the divine ground, non-rational and inanimate beings may reveal to rational beings the fullness of God's presence within their material forms. The poet's or the painter's vision of the divine in nature, the worshipper's awareness of a holy presence in the sacrament, symbol, or image, these are not entirely subjective. True, such perceptions cannot be had by all perceivers, for knowledge is a function of being, but the thing known is independent of the mode and nature of the knower. What the poet and painter see, and try to record for us, is actually there, waiting to be apprehended by anyone who has the right kind of faculties. Similarly, in the image or the sacramental object the divine ground is wholly present, Faith and devotion prepare the worshipper's mind for perceiving the ray of Godhead at its point of intersection with the particular fragment of matter before him. Incidentally, by being worshipped, such symbols become the centers of a field of force. The longings, emotions and imaginations of those who kneel and, for generations, have knelt before the shrine create, as it were, an enduring vortex in the psychic medium, so that the image lives with a secondary, inferior divine life projected onto it by its worshippers, as well as with the primary divine life which, in common with all other animate and inanimate beings, it possesses in virtue of its relation to the divine ground. The religious experience of sacramentalists and image worshippers may be perfectly genuine and objective, but it is not always or necessarily an experience of God or the Godhead. It may be, and perhaps in most cases it actually is, 
an experience of the field of force generated by the minds of past and present worshippers and projected onto the sacramental object where it sticks, so to speak, in a condition of what may be called second-hand objectivity, waiting to be perceived by minds suitably attuned to it. How desirable this kind of experience really is will have to be discussed in another section. All that need be said here is that the iconoclast's contempt for sacraments and symbols, as being nothing but mummery with stocks and stones is quite unjustified. The workmen still in doubt what course to take. Whether I'd best a saint or hog trough make, after debate resolved me for a saint. And so famed Loyola I represent. The all too Protestant satirist forgot that God is in the hog trough no less than in the conventionally sacred image. Lift the stone and you will find me, affirms the best known of the Oxerinchus Logia of Jesus, cleave the wood, and I am there. Those who have personally and immediately realized the truth of this saying and, along with it, the truth of Brahmanisms that art thou are wholly delivered. The Sravaka, literally hearer, the name given by Mahayana Buddhists to contemplatives of the Hinayana school, fails to perceive that mind, as it is in itself, has no stages, no causation. Disciplining himself in the cause, he has attained the result and abides in the Samadhi, contemplation, of emptiness for ever so many eons. However enlightened in this way, the Sravaka is not at all on the right track. From the point of view of the Bodhisattva, this is like suffering the torture of hell. The Sravaka has buried himself in emptiness and does not know how to get out of his quiet contemplation, for he has no insight into the Buddha nature itself. Emotsu When enlightenment is perfected, a Bodhisattva is free from the bondage of things, but does not seek to be delivered from things. Samsara, the world of becoming, is not hated by him, nor is Nirvana loved. When perfect enlightenment shines, it is neither bondage nor deliverance. Prunabuddha Sutra The touch of earth is always reinvigorating to the son of earth, even when he seeks a superphysical knowledge. It may even be said that the superphysical can only be really mastered in its fullness, to its heights we can always reach, when we keep our feet firmly on the physical. Earth is his footing, says the Upanishad, whenever it images the self that manifests in the universe. Sri Aurobindo. To its heights we can always come. For those of us who are still splashing about in the lower ooze, the phrase has a rather ironical ring. Nevertheless, in the light of even the most distant acquaintance with the heights and the fullness, it is possible to understand what its author means. To discover the kingdom of God exclusively within oneself is easier than to discover it, not only there, but also in the outer world of minds and things and living creatures. It is easier because the heights within reveal themselves to those who are ready to exclude from their purview all that lies without. And though this exclusion may be a painful and mortificatory process, the fact remains that it is less arduous than the process of inclusion, by which we come to know the fullness as well as the heights of spiritual life. Where there is exclusive concentration on the heights within, temptations and distractions are avoided and there is a general denial and suppression. But when the hope is to know God inclusively, to realize the divine ground in the world as well as in the soul, temptations and distractions must not be avoided, but submitted to and used as opportunities for advance, there must be no suppression of outward turning activities, but a transformation of them so that they become sacramental. Mortification becomes more searching and more subtle, there is need of unsleeping awareness and, on the levels of thought, feeling and conduct the constant exercise of something like an artist's tact and taste. It is in the literature of Mahayana and especially of Zen Buddhism that we find the best account of the psychology of the man for whom samsara and nirvana, time and eternity, are one and the same. More systematically perhaps than any other religion, the Buddhism of the Far East teaches the way to spiritual knowledge in its fullness as well as in its heights, in and through the world as well as in and through the soul. In this context we may point to a highly significant fact, which is that the incomparable landscape painting of China and Japan was essentially a religious art, inspired by Taoism and Zen Buddhism, in Europe, on the contrary, landscape painting and the poetry of nature worship were secular arts which arose when Christianity was in decline, and derived little or no inspiration from Christian ideals. Blind, Deaf, Dumb 
infinitely beyond the reach of imaginative contrivances. In these lines Seko has swept everything away for you, what you see together with what you do not see, what you hear together with what you do not hear, and what you talk about together with what you cannot talk about. All these are completely brushed off, and you attain the life of the blind, deaf, and dumb. Here all your imaginations, contrivances, and calculations are once and for all put an end to, they are no more made use of. This is where lies the highest point of Zen, this is where we have true blindness, true deafness, and true dumbness, each in its artless and effectless aspect. Above the heavens and below the heavens. How ludicrous, how disheartening. Here Seko lifts up with one hand and with the other puts down. Tell me what he finds to be ludicrous, what he finds to be disheartening. It is ludicrous that this dumb person is not dumb after all, that this deaf person is not after all deaf, it is disheartening that the one who is not at all blind is blind for all that, and that the one who is not at all deaf is deaf for all that. Lilu does not know how to discriminate right color. Lilu lived in the reign of the Emperor Huang. He is said to have been able to distinguish the point of a soft hair at a distance of 100 paces. His eyesight was extraordinary. When the Emperor Huang took a pleasure cruise on the river Chih, he dropped his precious jewel in the water and made Li fetch it up. But he failed. The Emperor made Chih cow search for it, but he also failed to find it. Later Xiang Wang was ordered to get it, and he got it. Hence. When Xiang Wang goes down, the precious gem shines most brilliantly. But where Li Lu walks about, the waves rise even to the sky. When we come to these higher spheres, even the eyes of Li Lu are incapable of discriminating the right color. How can Shi Kuang recognize the mysterious tune? Shi Kuang was the son of Qing Kuang of Qin in the province of Chang under the Zhou dynasty. His other name was Ziyat. He could thoroughly distinguish the five sounds and the six notes, he could even hear the ants fighting on the other side of a hill. When Qin and Chu were at war, Shi Kuang could tell, just by softly fingering the strings of his lute, that the engagement would surely be unfavorable for Chu. In spite of his extraordinary sensitiveness Seko declares that he is unable to recognize the mysterious tune. After all, one who is not at all deaf is really deaf. The most exquisite note in the higher spheres is beyond the hearing of Shi Kuang. Says Seko, I am not going to be a Lilu, nor a Shi Kuang, for what life can compare with this? Sitting quietly by the window. I watch the leaves fall and the flowers bloom, as the seasons come and go. When one reaches this stage of realization, seeing is no seeing, hearing is no hearing, preaching is no preaching. When hungry one eats, when tired one sleeps. Let the leaves fall, let the flowers bloom as they like. When the leaves fall, I know it is the autumn, when the flowers bloom, I know it is the spring. Having swept everything clean before you, Seko now opens a passageway, saying. Do you understand, or not? An iron bar without a hole. He has done all he could for you, he is exhausted, only able to turn round and present you with this iron bar without a hole. It is a most significant expression. Look and see with your own eyes. If you hesitate, you miss the mark forever. Yengo, the author of this commentary, now raised his staff and said, do you see? He then struck his chair and said, Do you hear? Coming down from the chair, he said, Was anything talked about? What precisely is the significance of that iron bar without a hole? I do not pretend to know. Zen has always specialized in nonsense as a means of stimulating the mind to go forward to that which is beyond sense, so perhaps the point of the bar resides precisely in its pointlessness and in our disturbed bewildered reaction to that pointlessness. In the root divine wisdom is all Brahman, in the stem she is all illusion, in the flower she is all world, and in the fruit, all liberation. Tantra Tattva The Sravakas and the Pratyeka Buddhas, when they reach the eighth stage of the Bodhisattva's discipline, become so intoxicated with the bliss of mental tranquility that they fail to realize that the visible world is nothing but the mind. They are still in the realm of individuation, their insight is not yet pure. The Bodhisattvas, on the other hand, 
are alive to their original vows, flowing out of the all-embracing love that is in their hearts. They do not enter into nirvana, as a state separate from the world of becoming, they know that the visible world is nothing but a manifestation of mind itself. Condensed from the Langkavatara Sutra A conscious being alone understands what is meant by moving. To those not endowed with consciousness the moving is unintelligible. If you exercise yourself in the practice of keeping your mind unmoved, the immovable you gain is that of one who has no consciousness. If you are desirous for the truly immovable, the immovable is in the moving itself. And this immovable is the truly immovable one. There is no seed of Buddhahood where there is no consciousness. Mark well how varied are the aspects of the immovable one, and know that the first reality is immovable. Only when this reality is attained, is the true working of suchness understood. Hui Neng These phrases about the unmoving first mover remind one of Aristotle. But between Aristotle and the exponents of the perennial philosophy within the great religious traditions there is this vast difference, Aristotle is primarily concerned with cosmology, the perennial philosophers are primarily concerned with liberation and enlightenment, Aristotle is content to know about the unmoving mover, from the outside and theoretically, the aim of the perennial philosophers is to become directly aware of it, to know it unitively, so that they and others may actually become the unmoving one. This unitive knowledge can be knowledge in the heights, or knowledge in the fullness, or knowledge simultaneously in the heights and the fullness. Spiritual knowledge exclusively in the heights of the soul was rejected by Mahayana Buddhism as inadequate. The similar rejection of quietism within the Christian tradition will be touched upon in the section, Contemplation and Action. Meanwhile it is interesting to find that the problem which aroused such acrimonious debate throughout 17th century Europe had arisen for the Buddhists at a considerably earlier epoch. But whereas in Catholic Europe the outcome of the battle over Molinos, Madame Guyon and Fenelon was to all intents and purposes the extinction of mysticism for the best part of two centuries, in Asia the two parties were tolerant enough to agree to differ. Hinayana spirituality continued to explore the heights within, while the Mahayanist masters held up the ideal not of the Arhat, but of the Bodhisattva, and pointed the way to spiritual knowledge in its fullness as well as in its heights. What follows is a poetical account, by a Zen saint of the 18th century, of the state of those who have realized the Zen ideal. Abiding with the non-particular which is in particulars, going or returning, they remain forever unmoved. Taking hold of the not-thought which lies in thoughts, in their every act they hear the voice of truth. How boundless the sky of contemplation! How transparent the moonlight of the fourfold wisdom! As the truth reveals itself in its eternal tranquility, this very earth is the lotus land of purity. And this body is the body of the Buddha. Heikyuan. Nature's intent is neither food, nor drink, nor clothing, nor comfort, nor anything else from which God is left out. Whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, secretly nature seeks and hunts and tries to ferret out the track in which God may be found. Eckhart. Any flea as it is in God is nobler than the highest of the angels in himself. Eckhart. My inner man relishes things not as creatures but as the gift of God. But to my innermost man they savor not of God's gift, but of ever and I. Eckhart. Pigs eat acorns but neither consider the sun that gave them life, nor the influence of the heavens by which they were nourished, nor the very root of the tree from whence they came. Thomas Traherne Your enjoyment of the world is never right till every morning you awake in heaven, see yourself in your father's palace, and look upon the skies, the earth, and the air as celestial joys, having such a reverend esteem of all, as if you were among the angels. The bride of a monarch, in her husband's chamber, hath no such causes of delight as you. You never enjoy the world aright till the sea itself flow it in your veins, till you are clothed with the heavens and crowned with the stars, and perceive yourself to be the sole heir of the whole world, and more than so, because men are in it who are every one sole heirs as well as you. Till you can sing and rejoice and delight in God, as misers do in gold, and kings and scepters, you can never enjoy the world. Till your spirit filleth the whole world, and the stars are your jewels, till you are as familiar with the ways of God in all ages as with your walk and table, 
till you are intimately acquainted with that shady nothing out of which the world was made, till you love men so as to desire their happiness with a thirst equal to the zeal of your own, till you delight in God for being good to all, you never enjoy the world, till you more feel it than your private estate, and are more present in the hemisphere, considering the glories and the beauties there, than in your own house, till you remember how lately you were made, and how wonderful it was when you came into it, and more rejoice in the palace of your glory than if it had been made today morning. Yet further, you never enjoyed the world aright, till you so love the beauty of enjoying it, that you are covetous and earnest to persuade others to enjoy it, and so perfectly hate the abominable corruption of men in despising it that you had rather suffer the flames of hell than willingly be guilty of their error. The world is a mirror of infinite beauty, yet no man sees it. It is a temple of majesty, yet no man regards it. It is a region of light and peace, did not men disquiet it. It is the paradise of God. It is more to men since he is fallen than it was before. It is the place of angels and the gate of heaven. When Jacob waked out of his dream, he said, God is here, and I wist it not. How dreadful is this place! This is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. Thomas Traherne Before going on to discuss the means whereby it is possible to come to the fullness as well as the height of spiritual knowledge, let us briefly consider the experience of those who have been privileged to behold the One in all things, but have made no efforts to perceive it within themselves. A great deal of interesting material on this subject may be found in Buck's Cosmic Consciousness. All that need be said here is that such cosmic consciousness may come unsought and is in the nature of what Catholic theologians call a gratuitous grace. One may have a gratuitous grace, the power of healing, for example, or foreknowledge, while in a state of mortal sin, and the gift is neither necessary to, nor sufficient for, salvation. At the best such sudden accessions of cosmic consciousness as are described by Buck are merely unusual invitations to further personal effort in the direction of the inner height as well as the external fullness of knowledge. In a great many cases the invitation is not accepted, the gift is prized for the ecstatic pleasure it brings, its coming is remembered nostalgically and, if the recipient happens to be a poet, written about with eloquence, as Byron, for example, wrote in a splendid passage of Child Harold, as Wordsworth wrote in Tintern Abbey and the Prelude. In these matters no human being may presume to pass definitive judgment upon another human being, but it is at least permissible to say that, on the basis of the biographical evidence, there is no reason to suppose that either Wordsworth or Byron ever seriously did anything about the theophanies they described, nor is there any evidence that these theophanies were of themselves sufficient to transform their characters. That enormous egotism, to which De Quincey and Keats and Hayden bear witness, seems to have remained with Wordsworth to the end. And Byron was as fascinatingly and tragicomically Byronic after he had beheld the one in all things as he was before. In this context it is interesting to compare Wordsworth with another great nature lover and man of letters, Saint Bernard. Let nature be your teacher, says the first, and he goes on to affirm that. One impulse from the vernal wood will tell you more of man, of moral evil and of good, than all the sages can. Saint Bernard speaks in what seems a similar strain. What I know of the divine sciences and holy scripture, I learned in woods and fields. I have had no other masters than the beeches and the oaks. And in another of his letters he says, Listen to a man of experience, thou wilt learn more in the woods than in books. Trees and stones will teach thee more than thou canst acquire from the mouth of a magister. The phrases are similar, but their inner significance is very different. In Augustine's language, God alone is to be enjoyed, creatures are not to be enjoyed but used, used with love and compassion and a wondering, detached appreciation, as means to the knowledge of that which may be enjoyed. Wordsworth, like almost all other literary nature worshippers, preaches the enjoyment of creatures rather than their use for the attainment of spiritual ends, a use which, as we shall see, entails much self-discipline for the user. For Bernard it goes without saying that his correspondents are actively practicing this self-discipline and that nature, though loved and heeded as a teacher, is only being used as a means to God, not enjoyed as though she were God. 
The beauty of flowers and landscape is not merely to be relished as one wanders lonely as a cloud about the countryside, is not merely to be pleasurably remembered when one is lying in vacant or in pensive mood on the sofa in the library, after tea. The reaction must be a little more strenuous and purposeful. Here, my brothers, says an ancient Buddhist author, are the roots of trees, here are empty places, meditate. The truth is, of course, that the world is only for those who have deserved it, for, in Philo's words, even though a man may be incapable of making himself worthy of the creator of the cosmos, yet he ought to try to make himself worthy of the cosmos. He ought to transform himself from being a man into the nature of the cosmos and become, if one may say so, a little cosmos. For those who have not deserved the world, either by making themselves worthy of its creator, that is to say, by non-attachment and a total self-nodding, or, less arduously, by making themselves worthy of the cosmos, by bringing order and a measure of unity to the manifold confusion of undisciplined human personality, the world is, spiritually speaking, a very dangerous place. That nirvana and samsara are one is a fact about the nature of the universe, but it is a fact which cannot be fully realized or directly experienced, except by souls far advanced in spirituality. For ordinary, nice, unregenerate people to accept this truth by hearsay, and to act upon it in practice, is merely to court disaster. All the dismal story of antinomianism is there to warn us of what happens when men and women make practical applications of a merely intellectual and unrealized theory that all is God and God is all. And hardly less depressing than the spectacle of antinomianism is that of the earnestly respectable well-rounded life of good citizens who do their best to live sacramentally, but don't in fact have any direct acquaintance with that for which the sacramental activity really stands. Dr. Oman, in his The Natural and the Supernatural, writes at length on the theme that reconciliation to the evanescent is revelation of the eternal, and in a recent volume, Science, Religion, and the Future, Canon Raven applauds Dr. Oman for having stated the principles of a theology, in which there could be no ultimate antithesis between nature and grace, science, and religion, in which, indeed, the worlds of the scientist and the theologian are seen to be one and the same. All this is in full accord with Taoism and Zen Buddhism and with such Christian teachings as St. Augustine's AMA ETFAC Quatvis and Father Lalaman's advice to theocentric contemplatives to go out and act in the world since their actions are the only ones capable of doing any real good to the world. But what neither Dr. Oman nor Canon Raven makes sufficiently clear is that nature and grace, samsara and nirvana, perpetual perishing and eternity, are really and experientially one only to persons who have fulfilled certain conditions. F.A.C. Quatvis in the temporal world, but only when you have learnt the infinitely difficult art of loving God with all your mind and heart and your neighbor as yourself. If you haven't learned this lesson, you will either be an antinomian eccentric or criminal or else a respectable well-rounded lifer, who has left himself no time to understand either nature or grace. The Gospels are perfectly clear about the process by which, and by which alone, a man may gain the right to live in the world as though he were at home in it, he must make a total denial of selfhood, submit to a complete and absolute mortification. At one period of his career, Jesus himself seems to have undertaken austerities, not merely of the mind, but of the body. There is the record of his forty days fast and his statement, evidently drawn from personal experience, that some demons cannot be cast out except by those who have fasted much as well as prayed. The cure d'Ars, whose knowledge of miracles and corporal penance was based on personal experience, insists on the close correlation between severe bodily austerities and the power to get petitionary prayer answered in ways that are sometimes supernormal. The Pharisees reproached Jesus because he came eating and drinking, and associated with publicans and sinners, they ignored, or were unaware of, the fact that this apparently worldly prophet had at one time rivaled the physical austerities of John the Baptist and was practicing the spiritual mortifications which he consistently preached. The pattern of Jesus' life is essentially similar to that of the ideal sage, whose career is traced in the ox-herding pictures, so popular among Zen Buddhists. The wild ox, symbolizing the unregenerate self, is caught, made to change its direction, then tamed and gradually transformed from black to white. 
Regeneration goes so far that for a time the ox is completely lost, so that nothing remains to be pictured but the full orbed moon, symbolizing mind, suchness, the ground. But this is not the final stage. In the end, the herdsman comes back to the world of men, riding on the back of his ox. Because he now loves, loves to the extent of being identified with the divine object of his love, he can do what he likes, for what he likes is what the nature of things likes. He is found in company with winebibbers and butchers, he and they are all converted into Buddhas. For him, there is complete reconciliation to the evanescent end, through that reconciliation, revelation of the eternal. But for nice ordinary unregenerate people the only reconciliation to the evanescent is that of indulged passions, of distractions submitted to and enjoyed. To tell such persons that evanescence and eternity are the same, and not immediately to qualify the statement, is positively fatal, for, in practice, they are not the same except to the saint, and there is no record that anybody ever came to sanctity, who did not, at the outset of his or her career, behave as if evanescence and eternity, nature and grace, were profoundly different and in many respects incompatible. As always, the path of spirituality is a knife edge between abysses. On one side is the danger of mere rejection and escape, on the other the danger of mere acceptance and the enjoyment of things which should only be used as instruments or symbols. The versified caption which accompanies the last of the ox herding pictures runs as follows. Even beyond the ultimate limits there extends a passageway, by which he comes back to the six realms of existence. Every worldly affair is now a Buddhist work, and wherever he goes he finds his home air. Like a gem he stands out even in the mud, like pure gold he shines even in the furnace. Along the endless road, of birth and death, he walks sufficient unto himself. In all circumstances he moves tranquil and unattached. The means whereby man's final end is to be attained will be described and illustrated at length in the section on mortification and non-attachment. This section, however, is mainly concerned with the disciplining of the will. But the disciplining of the will must have as its accompaniment a no less thorough disciplining of the consciousness. There has to be a conversion, sudden or otherwise, not merely of the heart, but also of the senses and of the perceiving mind. What follows is a brief account of this metanoia, as the Greeks called it, this total and radical change of mind. It is in the Indian and Far Eastern formulations of the perennial philosophy that this subject is most systematically treated. What is prescribed is a process of conscious discrimination between the personal self and the self that is identical with Brahman, between the individual ego and the Buddha womb or universal mind. The result of this discrimination is a more or less sudden and complete revulsion of consciousness, and the realization of a state of no mind, which may be described as the freedom from perceptual and intellectual attachment to the ego principle. This state of no mind exists, as it were, on a knife edge between the carelessness of the average sensual man and the strained over-eagerness of the zealot for salvation. To achieve it, one must walk delicately and, to maintain it, must learn to combine the most intense alertness with a tranquil and self-denying passivity, the most indomitable determination with a perfect submission to the leadings of the spirit. When no mind is sought after by a mind, says Huang Po, that is making it a particular object of thought. There is only testimony of silence, it goes beyond thinking. In other words, we, as separate individuals, must not try to think it, but rather permit ourselves to be thought by it. Similarly, in the Diamond Sutra we read that if a bodhisattva, in his attempt to realize suchness, retains the thought of an ego, a person, a separate being, or a soul, he is no longer a bodhisattva. Al-Ghazali, the philosopher of Sufism, also stresses the need for intellectual humbleness and docility. If the thought that he is effaced from self occurs to one who is in FANA, a term roughly corresponding to Zen's no mind, or Mushin, that is a defect. The highest state is to be effaced from effacement. There is an ecstatic effacement from effacement in the interior heights of the Atman Brahman, and there is another, more comprehensive effacement from effacement, not only in the inner heights, but also in and through the world, in the waking, everyday knowledge of God in his fullness.
A man must become truly poor and as free from his own creaturely will as he was when he was born. And I tell you, by the eternal truth, that so long as you desire to fulfill the will of God and have any hankering after eternity and God, for just so long you are not truly poor. He alone has true spiritual poverty who wills nothing, knows nothing, desires nothing. Eckhart The perfect way knows no difficulties, except that it refuses to make preferences. Only when freed from hate and love, does it reveal itself fully and without disguise. A tenth of an inch's difference, and heaven and earth are set apart. If you wish to see it before your own eyes, have no fixed thoughts either for or against it. To set up what you like against what you dislike, this is the disease of the mind. When the deep meaning of the way is not understood, peace of mind is disturbed to no purpose. Pursue not the outer entanglements, dwell not in the inner void. Be serene in the oneness of things, and dualism vanishes of itself. When you strive to gain quiescence by stopping motion, the quiescence so gained is ever in motion. So long as you tarry in such dualism, how can you realize oneness? And when oneness is not thoroughly grasped, loss is sustained in two ways. The denying of external reality is the assertion of it. And the assertion of emptiness, the absolute, is the denying of it. Transformations going on in the empty world that confronts us appear to be real because of ignorance. Do not strive to seek after the true, only cease to cherish opinions. The two exist because of the one, but hold not even to this one. When a mind is not disturbed, the ten thousand things offer no offense. If an eye never falls asleep, all dreams will cease of themselves, if the mind retains its absoluteness. The ten thousand things are of one substance. When the deep mystery of one suchness is fathomed, all of a sudden we forget the external entanglements. When the ten thousand things are viewed in their oneness, we return to the origin and remain where we have always been. One in all, all in one. If only this is realized. No more worry about not being perfect. When mind and each believing mind are not divided, and undivided are each believing mind and mind, this is where words fail. For it is not of the past, present, or future. The Third Patriarch of Zen Do what you are doing now suffer what you are suffering now, to do all this with holiness, nothing need be changed but your hearts. Sanctity consists in willing what happens to us by God's order. De Cao Sada The 17th century Frenchman's vocabulary is very different from that of the 7th century Chinaman's. But the advice they give is fundamentally similar. Conformity to the will of God, submission, docility to the leadings of the Holy Ghost, in practice, if not verbally, these are the same as conformity to the perfect way, refusing to have preferences and cherish opinions, keeping the eyes open so that dreams may cease and truth reveal itself. The world inhabited by ordinary, nice, unregenerate people is mainly dull, so dull that they have to distract their minds from being aware of it by all sorts of artificial amusements, sometimes briefly and intensely pleasurable occasionally or quite often disagreeable and even agonizing. For those who have deserved the world by making themselves fit to see God within it as well as within their own souls, it wears a very different aspect. The corn was orient and immortal wheat, which never should be reaped, nor was ever sown. I thought it had stood from everlasting to everlasting. The dust and stones of the street were as precious as gold. The gates at first were the end of the world. The green trees, when I saw them first through one of the gates, transported and ravished me, their sweetness and unusual beauty made my heart to leap, and almost mad with ecstasy, they were such strange and wonderful things. The men. Oh what venerable and reverend creatures did the aged seem. Immortal cherubim. And young men glittering and sparkling angels, and made strange seraphic pieces of life and beauty. Boys and girls tumbling in the street, and playing were moving jewels. I knew not that they were born or should they. But all things abided eternally as they were in their proper places. Eternity was manifested in the light of the day, and something infinite behind everything appeared, which talked with my expectation and moved my desire. The city seemed to stand in Eden, or to be built in heaven. 
The streets were mine, the temple was mine, the people were mine, their clothes and gold and silver were mine, as much as their sparkling eyes, fair skins and ruddy faces. The skies were mine, and so were the sun and moon and stars, and all the world was mine, and I the only spectator and enjoyer of it. And so it was that with much ado I was corrupted and made to learn the dirty devices of the world. Which now I unlearn, and become as it were a little child again, that I may enter into the kingdom of God. Thomas Traherne Therefore I give you still another thought, which is yet purer and more spiritual, in the kingdom of heaven all is in all, all is one, and all is ours. Eckhart the doctrine that God is in the world has an important practical corollary, the sacredness of nature, and the sinfulness and folly of man's overweening efforts to be her master rather than her intelligently docile collaborator. Subhuman lives and even things are to be treated with respect and understanding, not brutally oppressed to serve our human ends. The ruler of the southern ocean was Shu, the ruler of the northern ocean was Hu, and the ruler of the center was Chaos. Shu and Hu were continually meeting in the land of chaos, who treated them very well. They consulted together how they might repay his kindness, and said, Men all have seven orifices for the purpose of seeing, hearing, eating and breathing, while this ruler alone has not a single one. Let us try to make them for him. Accordingly they dug one orifice in him every day. At the end of seven days chaos died. Chuang Tzu in this delicately comic parable chaos is nature in the state of wu-wei, non-assertion or equilibrium. Shu and Hu are the living images of those busy persons who thought they would improve on nature by turning dry prairies into wheat fields, and produced deserts, who proudly proclaimed the conquest of the air, and then discovered that they had defeated civilization, who chopped down vast forests to provide the newsprint demanded by that universal literacy which was to make the world safe for intelligence and democracy and got wholesale erosion, pulp magazines, and the organs of fascist, communist, capitalist, and nationalist propaganda. In brief, Shu and Hu are devotees of the apocalyptic religion of inevitable progress, and their creed is that the kingdom of heaven is outside you, and in the future. Chuang Tzu, on the other hand, like all good Taoists, has no desire to bully nature into subserving ill-considered temporal ends, at variance with the final end of men as formulated in the perennial philosophy. His wish is to work with nature, so as to produce material and social conditions in which individuals may realize Tao on every level from the physiological up to the spiritual. Compared with that of the Taoists and Far Eastern Buddhists, the Christian attitude towards nature has been curiously insensitive and often downright domineering and violent. Taking their cue from an unfortunate remark in Genesis, Catholic moralists have regarded animals as mere things which men do right to exploit for their own ends. Like landscape painting, the humanitarian movement in Europe was an almost completely secular affair. In the Far East both were essentially religious. The Greeks believed that hubris was always followed by nemesis, that if you went too far you would get a knock on the head to remind you that the gods will not tolerate insolence on the part of mortal men. In the sphere of human relations, the modern mind understands the doctrine of hubris and regards it as mainly true. We wish pride to have a fall, and we see that very often it does fall. To have too much power over one's fellows, to be too rich, too violent, too ambitious, all this invites punishment, and in the long run, we notice, punishment of one sort or another duly comes. But the Greeks did not stop there. Because they regarded nature as in some way divine, they felt that it had to be respected and they were convinced that a hubristic lack of respect for nature would be punished by avenging nemesis. In the Persians, Aeschylus gives the reasons, the ultimate, metaphysical reasons, for the barbarians' defeat. Xerxes was punished for two offenses, overweening imperialism directed against the Athenians, and overweening imperialism directed against nature. He tried to enslave his fellow men, and he tried to enslave the sea, by building a bridge across the Hellespont. Atossa. From shore to shore he bridged the Hellespont. Ghost of Darius. What, could he chain the mighty Bosphorus? Atossa. Even so, some god assisting his design. Ghost of Darius. 
some god of power to cloud his better sense. Today we recognize and condemn the first kind of imperialism, but most of us ignore the existence and even the very possibility of the second. And yet the author of Eruhan was certainly not a fool, and now that we are paying the appalling price for our much-touted conquest of nature his book seems more than ever topical. And Butler was not the only 19th century skeptic in regard to inevitable progress. A generation or more before him, Alfred de Vigny was writing about the new technological marvel of his days, the steam engine, writing in a tone very different from the enthusiastic roarings and trumpetings of his great contemporary, Victor Hugo. Sir L. E. Toro de Fur, Key Fume, Souffle E. T. Bugle, Le Homme E. S. T. Monte Trotot. Null N. E. Connet Anchor Quills Orage San Louis Port C. E. Root Avogla. E. T. L. E. Guy Voyageurl We Lever Sun Tresser. And a little later in the same poem he adds. 2 S. E. Sunt Dit, Allons, Mais Aucan N. E. S. T. L. E. Maitre D. Un Dragon Mujis Sant Chuan Savanta Fate Natra. Nous nous sommes jus a plus fort que nous tu. Looking backwards across the carnage and the devastation, we can see that Vigny was perfectly right. None of those gay travelers, of whom Victor Hugo was the most vociferously eloquent, had the faintest notion where that first, funny little puffing Billy was taking them. Or rather they had a very clear notion, but it happened to be entirely false for they were convinced that Puffing Billy was hauling them at full speed towards universal peace and the brotherhood of man, while the newspapers which they were so proud of being able to read, as the train rumbled along towards its utopian destination not more than fifty years or so away, were the guarantee that liberty and reason would soon be everywhere triumphant. Puffing Billy has now turned into a four-motored bomber loaded with white phosphorus and high explosives, and the free press is everywhere the servant of its advertisers of a pressure group, or of the government. And yet, for some inexplicable reason, the travelers, now far from gay, still hold fast to the religion of inevitable progress, which is, in the last analysis, the hope and faith, in the teeth of all human experience, that one can get something for nothing. How much saner and more realistic is the Greek view that every victory has to be paid for, and that, for some victories, the price exacted is so high that it outweighs any advantage that may be obtained. Modern man no longer regards nature as being in any sense divine and feels perfectly free to behave towards her as an overweening conqueror and tyrant. The spoils of recent technological imperialism have been enormous, but meanwhile Nemesis has seen to it that we get our kicks as well as halfpence. For example, has the ability to travel in 12 hours from New York to Los Angeles given more pleasure to the human race than the dropping of bombs and fire has given pain? There is no known method of computing the amount of felicity or goodness in the world at large. What is obvious, however, is that the advantages accruing from recent technological advances, or, in Greek phraseology, from recent acts of hubris directed against nature, are generally accompanied by corresponding disadvantages, that gains in one direction entail losses in other directions, and that we never get something except for something. Whether the net result of these elaborate credit and debit operations is a genuine progress in virtue, happiness, charity and intelligence is something we can never definitely determine. It is because the reality of progress can never be determined that the 19th and 20th centuries have had to treat it as an article of religious faith. To the exponents of the perennial philosophy, the question whether progress is inevitable or even real is not a matter of primary importance. For them, the important thing is that individual men and women should come to the unitive knowledge of the divine ground, and what interests them in regard to the social environment is not its progressiveness or non-progressiveness, whatever those terms may mean, but the degree to which it helps or hinders individuals in their advance towards man's final end. Chapter 5 Charity he that loveth not know it not God, for God is love. 1 John, 4. By love may he be gotten and holden, but by thought never. The cloud of unknowing. Whosoever studies to reach contemplation, i.e., unitive knowledge, should begin by searchingly inquiring of himself how much he loves. For love is the motive power of the mind, machina mentis, which draws it out of the world and raises it on high. Saint Gregory the Great. The astrolabe of the mysteries of God is love. 
Heavens, deal so still. Let the superfluous and lust dieted man that slaves your ordinance, that will not see. Jalaluddin Rumi. Because he doth not feel, feel your power quickly. Shakespeare. Love is infallible, it has no errors, for all errors are the want of love. William Law. We can only love what we know, and we can never know completely what we do not love. Love is a mode of knowledge, and when the love is sufficiently disinterested and sufficiently intense, the knowledge becomes unitive knowledge and so takes on the quality of infallibility. Where there is no disinterested love, or, more briefly, no charity, there is only biased self-love, and consequently only a partial and distorted knowledge both of the self and of the world of things, lives, minds, and spirit outside the self. The lust-dieted man slaves the ordinances of heaven, that is to say, he subordinates the laws of nature and the spirit to his own cravings. The result is that he does not feel and therefore makes himself incapable of knowledge. His ignorance is ultimately voluntary, if he cannot see, it is because he will not see. Such voluntary ignorance inevitably has its negative reward. Nemesis follows hubris, sometimes in a spectacular way, as when the self-blinded man, Macbeth, Othello, Lear, falls into the trap which his own ambition or possessiveness or petulant vanity has prepared for him, sometimes in a less obvious way, as in the cases where power, prosperity, and reputation endure to the end but at the cost of an ever-increasing imperviousness to grace and enlightenment, an ever-completer inability to escape, now or hereafter, from the stifling prison of selfness and separateness. How profound can be the spiritual ignorance by which such enslavers of heaven's ordinances are punished is indicated by the behavior of Cardinal Richelieu on his deathbed. The priest who attended him urged the great man to prepare his soul for its coming ordeal by forgiving all his enemies. I have never had any enemies, the cardinal replied with the calm sincerity of an ignorance which long years of intrigue and avarice and ambition had rendered as absolute as had been his political power, save only those of the state. Like Napoleon, but in a different way, he was feeling heaven's power, because he had refused to feel charity and therefore refused to know the whole truth about his own soul or anything else. Here on earth the love of God is better than the knowledge of God, while it is better to know inferior things than to love them. By knowing them we raise them, in a way, to our intelligence, whereas by loving them, we stoop towards them and may become subservient to them, as the miser to his gold. St. Thomas Aquinas, paraphrased. This remark seems, at first sight, to be incompatible with what precedes it. But in reality St. Thomas is merely distinguishing between the various forms of love and knowledge. It is better to love no God than just to know about God, without love, through the reading of a treatise on theology. Gold, on the other hand, should never be known with the miser's love, or rather concupiscence, but either abstractly, as the scientific investigator knows it, or else with the disinterested love knowledge of the artist in metal, or of the spectator, who love knows the goldsmith's work, not for its cash value, not for the sake of possessing it, but just because it is beautiful. And the same applies to all created things, lives, and minds. It is bad to love know them with self-centered attachment and cupidity, it is somewhat better to know them with scientific dispassion, it is best to supplement abstract knowledge without cupidity with true disinterested love knowledge, having the quality of aesthetic delight, or of charity, or of both combined. We make an idol of truth itself, for truth apart from charity is not God, but his image and idol, which we must neither love nor worship. Pascal By a kind of philological accident, which is probably no accident at all, but one of the more subtle expressions of man's deep-seated will to ignorance and spiritual darkness, the word charity has come, in modern English, to be synonymous with almsgiving, and is almost never used in its original sense, as signifying the highest and most divine form of love. Owing to this impoverishment of our, at the best of times, very inadequate vocabulary of psychological and spiritual terms, the word love has had to assume an added burden. God is love we repeat glibly, and that we must love our neighbors as ourselves, but love, unfortunately, stands for everything from what happens when, on the screen, 
too close UPS rapturously collide to what happens when a John Woolman or a Peter Claver feels a concern about Negro slaves, because they are temples of the Holy Spirit, from what happens when crowds shout and sing and wave flags in the sport palace or the Red Square to what happens when a solitary contemplative becomes absorbed in the prayer of simple regard. Ambiguity in vocabulary leads to confusion of thought, and, in this matter of love, Confusion of thought admirably serves the purpose of an unregenerate and divided human nature that is determined to make the best of both worlds, to say that it is serving God, while in fact it is serving Mammon, Mars, or Priapus. Systematically or in brief aphorism and parable, the masters of the spiritual life have described the nature of true charity and have distinguished it from the other, lower forms of love. Let us consider its principal characteristics in order. First, Charity is disinterested, seeking no reward, nor allowing itself to be diminished by any return of evil for its good. God is to be loved for himself, not for his gifts and persons and things are to be loved for God's sake, because they are temples of the Holy Ghost Saint. Moreover, since charity is disinterested, it must of necessity be universal. Love seeks no cause beyond itself and no fruit, it is its own fruit, its own enjoyment. I love because I love, I love in order that I may love. Of all the motions and affections of the soul, love is the only one by means of which the creature, though not on equal terms, is able to treat with the Creator and to give back something resembling what has been given to it. When God loves, He only desires to be loved, knowing that love will render all those who love Him happy. Saint Bernard For as love has no by-ends, wills nothing but its own increase, so everything is as oil to its flame, it must have that which it wills and cannot be disappointed, because everything, including unkindness on the part of those loved, naturally helps it to live in its own way and to bring forth its own work. William Law Those who speak ill of me are really my good friends. When, being slandered, I cherish neither enmity nor preference. There grows within me the power of love and humility, which is born of the unborn. Kong Chiatashi. Some people want to see God with their eyes as they see a cow, and to love him as they love their cow, for the milk and cheese and profit it brings them. This is how it is with people who love God for the sake of outward wealth or inward comfort. They do not rightly love God, when they love him for their own advantage. Indeed, I tell you the truth, any object you have in your mind, however good, will be a barrier between you and the inmost truth. Eckhart. A beggar, Lord, I ask of thee. More than a thousand kings could ask. Each one wants something, which he asks of thee. I come to ask thee to give me thyself. Ansari of Herod. I will have nothing to do with a love which would be for God or in God. This is a love which pure love cannot abide, for pure love is God himself. Saint Catherine of Genoa. As a mother, even at the risk of her own life, protects her son, her only son, so let there be goodwill without measure between all beings. Let goodwill without measure prevail in the whole world, above, below, around, unstinted, unmixed with any feeling of differing or opposing interests. If a man remain steadfastly in this state of mind all the time he is awake, then is come to pass the saying, even in this world holiness has been found. Metasutta Learn to look with an equal eye upon all beings, seeing the one self in all. Srimad Bhagavatam The second distinguishing mark of charity is that, unlike the lower forms of love, it is not an emotion. It begins as an act of the will and is consummated as a purely spiritual awareness, a unitive love knowledge of the essence of its object. Let everyone understand that real love of God does not consist in tear shedding, nor in that sweetness and tenderness for which Usually we long, just because they console us, but in serving God in justice, fortitude of soul and humility. Saint Teresa The worth of love does not consist in high feelings, but in detachment, in patience under all trials for the sake of God whom we love. Saint John of the Cross By love I do not mean any natural tenderness, which is more or less in people according to their constitution, but I mean a larger principle of the soul founded in reason and piety, which makes us tender, 
kind and gentle to all our fellow creatures as creatures of God, and for his sake. William Law The nature of charity, or the love knowledge of God, is defined by Shankara, the great Vedantist saint and philosopher of the 9th century, in the 32nd couplet of his Vivka Chudamani. Among the instruments of emancipation the supreme is devotion. Contemplation of the true form of the real self, the Atman which is identical with Brahman, is said to be devotion. In other words, the highest form of the love of God is an immediate spiritual intuition, by which knower, known and knowledge are made one. The means to, and earlier stages of, this supreme love knowledge of spirit by spirit are described by Shankara in the preceding verses of his philosophical poem, and consist in acts of a will directed towards the denial of selfness in thought, feeling, and action, towards desirelessness and non-attachment or, to use the corresponding Christian term, holy indifference, towards a cheerful acceptance of affliction, without self-pity and without thought of returning evil for evil, and finally, towards unsleeping and one-pointed mindfulness of the Godhead who is at once transcendent and, because transcendent, imminent in every soul. It is plain that no distinct object whatever that pleases the will can be God, and, for that reason, if the will is to be united with him, it must empty itself, cast away every disorderly affection of the desire, every satisfaction it may distinctly have, high and low, temporal and spiritual, so that, purified and cleansed from all unruly satisfactions, joys and desires, it may be wholly occupied, with all its affections, in loving God. For if the will can in any way comprehend God and be united with him, it cannot be through any capacity of the desire, but only by love, and as all the delight, sweetness and joy, of which the will is sensible, is not love, it follows that none of these pleasing impressions can be the adequate means of uniting the will to God. These adequate means consist in an act of the will. And because an act of the will is quite distinct from feeling, it is by an act that the will is united with God and rests in him that act is love. This union is never wrought by feeling or exertion of the desire, for these remain in the soul as aims and ends. It is only as motives of love that feelings can be of service, if the will is bent on going onwards, and for nothing else. He, then, is very unwise who, when sweetness and spiritual delight fail him, thinks for that reason that God has abandoned him, and when he finds them again, rejoices and is glad thinking that he has in that way come to possess God. More unwise still is he who goes about seeking for sweetness in God, rejoices in it, and dwells upon it, for in so doing he is not seeking after God with the will grounded in the emptiness of faith and charity, but only in spiritual sweetness and delight, which is a created thing, following herein in his own will and fond pleasure. It is impossible for the will to attain to the sweetness and bliss of the divine union otherwise than in detachment, in refusing to the desire every pleasure in the things of heaven and earth. Saint John of the Cross Love, the sensible love of the emotions, does not unify. True, it unites in act, but it does not unite in essence. Eckhart The reason why sensible love even of the highest object cannot unite the soul to its divine ground in spiritual essence is that, like all other emotions of the heart, sensible love intensifies that selfness, which is the final obstacle in the way of such union. The damned are in eternal movement without any mixture of rest, we mortals, who are yet in this pilgrimage, have now movement, now rest. Only God has repose without movement. Consequently it is only if we abide in the peace of God that passes all understanding that we can abide in the knowledge and love of God. And to the peace that passes understanding, we have to go by way of the humble and very ordinary peace which can be understood by everybody, peace between nations and within them, for wars and violent revolutions have the effect of more or less totally eclipsing God for the majority of those involved in them, peace between individuals and within the individual soul, for personal quarrels and private fears, loves, hates, ambitions and distractions are, in their petty way, no less fatal to thee development of the spiritual life than are the greater calamities. We have to will the peace that it is within our power to get for ourselves and others, in order that we may be fit to receive that other peace, which is a fruit of the spirit and the condition, as Saint Paul implied, of the unitive knowledge love of God.
It is by means of tranquility of mind that you are able to transmute this false mind of death and rebirth into the clear intuitive mind and, by so doing, to realize the primal and enlightening essence of mind. You should make this your starting point for spiritual practices. Having harmonized your starting point with your goal, you will be able by right practice to attain your true end of perfect enlightenment. If you wish to tranquilize your mind and restore its original purity, you must proceed as you would do if you were purifying a jar of muddy water. You first let it stand, until the sediment settles at the bottom, when the water will become clear, which corresponds with the state of the mind before it was troubled by defiling passions. Then you carefully strain off the pure water. When the mind becomes tranquilized and concentrated into perfect unity, then all things will be seen, not in their separateness, but in their unity, wherein there is no place for the passions to enter, and which is in full conformity with the mysterious and indescribable purity of Nirvana. Sarangama Sutra This identity out of the one into the one and with the one is the source and fountainhead and breaking forth of glowing love. Eckhart Spiritual progress, as we have had occasion to discover in several other contexts, is always spiral and reciprocal. Peace from distractions and emotional agitations is the way to charity, and charity, or unitive love knowledge is the way to the higher peace of God. And the same is true of humility, which is the third characteristic mark of charity. Humility is a necessary condition of the highest form of love, and the highest form of love makes possible the consummation of humility in a total self nodding Would you become a pilgrim on the road of love? The first condition is that you make yourself humble as dust and ashes. Ansari of Herat I have but one word to say to you concerning love for your neighbor, namely that nothing save humility can mold you to it, nothing but the consciousness of your own weakness can make you indulgent and pitiful to that of others. You will answer, I quite understand that humility should produce forbearance towards others, but how am I first to acquire humility? Two things combined will bring that about you must never separate them. The first is contemplation of the deep gulf, whence God's all-powerful hand has drawn you out, and over which he ever holds you, so to say, suspended. The second is the presence of that all-penetrating God. It is only in beholding and loving God that we can learn forgetfulness of self, measure duly the nothingness which has dazzled us, and accustom ourselves thankfully to decrease beneath that great majesty which absorbs all things. Love God and you will be humble, love God and you will throw off the love of self, love God and you will love all that he gives you to love for love of him. Fenelon Feelings, as we have seen, may be of service as motives of charity, but charity as charity has its beginning in the will, will to peace and humility in oneself, will to patience and kindness towards one's fellow creatures, will to that disinterested love of God which asks nothing and refuses nothing. But the will can be strengthened by exercise and confirmed by perseverance. This is very clearly brought out in the following record, delightful for its Boswellian vividness, of a conversation between the young Bishop of Belly and his beloved friend and master, Francois de Sales. I once asked the Bishop of Geneva what one must do to attain perfection. You must love God with all your heart, he answered, and your neighbor as yourself. I did not ask wherein perfection lies. I rejoined, but how to attain it? Charity, he said again, that is both the means and the end, the only way by which we can reach that perfection which is, after all, but charity itself. Just as the soul is the life of the body, so charity is the life of the soul. I know all that, I said. But I want to know how one is to love God with all one's heart and one's neighbor as oneself. But again he answered, we must love God with all our hearts, and our neighbor as ourselves. I am no further than I was, I replied. Tell me how to acquire such love. The best way, the shortest and easiest way of loving God with all one's heart is to love him wholly and heartily. He would give no other answer. At last, however, the bishop said, there are many besides you who want me to tell them of methods and systems and secret ways of becoming perfect and I can only tell them that the sole secret is a hearty love of God, and the only way of attaining that love is by loving. You learn to speak by speaking, to study by studying, to run by running, 
to work by working, and just so you learn to love God and man by loving. All those who think to learn in any other way deceive themselves. If you want to love God, go on loving him more and more. Begin as a mere apprentice, and the very power of love will lead you on to become a master in the art. Those who have made most progress will continually press on, never believing themselves to have reached their end, for charity should go on increasing until we draw our last breath. Jean-Pierre Camus The passage from what Saint Bernard calls the carnal love of the sacred humanity to the spiritual love of the Godhead, from the emotional love that can only unite lover and beloved in act to the perfect charity which unifies them in spiritual substance, is reflected in religious practice as the passage from meditation, discursive and effective, to infused contemplation. All Christian writers insist that the spiritual love of the Godhead is superior to the carnal love of the humanity, which serves as introduction and means to man's final and in unitive love knowledge of the divine ground, but all insist no less strongly that carnal love is a necessary introduction and an indispensable means. Oriental writers would agree that this is true for many persons, but not for all since there are some born contemplatives who are able to harmonize their starting point with their goal and to embark directly upon the yoga of knowledge. It is from the point of view of the born contemplative that the greatest of Taoist philosophers writes in the following passage. Those men who in a special way regard heaven as father and have, as it were, a personal love for it, how much more should they love what is above heaven as father? Other men in a special way regard their rulers as better than themselves and they, as it were, personally die for them. How much more should they die for what is truer than a ruler when the springs dry up, the fish are all together on dry land. They then moisten each other with their dampness and keep each other wet with their slime. But this is not to be compared with forgetting each other in a river or lake. Chuang Tzu The slime of personal and emotional love is remotely similar to the water of the Godhead's spiritual being, but of inferior quality and precisely because the love is emotional and therefore personal, of insufficient quantity. Having, by their voluntary ignorance, wrongdoing and wrong being, caused the divine springs to dry up, human beings can do something to mitigate the horrors of their situation by keeping one another wet with their slime. But there can be no happiness or safety in time and no deliverance into eternity, until they give up thinking that slime is enough and, by abandoning themselves to what is in fact their element, call back the eternal waters. To those who seek first the kingdom of God, all the rest will be added. From those who, like the modern idolaters of progress, seek first all the rest in the expectation that, after the harnessing of atomic power and the next revolution but three, the kingdom of God will be added, everything will be taken away. And yet we continue to trust in progress, to regard personal slime as the highest form of spiritual moisture and to prefer an agonizing and impossible existence on dry land to love, joy and peace in our native ocean. The sect of lovers is distinct from all others, lovers have a religion and a faith all their own. Jalaluddin Rumi The soul lives by that which it loves rather than in the body which it animates. For it has not its life in the body, but rather gives it to the body and lives in that which it loves. Saint John of the Cross Temperance is love surrendering itself wholly to him who is its object, courage is love bearing all things gladly for the sake of him who is its object, justice is love serving only him who is its object, and therefore rightly ruling, prudence is love making wise distinctions between what hinders and what helps itself. Saint Augustine The distinguishing marks of charity are disinterestedness, tranquility and humility. But where there is disinterestedness there is neither greed for personal advantage nor fear for personal loss or punishment, where there is tranquility, there is neither craving nor aversion, but a steady will to conform to the divine Tao or Logos on every level of existence and a steady awareness of the divine suchness and what should be one's own relations to it, and where there is humility there is no censoriousness and no glorification of the ego or any projected alter ego at the expense of others who are recognized as having the same weaknesses and faults, but also the same capacity for transcending them in the unitive knowledge of God, as one has oneself. From all this it follows that charity is the root and substance of morality, and that where there is little charity there will be much avoidable evil. All this has been summed up in Augustine's formula, love, and do what you like. 
Among the later elaborations of the Augustinian theme we may cite the following from the writings of John Everard, one of those spiritually minded 17th century divines whose teachings fell on the deaf ears of warring factions and, when the revolution and the military dictatorship were at an end, on the even deafer ears of restoration clergymen and their successors in the Augustan age. Just how deaf those ears could be we may judge by what Swift wrote of his beloved and morally perfect Hohenms. The subject matter of their conversations, as of their poetry, consisted of such things as friendship and benevolence, the visible operations of nature or ancient traditions, the bounds and limits of virtue, the unerring rules of reason. Never once do the ideas of God or charity or deliverance engage their minds. Which shows sufficiently clearly what the Dean of St. Patrick's thought of the religion by which he made his money. Turn the man loose who has found the living guide within him, and then let him neglect the outward if he can. Just as you would say to a man who loves his wife with all tenderness, you are at liberty to beat her, hurt her or kill her, if you want to. John Everard From this it follows that, where there is charity, there can be no coercion. God forces no one, for love cannot compel, and God's service, therefore, is a thing of perfect freedom. Hans Denk but just because it cannot compel, charity has a kind of authority, a non-coercive power, by means of which it defends itself and gets its beneficent will done in the world, not always, of course, not inevitably or automatically, for individuals and, still more, organizations can be impenetrably armored against divine influence, but in a surprisingly large number of cases. Heaven arms with pity those whom it would not see destroyed. Lao Tzu he abused me, he beat me, he defeated me, he robbed me, in those who harbor such thoughts hatred will never cease. He abused me, he beat me, he defeated me, he robbed me, in those who do not harbor such thoughts hatred will cease. For hatred does not cease by hatred at any time, this is an old rule. Damopita. Our present economic, social and international arrangements are based, in large measure, upon organized lovelessness. We begin by lacking charity towards nature, so that instead of trying to co-operate with Tao or the Logos on the inanimate and subhuman levels, we try to dominate and exploit, we waste the Earth's mineral resources, ruin its soil, ravage its forests, pour filth into its rivers and poisonous fumes into its air. From lovelessness in relation to nature we advance to lovelessness in relation to art, a lovelessness so extreme that we have effectively killed all the fundamental or useful arts and set up various kinds of mass production by machines in their place. And of course this lovelessness in regard to art is at the same time a lovelessness in regard to the human beings who have to perform the foolproof and graceproof tasks imposed by our mechanical art surrogates and by the interminable paperwork connected with mass production and mass distribution. With mass production and mass distribution go mass financing, and the three have conspired to expropriate ever-increasing numbers of small owners of land and productive equipment, thus reducing the sum of freedom among the majority and increasing the power of a minority to exercise a coercive control over the lives of their fellows. This coercively controlling minority is composed of private capitalists or governmental bureaucrats or of both classes of bosses acting in collaboration, and, of course, the coercive and therefore essentially loveless nature of the control remains the same, whether the bosses call themselves company directors or civil servants. The only difference between these two kinds of oligarchical rulers is that the first derive more of their power from wealth than from position within a conventionally respected hierarchy, while the second derive more power from position than from wealth. Upon this fairly uniform groundwork of loveless relationships are imposed others, which vary widely from one society to another, according to local conditions and local habits of thought and feeling. Here are a few examples, contempt and exploitation of colored minorities living among white majorities, or of colored majorities governed by minorities of white imperialists, hatred of Jews, Catholics, Freemasons, or of any other minority whose language, habits, appearance or religion happens to differ from those of the local majority. And the crowning superstructure of unchanged variety is the organized lovelessness of the relations between state and sovereign state, 
a lovelessness that expresses itself in the axiomatic assumption that it is right and natural for national organizations to behave like thieves and murderers, armed to the teeth and ready, at the first favorable opportunity, to steal and kill. Just how axiomatic is this assumption about the nature of nationhood is shown by the history of Central America. So long as the arbitrarily delimited territories of Central America were called provinces of the Spanish colonial empire, there was peace between their inhabitants. But early in the 19th century the various administrative districts of the Spanish Empire broke from their allegiance to their mother country and decided to become nations on the European model. Result, they immediately went to war with one another. Why? Because, by definition, a sovereign national state is an organization that has the right and duty to coerce its members to steal and kill on the largest possible scale. Lead us not into temptation must be the guiding principle of all social organization, and the temptations to be guarded against and, so far as possible, eliminated by means of appropriate economic and political arrangements are temptations against charity, that is to say, against the disinterested love of God, nature, and man. First, the dissemination and general acceptance of any form of the perennial philosophy will do something to preserve men and women from the temptation to idolatrous worship of things in time, church worship, state worship, revolutionary future worship, humanistic self-worship, all of them essentially and necessarily opposed to charity. Next come decentralization, widespread private ownership of land and the means of production on a small scale, discouragement of monopoly by state or corporation, division of economic and political power, the only guarantee, as Lord Acton was never tired of insisting, of civil liberty under law. These social rearrangements would do much to prevent ambitious individuals, organizations, and governments from being led into the temptation of behaving tyrannously, while CO operatives, democratically controlled professional organizations and town meetings would deliver the masses of the people from the temptation of making their decentralized individualism too rugged. But of course none of these intrinsically desirable reforms can possibly be carried out, so long as it is thought right and natural that sovereign states should prepare to make war on one another. For modern war cannot be waged except by countries with an overdeveloped capital goods industry, countries in which economic power is wielded either by the state or by a few monopolistic corporations which it is easy to tax and, if necessary, temporarily to nationalize, countries where the laboring masses, being without property, are rootless, easily transferable from one place to another, highly regimented by factory discipline. Any decentralized society of free, uncoaped small owners, with a properly balanced economy must, in a war-making world such as ours, be at the mercy of one whose production is highly mechanized and centralized, whose people are without property and therefore easily coercible, and whose economy is lopsided. This is why the one desire of industrially undeveloped countries like Mexico and China is to become like Germany, or England, or the United States. So long as the organized lovelessness of war and preparation for war remains, there can be no mitigation, on any large, nationwide, or worldwide scale, of the organized lovelessness of our economic and political relationships. War and preparation for war are standing temptations to make the present bad. God eclipsing arrangements of society progressively worse as technology becomes progressively more efficient. Chapter 6 Mortification, Non-Attachment, Right Livelihood This treasure of the kingdom of God has been hidden by time and multiplicity in the soul's own works, or briefly by its creaturely nature. But in the measure that the soul can separate itself from this multiplicity, to that extent it reveals within itself the kingdom of God. Here the soul and the Godhead are one. Eckhart. Our kingdom go is the necessary and unavoidable corollary of thy kingdom come. For the more there is of self, the less there is of God. The divine eternal fullness of life can be gained only by those who have deliberately lost the partial, separative life of craving and self-interest, of egocentric thinking, feeling, wishing and acting. Mortification or deliberate dying to self is inculcated with an uncompromising firmness in the canonical writings of Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism and most of the other major and minor religions of the world, and by every theocentric saint and spiritual reformer who has ever lived out and expounded the principles of the perennial philosophy. But this self-nodding is never, 
at least by anyone who knows what he is talking about, regarded as an end in itself. It possesses merely an instrumental value, as the indispensable means to something else. In the words of one whom we have often had occasion to cite in earlier sections, it is necessary for all of us to learn the true nature and worth of all self-denials and mortifications. As to their nature, considered in themselves, they have nothing of goodness or holiness, nor are any real part of our sanctification, they are not the true food or nourishment of the divine life in our souls, they have no quickening, sanctifying power in them, their only worth consists in this, that they remove the impediments of holiness, break down that which stands between God and us, and make way for the quickening, sanctifying spirit of God to operate on our souls, which operation of God is the one only thing that can raise the divine life in the soul, or help it to the smallest degree of real holiness or spiritual life. Hence we may learn the reason why many people not only lose the benefit, but are even the worse for all their mortifications. It is because they mistake the whole nature and worth of them. They practice them for their own sakes, as things good in themselves, they think them to be real parts of holiness, and so rest in them and look no further, but grow full of self-esteem and self-admiration for their own progress in them. This makes them self-sufficient, morose, severe judges of all those that fall short of their mortifications. And thus their self-denials do only that for them which indulgences do for other people, they withstand and hinder the operation of God upon their souls, and instead of being really self-denials, they strengthen and keep up the kingdom of self. William Law The rout and destruction of the passions, while a good, is not the ultimate good, the discovery of wisdom is the surpassing good. When this is found, all the people will sing. Philo Living in religion, as I can speak by experience, if one is not in a right course of prayer and other exercises between God and our soul, one's nature grow it much worse than ever it would have been, if one had lived in the world. For pride and self-love, which are rooted in the soul by sin, find means to strengthen themselves exceedingly in religion, if the soul is not in a course that may teach her and procure her true humility. For by the corrections and contradictions of the will, which cannot be avoided by any living in a religious community, I find my heart grown, as I may say, as hard as a stone, and nothing would have been able to soften it but by being put into a course of prayer, by which the soul tendeth towards God and learneth of him the lesson of truly humbling herself. Dame Gertrude Moore Once, when I was grumbling over being obliged to eat meat and do no penance, I heard it said that sometimes there was more of self-love than desire of penance in such sorrow. Saint Teresa That the mortified are in some respects, often much worse than the unmortified is a commonplace of history, fiction, and descriptive psychology. Thus, the Puritan may practice all the cardinal virtues, prudence, fortitude, temperance, and chastity, and yet remain a thoroughly bad man, for, in all too many cases, these virtues of his are accompanied by, and indeed causally connected with, the sins of pride, envy, chronic anger, and an uncharitableness pushed sometimes to the level of active cruelty. Mistaking the means for the end, the Puritan has fancied himself holy because he is stoically austere. But stoical austerity is merely the exaltation of the more creditable side of the ego at the expense of the less creditable. Holiness, on the contrary, is the total denial of the separative self, in its creditable no less than its discreditable aspects and the abandonment of the will to God. To the extent that there is attachment to I, me, mine, there is no attachment to, and therefore no unitive knowledge of, the divine ground. Mortification has to be carried to the pitch of non-attachment or, in the phrase of Saint Francois de Sales, holy indifference, otherwise it merely transfers self-will from one channel to another, not merely without decrease in the total volume of that self-will but sometimes with an actual increase. As usual, the corruption of the best is the war saint the difference between the mortified, but still proud and self-centered stoic and the unmortified hedonist consists in this, the latter, being flabby, shiftless, and at heart rather ashamed of himself, lacks the energy and the motive to do much harm except to his own body, mind, and spirit, the former, because he has all the secondary virtues and looks down on those who are not like himself, is morally equipped to wish and to be able to do harm. 
on the very largest scale and with a perfectly untroubled conscience. These are obvious facts, and yet, in the current religious jargon of our day the word immoral is reserved almost exclusively for the carnally self-indulgent. The covetous and the ambitious, the respectable toughs and those who cloak their lust for power and place under the right sort of idealistic cant, are not merely unblamed, they are even held up as models of virtue and godliness. The representatives of the organized churches begin by putting halos on the heads of the people who do most to make wars and revolutions, then go on, rather plaintively, to wonder why the world should be in such a mess. Mortification is not, as many people seem to imagine, a matter, primarily, of severe physical austerities. It is possible that, for certain persons in certain circumstances, the practice of severe physical austerities may prove helpful in advance towards man's final end. In most cases, however, it would seem that what is gained by such austerities is not liberation, but something quite different, the achievement of psychic powers. The ability to get petitionary prayer answered, the power to heal and work other miracles, the knack of looking into the future or into other people's minds, these, it would seem, are often related in some kind of causal connection with fasting, watching, and the self-infliction of pain. Most of the great theocentric saints and spiritual teachers have admitted the existence of supernormal powers, only, however, to deplore them. To think that such cities, as the Indians call them, have anything to do with liberation is, they say, a dangerous illusion. These things are either irrelevant to the main issue of life, or, if too much prized and attended to, an obstacle in the way of spiritual advance. Nor are these the only objections to physical austerities. Carried to extremes, they may be dangerous to health, and without health the steady persistence of effort required by the spiritual life is very difficult of achievement. And being difficult, painful, and generally conspicuous, physical austerities are a standing temptation to vanity and the competitive spirit of record-breaking. When thou didst give thyself up to physical mortification, thou wast great, thou wast admired. So writes Siso of his own experiences, experiences which led him, just as Gautama Buddha had been led many centuries before, to give up his course of bodily penance. And Saint Teresa remarks how much easier it is to impose great penances upon oneself than to suffer in patience, charity, and humbleness the ordinary everyday crosses of family life, which did not prevent her, incidentally, from practicing, to the very day of her death, the most excruciating forms of self-torture. Whether these austerities really helped her to come to the unitive knowledge of God, or whether they were prized and persisted in because of the psychic powers they helped to develop, there is no means of determining. Our dear saint, Francois de Sales, disapproved of immoderate fasting. He used to say that the spirit could not endure the body when overfed, but that, if underfed, the body could not endure the spirit. Jean-Pierre Camus When the will, the moment it feels any joy in sensible things rises upwards in that joy to God, and when sensible things move it to pray, it should not neglect them, it should make use of them for so holy an exercise, because sensible things, in these conditions, subserve the end for which God created them, namely to be occasions for making him better known and loved. Saint John of the Cross he who is not conscious of liberty of spirit among the things of sense and sweetness, things which should serve as motives to prayer, and whose will rests and feeds upon them, ought to abstain from the use of them, for to him they are a hindrance on the road to God. Saint John of the Cross One man may declare that he cannot fast, but can he declare that he cannot love God? Another may affirm that he cannot preserve virginity or sell all his goods in order to give the price to the poor but can he tell me that he cannot love his enemies? All that is necessary is to look into one's own heart, for what God asks of us is not found at a great distance. Saint Jerome Anybody who wishes to do so can get all, and indeed more than all, the mortification he wants out of the incidents of ordinary, day-to-day -day living, without ever resorting to harsh bodily penance. Here are the rules laid down by the author of Holy Wisdom for Dame Gertrude Moore. First, that she should do all that belonged to her to do by any law, human or divine. Secondly, that she was to refrain from doing those things that were forbidden her by human or divine law, 
or by divine inspiration. Thirdly, that she should bear with as much patience or resignation as possible all crosses and contradictions to her natural will, which were inflicted by the hand of God. Such, for instance, were aridities, temptations, afflictions or bodily pain, sickness and infirmity, or again, the loss of friends or want of necessaries and comforts. All this was to be endured patiently, whether the crosses came direct from God or by means of his creatures. These indeed were mortifications enough for Dame Gertrude, or for any other soul, and there was no need for anyone to advise or impose others. Augustine Baker To sum up, that mortification is the best which results in the elimination of self-will, self-interest, self-centered thinking, wishing and imagining. Extreme physical austerities are not likely to achieve this kind of mortification. But the acceptance of what happens to us, apart, of course, from our own sins, in the course of daily living is likely to produce this result. If specific exercises in self-denial are undertaken, they should be inconspicuous, non-competitive and uninjurious to health. Thus, in the matter of diet, most people will find it sufficiently mortifying to refrain from eating all the things which the experts in nutrition condemn as unwholesome. And where social relations are concerned, self-denial should take the form, not of showy acts of would-be humility, but of control of the tongue and the moods, in refraining from saying anything uncharitable or merely frivolous, which means, in practice, refraining from about 50% of ordinary conversation, and in behaving calmly and with quiet cheerfulness when external circumstances or the state of our bodies predisposes us to anxiety, gloom, or an excessive elation. When a man practices charity in order to be reborn in heaven, or for fame, or reward, or from fear, such charity can obtain no pure effect. Sutra on the Distinction and Protection of the Dharma When Prince Wen Wang was on a tour of inspection in Tsung, he saw an old man fishing. But his fishing was not real fishing, for he did not fish in order to catch fish, but to amuse himself. So Wen Wang wished to employ him in the administration of government, but feared lest his own ministers, uncles and brothers might object. On the other hand, if he let the old man go, he could not bear to think of the people being deprived of such an influence. Chuang Tzu God, if I worship thee in fear of hell, burn me in hell. And if I worship thee in hope of paradise, exclude me from paradise, but if I worship thee for thine own sake, withhold not thine everlasting beauty. Rubye. Rubye, the Sufi woman saint, speaks, thinks and feels in terms of devotional theism, the Buddhist theologian, in terms of impersonal moral law, the Chinese philosopher, with characteristic humor, in terms of politics but all three insist on the need for non-attachment to self-interest, insist on it as strongly as does Christ when he reproaches the Pharisees for their egocentric piety, as does the Krishna of the Bhagavad Gita, when he tells Arjuna to do his divinely ordained duty without personal craving for, or fear of, the fruits of his actions. Saint Ignatius Loyola was once asked what his feelings would be if the Pope were to suppress the company of Jesus. A quarter of an hour of prayer, he answered, and I should think no more about it. This is, perhaps, the most difficult of all mortifications, to achieve a holy indifference to the temporal success or failure of the cause to which one has devoted one's best energies. If it triumphs, well and good, and if it meets defeat, that also is well and good, if only in ways that, to a limited and time-bound mind, are here and now entirely incomprehensible. By a man without passions I mean one who does not permit good or evil to disturb his inward economy, but rather falls in with what happens and does not add to the sum of his mortality. Chuang Tzu The fitting disposition for union with God is not that the soul should understand, feel, taste or imagine anything on the subject of the nature of God, or any other thing whatever, but should remain in that pureness and love which is perfect resignation and complete detachment from all things for God alone. St. John of the Cross Disquietude is always vanity, because it serves no good. Yes, even if the whole world were thrown into confusion and all things in it, disquietude on that account would be vanity. St. John of the Cross 
sufficient not only unto the day, but also unto the place, is the evil thereof. Agitation over happenings which we are powerless to modify, either because they have not yet occurred, or else are occurring at an inaccessible distance from us, achieves nothing beyond the inoculation of here and now with the remote or anticipated evil that is the object of our distress. Listening four or five times a day to newscasters and commentators, reading the morning papers and all the weeklies and monthlies, nowadays, this is described as taking an intelligent interest in politics. Saint John of the Cross would have called it indulgence in idle curiosity and the cultivation of disquietude for disquietude's sake. I want very little, and what I do want I have very little wish for. I have hardly any desires, but if I were to be born again, I should have none at all. We should ask nothing and refuse nothing, but leave ourselves in the arms of divine providence without wasting time in any desire, except to will what God wills of us. Saint Francois de Sales Push far enough towards the void, hold fast enough to quietness. And of the ten thousand things none but can be worked on by you. I have beheld them, whither they go back. See, all things howsoever they flourish return to the root from which they grew. This return to the root is called quietness, quietness is called submission to fate. What has submitted to fate becomes part of the always so, to know the always so is to be illumined. Not to know it means to go blindly to disaster. Lao Tzu I wish I could join the solitaries, on Kalde Island, instead of being superior and having to write books. But I don't wish to have what I wish, of course. Abbot John Chapman We must not wish anything other than what happens from moment to moment, all the while, however, exercising ourselves in goodness. Saint Catherine of Genoa In the practice of mortification as in most other fields, advances along a knife edge. On one side lurks the scylla of egocentric austerity, on the other the charybdis of an uncaring quietism. The holy indifference inculcated by the exponents of the perennial philosophy is neither stoicism nor mere passivity. It is rather an active resignation. Self-will is renounced, not that there may be a total holiday from willing, but that the divine will may use the mortified mind and body as its instrument for good. Or we may say, with Kabir, that the devout seeker is he who mingles in his heart the double currents of love and detachment, like the mingling of the streams of Ganges and Jumna. Until we put an end to particular attachments, there can be no love of God with the whole heart, mind, and strength and no universal charity towards all creatures for God's sake. Hence the hard sayings in the Gospels about the need to renounce exclusive family ties. And if the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, if the Tathagata and the Bodhisattvas have their thoughts awakened to the nature of reality without abiding in anything whatever, this is because a truly godlike love which, like the sun, shines equally upon the just and the unjust, is impossible to a mind imprisoned in private preferences and aversions. The soul that is attached to anything, however much good there may be in it, will not arrive at the liberty of divine union. For whether it be a strong wire rope or a slender and delicate thread that holds the bird, it matters not, if it really holds it fast, for, until the cord be broken, the bird cannot fly. So the soul, held by the bonds of human affections, however slight they may be, cannot, while they last, make its way to God. Saint John of the Cross there are some who are newly delivered from their sins and so, though they are resolved to love God, they are still novices and apprentices, soft and weak. They love a number of superfluous, vain and dangerous things at the same time as our Lord. Though they love God above all things, they yet continue to take pleasure in many things which they do not love according to God, but besides Him, things such as slight inordinations in word, gesture, clothing, pastimes and frivolities. Saint Francois de Sales There are souls who have made some progress in divine love, and have cut off all the love they had for dangerous things, yet they still have dangerous and superfluous loves, because they love what God wills them to love, but with excess and too tender and passionate a love. The love of our relations, friends and benefactors is itself according to God, but we may love them excessively, as also our vocations, however spiritual they be and our devotional exercises, which we should yet love very greatly, 
may be loved inordinately, when we set them above obedience and the more general good, or care for them as an end, when they are only means. Saint Francois de Sales The goods of God, which are beyond all measure, can only be contained in an empty and solitary heart. Saint John of the Cross Suppose a boat is crossing a river and another boat, an empty one, is about to collide with it. Even an irritable man would not lose his temper. But suppose there was someone in the second boat. Then the occupant of the first would shout to him to keep clear. And if he did not hear the first time, nor even when called to three times, bad language would inevitably follow. In the first case there was no anger, in the second there was, because in the first case the boat was empty, in the second it was occupied. And so it is with man. If he could only pass empty through life, who would be able to injure him? Chuang Tzu When the heart weeps for what it has lost, the spirit laughs for what it has found. Anonymous Sufi Aphorism It is by losing the egocentric life that we save the hitherto latent and undiscovered life which, in the spiritual part of our being, we share with the divine ground. This newfound life is more abundant than the other, and of a different and higher kind. Its possession is liberation into the eternal, and liberation is beatitude. Necessarily so, for the Brahman, who is one with the Atman, is not only being and knowledge, but also bliss, and, after love and peace, the final fruit of the spirit is joy. Mortification is painful, but that pain is one of the preconditions of blessedness. This fact of spiritual experience is sometimes obscured by the language in which it is described. Thus, when Christ says that the kingdom of heaven cannot be entered except by those who are as little children, we are apt to forget, so touching are the images evoked by the simple phrase, that a man cannot become childlike unless he chooses to undertake the most strenuous and searching course of self-denial. In practice the command to become as little children is identical with the command to lose one's life. As Traherne makes clear in the beautiful passage quoted in the section on God in the world, one cannot know created nature in all its essentially sacred beauty, unless one first unlearns the dirty devices of adult humanity. Seen through the dung-colored spectacles of self-interest, the universe looks singularly like a dung heap, and as, through long wearing, the spectacles have grown onto the eyeballs, the process of cleansing the doors of perception is often, at any rate in the earlier stages of the spiritual life, painfully like a surgical operation. Later on, it is true, even self-nodding may be suffused with the joy of the spirit. On this point the following passage from the 14th century scale of perfection is illuminating. Many a man hath the virtues of humility, patience and charity towards his neighbors, only in the reason and will, and hath no spiritual delight nor love in them, for oft times he feeleth grudging, heaviness and bitterness for to do them, but yet nevertheless he doth them, but tis only by stirring of reason for dread of God. This man hath these virtues in reason and will, but not the love of them in affection. But when, by the grace of Jesus and by ghostly and bodily exercise, reason is turned into light and will into love, then hath he virtues in affection, for he hath so known on the bitter bark or shell of the nut that at length he hath broken it and now feeds on the kernel, that is to say, the virtues which were first heavy for to practice are now turned into a very delight and savor. Walter Hilton As long as I am this or that, or have this or that, I am not all things and I have not all things. Become pure till you neither are nor have either this or that, then you are omnipresent and, being neither this nor that, are all things. Eckhart the point so dramatically emphasized by Eckhart in these lines is one that has often been made by the moralists and psychologists of the spiritual life. It is only when we have renounced our preoccupation with I, me, mine that we can truly possess the world in which we live. Everything is ours, provided that we regard nothing as our property. And not only is everything ours, it is also everybody else's. True love in this differs from dross and clay that to divide is not to take away. There can be no complete communism except in the goods of the spirit and, to some extent also, of the mind, and only when such goods are possessed by men and women in a state of non-attachment and self-denial. Some degree of mortification, it should be noted, 
is an indispensable prerequisite for the creation and enjoyment even of merely intellectual and aesthetic goods. Those who choose the profession of artist, philosopher, or man of science, choose, in many cases, a life of poverty and unrewarded hard work. But these are by no means the only mortifications they have to undertake. When he looks at the world, the artist must deny his ordinary human tendency to think of things in utilitarian, self-regarding terms. Similarly, the critical philosopher must mortify his common sense, while the research worker must steadfastly resist the temptations to oversimplify and think conventionally, and must make himself docile to the leadings of mysterious fact. And what is true of the creators of aesthetic and intellectual goods is also true of the enjoyers of such goods, when created. That these mortifications are by no means trifling has been shown again and again in the course of history. One thinks, for example, of the intellectually mortified Socrates and the hemlock with which his unmortified compatriots rewarded him. One thinks of the heroic efforts that had to be made by Galileo and his contemporaries to break with the Aristotelian convention of thought, and the no less heroic efforts that have to be made today by any scientist who believes that there is more in the universe than can be discovered by employing the time-hallowed recipes of Descartes. Such mortifications have their reward in a state of consciousness that corresponds, on a lower level, to spiritual beatitude. The artist, and the philosopher and the man of science are also artists, knows the bliss of aesthetic contemplation, discovery, and non-attached possession. The goods of the intellect, the emotions, and the imagination are real goods, but they are not the final good, and when we treat them as ends in themselves, we fall into idolatry. Mortification of will, desire and action is not enough, there must also be mortification in the fields of knowing, thinking, feeling and fancying. Man's intellectual faculties are by the fall in a much worse state than his animal appetites and want a much greater self-denial. And when own will, own understanding and own imagination have their natural strength indulged and gratified, and are made seemingly rich and honorable with the treasures acquired from a study of the Bell's Letra, they will just as much help poor fallen man to be like-minded with Christ as the art of cookery, well and duly studied, will help a professor of the gospel to the spirit and practice of Christian abstinence. William Law Because it was German and spelt with a K, Kultur was an object, during the First World War, of derisive contempt. All this has now been changed. In Russia, literature, art, and science have become the three persons of a new humanistic trinity. Nor is the cult of culture confined to the Soviet Union. It is practiced by a majority of intellectuals in the capitalist democracies. Clever, hard-boiled journalists, who write about everything else with the condescending cynicism of people who know all about God, man, and the universe, and have seen through the whole absurd caboodle, fairly fall over themselves when it comes to culture. With an earnestness and enthusiasm that are, in the circumstances, unutterably ludicrous, they invite us to share their positively religious emotions in the face of high art, as represented by the latest murals or civic centers, they insist that so long as Mrs. X goes on writing her inimitable novels and Mr. Y has more than Coleridge in criticism, the world, in spite of all appearances to the contrary, makes sense. The same overvaluation of culture, the same belief that art and literature are ends in themselves and can flourish in isolation from a reasonable and realistic philosophy of life have even invaded the schools and colleges. Among advanced educationists there are many people who seem to think that all will be well, so long as adolescents are permitted to express themselves, and small children are encouraged to be creative in the art class. But, alas, plasticine and self-expression will not solve the problems of education. Nor will technology and vocational guidance, nor the classics and the hundred best books. The following criticisms of education were made more than two and a half centuries ago, but they are as relevant today as they were in the 17th century. He knoweth nothing as he ought to know, who thinks he knoweth anything without seeing its place and the manner how it relateth to God, angels, and men, and to all the creatures in earth, heaven, and hell, time and eternity. Thomas Traherne Nevertheless some things were defective too, at Oxford under the Commonwealth. There was never a tutor that did professly teach felicity, though that be the mistress of all the other sciences. 
nor did any of us study these things but as aliens, which we ought to have studied as our own enjoyments. We studied to inform our knowledge, but knew not for what end we studied. And for lack of aiming at a certain end, we erred in the manner. Thomas Traherne In Traherne's vocabulary felicity means beatitude, which is identical in practice with liberation, which, in its turn, is the unitive knowledge of God in the heights within and in the fullness without as well as within. What follows is an account of the intellectual mortifications which must be practiced by those whose primary concern is with the knowledge of the Godhead in the interior heights of the soul. Happy is the man who, by continually effacing all images and through introversion and the lifting up of his mind to God, at last forgets and leaves behind all such hindrances. For by such means only, he operates inwardly, with his naked, pure, simple intellect and affections, about the most pure and simple object, God. Therefore see that thy whole exercise about God within thee may depend wholly and only on that naked intellect, affection, and will. For indeed, this exercise cannot be discharged by any bodily organ, or by the external senses, but only by that which constitutes the essence of man, understanding, and love. If, therefore, thou desirest a safe stair and short path to arrive at the end of true bliss, then, with an intent mind, earnestly desire and aspire after continual cleanness of heart and purity of mind. Add to this a constant calm and tranquility of the senses, and a recollecting of the affections of the heart, continually fixing them above. Work to simplify the heart, that being immovable and at peace from any invading vain phantasms, thou mayest always stand fast in the Lord within thee, to that degree as if thy soul had already entered the always present now of eternity, that is, the state of the Deity. To mount to God is to enter into oneself. For he who so mounts and enters and goes above and beyond himself, he truly mounts up to God. The mind must then raise itself above itself and say, He who above all I need is above all I know. And so carried into the darkness of the mind, gathering itself into that all-sufficient good, it learns to stay at home and with its whole affection it cleaves and becomes habitually fixed in the supreme good within. Thus continue, until thou becomest immutable and dost arrive at that true life which is God himself, perpetually, without any vicissitude of space or time, reposing in that inward quiet and secret mansion of the Deity. Albertus Magnus Some men love knowledge and discernment as the best and most excellent of all things. Behold, then knowledge and discernment come to be loved more than that which is discerned, for the false natural light loveth its knowledge and powers, which are itself, more than what is known. And were it possible that this false natural light should understand the simple truth, as it is in God and in truth, it still would not lose its own property, that is, it could not depart from itself and its own things. Theologia Germanica The relationship between moral action and spiritual knowledge is circular, as it were, and reciprocal. Selfless behavior makes possible an accession of knowledge, and the accession of knowledge makes possible the performance of further and more genuinely selfless actions, which in their turn enhance the agent's capacity for knowing. And so on, if all goes well and there is perfect docility and obedience, indefinitely. The process is summed up in a few lines of the Maitreya Upanishad. A man undertakes right action, which includes, of course, right recollectedness and right meditation, and this enables him to catch a glimpse of the self that underlies his separate individuality. Having seen his own self as the self, he becomes selfless, and therefore acts selflessly, and in virtue of selflessness he is to be conceived as unconditioned. This is the highest mystery, betokening emancipation, through selflessness he has no part in pleasure or pain, in other words, he enters a state of non-attachment or holy indifference, but achieves absoluteness, or as Albertus Magnus phrases it, becomes immutable and arrives at that true life which is God himself. When mortification is perfect, its most characteristic fruit is simplicity. A simple heart will love all that is most precious on earth, husband or wife, parent or child, brother or friend, without marring its singleness, external things will have no attraction save inasmuch as they lead souls to him. All exaggeration or unreality, affectation and falsehood must pass away from such a one, as the dews dry up before the sunshine. The single motive is to please God, 
and hence arises total indifference as to what others say and think, so that words and actions are perfectly simple and natural, as in his sight only. Such Christian simplicity is the very perfection of interior life, God, his will and pleasure, its sole object. And grew. And here is a more extended account of the matter by one of the greatest masters of psychological analysis. In the world, when people call anyone simple, they generally mean a foolish, ignorant, credulous person. But real simplicity, so far from being foolish, is almost sublime. All good men like and admire it, are conscious of sinning against it, observe it in others and know what it involves, and yet they could not precisely define it. I should say that simplicity is an uprightness of soul which prevents self-consciousness. It is not the same as sincerity, which is a much humbler virtue. Many people are sincere who are not simple. They say nothing but what they believe to be true, and do not aim at appearing anything but what they are. But they are forever thinking about themselves, weighing their every word and thought, and dwelling upon themselves in apprehension of having done too much or too little. These people are sincere but they are not simple. They are not at their ease with others, nor others with them. There is nothing easy, frank, unrestrained, or natural about them. One feels that one would like less admirable people better, who were not so stiff. To be absorbed in the world around and never turn a thought within, as is the blind condition of some who are carried away by what is pleasant and tangible, is one extreme as opposed to simplicity. And to be self-absorbed in all matters, whether it be duty to God or man, is the other extreme, which makes a person wise in his own conceit, reserved, self-conscious, uneasy at the least thing which disturbs his inward self-complacency. Such false wisdom, in spite of its solemnity, is hardly less vain and foolish than the folly of those who plunge headlong into worldly pleasures. The one is intoxicated by his outward surroundings, the other by what he believes himself to be doing inwardly, but both are in a state of intoxication, and the last is a worse state than the first, because it seems to be wise, though it is not really, and so people do not try to be cured. Real simplicity lies in a just milieu equally free from thoughtlessness and affectation, in which the soul is not overwhelmed by externals, so as to be unable to reflect, nor yet given up to the endless refinements, which self-consciousness induces. That soul which looks where it is going without losing time arguing over every step, or looking back perpetually, possesses true simplicity. Such simplicity is indeed a great treasure. How shall we attain to it? I would give all I possess for it, it is the costly pearl of holy scripture. The first step, then, is for the soul to put away outward things and look within so as to know its own real interest, so far all is right and natural, thus much is only a wise self-love, which seeks to avoid the intoxication of the world. In the next step the soul must add the contemplation of God, whom it fears, to that of self. This is a faint approach to the real wisdom, but the soul is still greatly self-absorbed, it is not satisfied with fearing God, it wants to be certain that it does fear him and fears lest it fear him not, going round in a perpetual circle of self-consciousness. All this restless dwelling on self is very far from the peace and freedom of real love, but that is yet in the distance the soul must needs go through a season of trial, and were it suddenly plunged into a state of rest, it would not know how to use it. The third step is that, ceasing from a restless self-contemplation, the soul begins to dwell upon God instead, and by degrees forgets itself in him. It becomes full of him and ceases to feed upon self. Such a soul is not blinded to its own faults or indifferent to its own errors, it is more conscious of them than ever, an increased light shows them. In plainer form, but this self-knowledge comes from God, and therefore it is not restless or uneasy. Fenelon. How admirably acute and subtle this is! One of the most extraordinary, because most gratuitous, pieces of 20th century vanity is the assumption that nobody knew anything about psychology before the days of Freud. But the real truth is that most modern psychologists understand human beings less well than did the ablest of their predecessors. Fenelon and La Rochefoucauld knew all about the surface rationalization of deep, discreditable motives in the subconscious, and were fully aware that sexuality and the will to power were, 
all too often, the effective forces at work under the polite mask of the persona. Machiavelli had drawn Pareto's distinction between residues and derivations, between the real, self-interested motives for political action and the fancy theories, principles and ideals in terms of which such action is explained and justified to the credulous public. Like Buddha's and St. Augustine's, Pascal's view of human virtue and rationality could not have been more realistically low. But all these men, even La Rochefoucauld, even Machiavelli, were aware of certain facts which 20th century psychologists have chosen to ignore, the fact that human nature is tripartite, consisting of a spirit as well as of a mind and body, the fact that we live on the borderline between two worlds, the temporal and the eternal, the physical vital human and the divine, the fact that, though nothing in himself, man is a nothing surrounded by God, indigent of God, capable of God and filled with God, if he so desires. The Christian simplicity, of which Gru and Fenelon write, is the same thing as the virtue so much admired by Lao Tzu and his successors. According to these Chinese sages, personal sins and social maladjustments are all due to the fact that men have separated themselves from their divine source and live according to their own will and notions, not according to Tao, which is the great way, the logos, the nature of things, as it manifests itself on every plane from the physical, up through the animal and the mental, to the spiritual. Enlightenment comes when we give up self-will and make ourselves docile to the workings of Tao in the world around us and in our own bodies, minds, and spirits. Sometimes the Taoist philosophers write as though they believed in Rousseau's noble savage. And, being Chinese and therefore much more concerned with the concrete and the practical than with the merely speculative, they are fond of prescribing methods by which rulers may reduce the complexity of civilization and so preserve their subjects from the corrupting influences of man-made and therefore Tao eclipsing conventions of thought, feeling, and action. But the rulers who are to perform this task for the masses must themselves be sages, and to become a sage, one must get rid of all the rigidities of unregenerate adulthood and become again as a little child. For only that which is soft and docile is truly alive, that which conquers and outlives everything is that which adapts itself to everything, that which always seeks the lowest place, not the hard rock, but the water that wears away the everlasting hills. The simplicity and spontaneity of the perfect sage are the fruits of mortification, mortification of the will end, by recollectedness and meditation, of the mind. Only the most highly disciplined artist can recapture, on a higher level, the spontaneity of the child with its first paint box. Nothing is more difficult than to be simple. May I ask, said Yen Hui, in what consists the fasting of the heart? Cultivate unity, replied Confucius. You do your hearing, not with your ears, but with your mind, not with your mind, but with your very soul. But let the hearing stop with the ears. Let the working of the mind stop with itself. Then the soul will be a negative existence, passively responsive to externals. In such a negative existence, only Tao can abide. And that negative state is the fasting of the heart. Then, said Yen Hui, the reason I could not get the use of this method is my own individuality. If I could get the use of it, my individuality would have gone. Is this what you mean by the negative state? Exactly so, replied the master. Let me tell you. If you can enter the domain of this prince, a bad ruler whom Yen Hui was ambitious to reform, without offending his amour propre, cheerful if he hears you, passive if he does not, without science, without drugs, simply living there in a state of complete indifference, you will be near success. Look at that window. Through it an empty room becomes bright with scenery, but the landscape stops outside. In this sense you may use your ears and eyes to communicate within, but shut out all wisdom, in the sense of conventional, copy-book maxims, from your mind. This is the method for regenerating all creation. Chuang Tzu Mortification may be regarded, in this context, as the process of study, by which we learn at last to have unstudied reactions to events, reactions in harmony with Tao, suchness, the will of God. Those who have made themselves docile to the divine nature of things, those who respond to circumstances, not with craving and aversion, but with the love that permits them to do spontaneously what they like, 
Those who can truthfully say, Not I, but God in me. Such men and women are compared by the exponents of the perennial philosophy to children, to fools and simpletons, even sometimes, as in the following passage, to drunkards. A drunken man who falls out of a cart, though he may suffer, does not die. His bones are the same as other people's, but he meets his accident in a different way. His spirit is in a condition of security. He is not conscious of riding in the cart, neither is he conscious of falling out of it. Ideas of life, death, fear, and the like cannot penetrate his breast, and so he does not suffer from contact with objective existence. If such security is to be got from wine, how much more is it to be got from God? Chuang Tzu It is by long obedience and hard work that the artist comes to unforced spontaneity and consummate mastery. Knowing that he can never create anything on his own account, out of the top layers, so to speak, of his personal consciousness, he submits obediently to the workings of inspiration, and knowing that the medium in which he works has its own self-nature, which must not be ignored or violently overridden, he makes himself its patient servant and, in this way, achieves perfect freedom of expression. But life is also an art, and the man who would become a consummate artist in living must follow, on all the levels of his being, the same procedure as that by which the painter or the sculptor or any other craftsman comes to his own more limited perfection. Prince Huey's cook was cutting up a bullock. Every blow of his knife, every heave of his shoulders, every tread of his foot, every WHSHH of rent flesh, every CHHK of the chopper, was in perfect harmony, rhythmical like the dance of the mulberry grove, simultaneous like the chords of the Ching Shao. Well done, cried the prince. Yours is skill indeed. Sire, replied the cook, I have always devoted myself to. Tao. It is better than skill. When I first began to cut up bullocks, I saw before me simply whole bullocks. After three years practice I saw no more whole animals. And now I work with my mind and not with my eye. When my senses bid me stop, but my mind urges me on, I fall back upon eternal principles. I follow such openings or cavities as there may be, according to the natural constitution of the animal. I do not attempt to cut through joints, still less through large bones. A good cook changes his chopper once a year, because he cuts. An ordinary cook, once a month, because he hacks. But I have had this chopper 19 years, and though I have cut up many thousands of bullocks, its edge is as if fresh from the whetstone. For at the joints there are always interstices, and the edge of a chopper being without thickness, it remains only to insert that which is without thickness into such an interstice. By these means the interstice will be enlarged, and the blade will find plenty of room. It is thus that I have kept my chopper for 19 years, as though fresh from the whetstone. Nevertheless, when I come upon a hard part, where the blade meets with a difficulty, I am all caution. I fix my eyes on it. I stay my hand, and gently apply the blade, until with a wah the part yields like earth crumbling to the ground. Then I withdraw the blade and stand up and look around, and at last I wipe my chopper and put it carefully away. Bravo, cried the prince. From the words of this cook I have learned how to take care of my life. Chuang Tzu In the first seven branches of his eightfold path the Buddha describes the conditions that must be fulfilled by anyone who desires to come to that right contemplation which is the eighth and final branch. The fulfillment of these conditions entails the undertaking of a course of the most searching and comprehensive mortification, mortification of intellect and will, craving and emotion, thought, speech, action and, finally, means of livelihood. Certain professions are more or less completely incompatible with the achievement of man's final end, and there are certain ways of making a living which do so much physical and, above all, so much moral, intellectual and spiritual harm that, even if they could be practiced in a non-attached spirit, which is generally impossible, they would still have to be eschewed by anyone dedicated to the task of liberating, not only himself, but others. The exponents of the perennial philosophy are not content to avoid and forbid the practice of criminal professions, such as brothel keeping, forgery, racketeering and the like, they also avoid themselves, 
and warn others against, a number of ways of livelihood commonly regarded as legitimate. Thus, in many Buddhist societies, the manufacture of arms, the concoction of intoxicating liquors and the wholesale purveying of butcher's meat were not, as in contemporary Christendom, rewarded by wealth, peerages and political influence, they were deplored as businesses which, it was thought, made it particularly difficult for their practitioners and for other members of the communities in which they were practiced to achieve enlightenment and liberation. Similarly, in medieval Europe, Christians were forbidden to make a living by the taking of interest on money or by cornering the market. As Tony and others have shown, it was only after the Reformation that coupon clipping, usury and gambling in stocks and commodities became respectable and received ecclesiastical approval. For the Quakers, soldiering was and is a form of wrong livelihood, war being, in their eyes, anti-Christian, not so much because it causes suffering as because it propagates hatred puts a premium on fraud and cruelty, infects whole societies with anger, fear, pride and uncharitableness. Such passions eclipse the inner light, and therefore the wars by which they are aroused and intensified, must be regarded, whatever their immediate political outcome, as crusades to make the world safe for spiritual darkness. It has been found, as a matter of experience, that it is dangerous to lay down detailed and inflexible rules for right livelihood, dangerous, because most people see no reason for being righteous overmuch and consequently respond to the imposition of too rigid a code by hypocrisy or open rebellion. In the Christian tradition, for example, a distinction is made between the precepts, which are binding on all and sundry, and the counsels of perfection, binding only upon those who feel drawn towards a total renunciation of the world. The precepts include the ordinary moral code and the commandment to love God with all one's heart, strength, and mind, and one's neighbor as oneself. Some of those who make a serious effort to obey this last and greatest commandment find that they cannot do so wholeheartedly, unless they follow the counsels and sever all connections with the world. Nevertheless it is possible for men and women to achieve that perfection, which is deliverance into the unitive knowledge of God without abandoning the married state and without selling all they have and giving the price to the poor. Effective poverty, possessing no money, is by no means always effective poverty, being indifferent to money. One man may be poor, but desperately concerned with what money can buy, full of cravings, envy, and bitter self-pity. Another may have money, but no attachment to money or the things, powers, and privileges that money can buy. Evangelical poverty is a combination of effective with effective poverty, but a genuine poverty of spirit is possible even in those who are not effectively poor. It will be seen, then, that the problems of right livelihood, in so far as they lie outside the jurisdiction of the common moral code, are strictly personal. The way in which any individual problem presents itself and the nature of the appropriate solution depend upon the degree of knowledge, moral sensibility and spiritual insight achieved by the individual concerned. For this reason no universally applicable rules can be formulated except in the most general terms. Here are my three treasures, says Lao Tzu. Guard and keep them. The first is pity, the second frugality, the third refusal to be foremost of all things under heaven. And when Jesus is asked by a stranger to settle a dispute between himself and his brother over an inheritance, he refuses, since he does not know the circumstances, to be a judge in the case and merely utters a general warning against covetousness. G.A. San instructed his adherents one day, those who speak against killing, and who desire to spare the lives of all conscious beings are right. It is good to protect even animals and insects. But what about those persons who kill time? What about those who destroy wealth, and those who murder the economy of their society? We should not overlook them. Again, what of the one who preaches without enlightenment? He is killing Buddhism. From 101 Zen Stories Once the noble Ibrahim, as he sat on his throne, heard a clamor and noise of cries on the roof, also heavy footsteps on the roof of his palace. He said to himself, Whose heavy feet are these? He shouted from the window, Who goes there? The guards, filled with confusion, bowed their heads, saying, It is we, going the rounds in search. He said, What seek yet? They said, 
our camels. He said, whoever searched for camels on a housetop. They said, we follow thy example. Who seekest union with God, while sitting on a throne? Jalaluddin Rumi. Of all social, moral, and spiritual problems that of power is the most chronically urgent and the most difficult of solution. Craving for power is not a vice of the body, consequently knows none of the limitations imposed by a tired or satiated physiology upon gluttony, intemperance, and L.U. Saint growing with every successive satisfaction, the appetite for power can manifest itself indefinitely, without interruption by bodily fatigue or sickness. Moreover, the nature of society is such that the higher a man climbs in the political, economic, or religious hierarchy, the greater are his opportunities and resources for exercising power. But climbing the hierarchical ladder is ordinarily a slow process, and the ambitious rarely reach the top till they are well advanced in life. The older he grows, the more chances does the power lover have for indulging his besetting sin, the more continuously is he subjected to temptations and the more glamorous do those temptations become. In this respect his situation is profoundly different from that of the debauchee. The latter may never voluntarily leave his vices, but at least, as he advances in years, he finds his vices leaving him, the former neither leaves his vices nor is left by them. Instead of bringing to the power lover a merciful respite from his addictions, old age is apt to intensify them by making it easier for him to satisfy his cravings on a larger scale and in a more spectacular way. That is why, in Acton's words, all great men are bad. Can we therefore be surprised if political action, undertaken, in all too many cases, not for the public good, but solely or at least primarily to gratify the power lusts of bad men, should prove so often either self-stultifying or downright disastrous? L.A. Ta Samoy, says the tyrant, and this is true, of course, not only of the autocrat at the apex of the pyramid, but of all the members of the ruling minority through whom he governs and who are, in fact, the real rulers of the nation. Moreover, so long as the policy which gratifies the power lusts of the ruling class is successful, and so long as the price of success is not too high, even the masses of the ruled will feel that the state is themselves a vast and splendid projection of the individual's intrinsically insignificant ego. The little man can satisfy his lust for power vicariously through the activities of the imperialistic state, just as the big man does, the difference between them is one of degree, not of kind. No infallible method for controlling the political manifestations of the lust for power has ever been devised. Since power is of its very essence indefinitely expansive, it cannot be checked except by colliding with another power. Hence, any society that values liberty, in the sense of government by law rather than by class interest or personal decree, must see to it that the power of its rulers is divided. National unity means national servitude to a single man and his supporting oligarchy. Organized and balanced disunity is the necessary condition of liberty. His Majesty's loyal opposition is the loyalist because the most genuinely useful section of any liberty-loving community. Furthermore, since the appetite for power is purely mental and therefore insatiable and impervious to disease or old age, no community that values liberty can afford to give its rulers long tenures of office. The Carthusian order, which was never reformed because never deformed, owed its long immunity from corruption to the fact that its abbots were elected for periods of only a single year. In ancient Rome the amount of liberty under law was an inverse ratio to the length of the magistrate's terms of office. These rules for controlling the lust for power are very easy to formulate, but very difficult, as history shows, to enforce in practice. They are particularly difficult to enforce at a period like the present, when time-hallowed political machinery is being rendered obsolete by rapid technological change and when the salutary principle of organized and balanced disunity requires to be embodied in new and more appropriate institutions. Acton, the learned Catholic historian, was of opinion that all great men are bad, Rumi, the Persian poet and mystic, thought that to seek for union with God while occupying a throne was an undertaking hardly less senseless than looking for camels among the chimney pots. A slightly more optimistic note is sounded by St. François de Sales, whose views on the matter were recorded by his Boswellizing disciple, the young Bishop of Belly. Monday Pair, 
I said one day, how is it possible for those who are themselves high in office to practice the virtue of obedience? Francois de Sales replied, they have greater and more excellent ways of doing so than their inferiors. As I did not understand this reply, he went on to say, those who are bound by obedience are usually subject to one superior only. But those who are themselves superiors have a wider field for obedience, even while they command, for if they bear in mind that it is God who has placed them over other men, and gives them the rule they have, they will exercise it out of obedience to God, and thus, even while commanding, they will obey. Moreover there is no position so high but that it is subject to a spiritual superior in what concerns the conscience and the soul. But there is a yet higher point of obedience to which all superiors may aspire, even that to which St. Paul alludes, when he says, Though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all. It is by such universal obedience to everyone that we become all things to all men, and serving everyone for our Lord's sake, we esteem all to be our superiors. In accordance with this rule, I have often observed how Francois de Sales treated everyone, even the most insignificant persons who approached him, as though he were the inferior, never repulsing anyone, never refusing to enter into conversation, to speak or to listen, never betraying the slightest sign of weariness, impatience and annoyance, however importunate or ill-timed the interruption. To those who asked him why he thus wasted his time his constant reply was, it is God's will, it is what he requires of me, what more need I ask? While I am doing this, I am not required to do anything else. God's holy will is the center from which all we do must radiate, all else is mere weariness and excitement. Jean-Pierre Camus We see, then, that a great man can be good, good enough even to aspire to unitive knowledge of the divine ground, provided that, while exercising power, he fulfills two conditions. First, he must deny himself all the personal advantages of power and must practice the patience and recollectedness without which there cannot be love either of man or God. And, second, he must realize that the accident of possessing temporal power does not give him spiritual authority, which belongs only to those seers, living or dead, who have achieved a direct insight into the nature of things. A society, in which the boss is mad enough to believe himself a prophet, is a society doomed to destruction. A viable society is one in which those who have qualified themselves to see indicate the goals to be aimed at, while those whose business it is to rule respect the authority and listen to the advice of the seers. In theory, at least, all this was well understood in India and, until the Reformation, in Europe, where no position was so high but that it was subject to a spiritual superior in what concerned the conscience and the soul. Unfortunately the churches tried to make the best of both worlds, to combine spiritual authority with temporal power, wielded either directly or at one remove, from behind the throne. But spiritual authority can be exercised only by those who are perfectly disinterested and whose motives are therefore above suspicion. An ecclesiastical organization may call itself the mystical body of Christ, but if its prelates are slaveholders and the rulers of states, as they were in the past, or if the corporation is a large-scale capitalist, as is the case today, no titles, however honorific, can conceal the fact that, when it passes judgment, it does so as an interested party with some political or economic acts to grind. True, in matters which do not directly concern the temporal powers of the corporation, individual churchmen can be, and have actually proved themselves, perfectly disinterested, consequently can possess, and have possessed, genuine spiritual authority. St. Philip Neri's is a case in point. Possessing absolutely no temporal power, he yet exercised a prodigious influence over 16th century Europe. But for that influence, it may be doubted whether the efforts of the Council of Trent to reform the Roman Church from within would have met with much success. In actual practice how many great men have ever fulfilled, or are ever likely to fulfill, the conditions which alone render power innocuous to the ruler as well as to the ruled? Obviously, very few. Except by saints, the problem of power is finally insoluble. But since genuine self-government is possible only in very small groups, societies on a national or supranational scale will always be ruled by oligarchical minorities, 
whose members come to power because they have a lust for power. This means that the problem of power will always arise and, since it cannot be solved except by people like Francois de Sales, will always make trouble. And this, in its turn, means that we cannot expect the large-scale societies of the future to be much better than were the societies of the past during the brief periods when they were at their be-saint. Chapter 7 Truth Why dost thou prate of God? Whatever thou sayest of him is untrue. Eckhart In religious literature the word truth is used indiscriminately in at least three distinct and very different senses. Thus, it is sometimes treated as a synonym for fact, as when it is affirmed that God is truth, meaning that he is the primordial reality. But this is clearly not the meaning of the word in such a phrase as worshipping God in spirit and in truth. Here, it is obvious, truth signifies direct apprehension of spiritual fact, as opposed to second-hand knowledge about reality, formulated in sentences and accepted on authority or because an argument from previously granted postulates was logically convincing. And finally there is the more ordinary meaning of the word, as in such a sentence as, this statement is the truth, where we mean to assert that the verbal symbols of which the statement is composed correspond to the facts to which it refers. When Eckhart writes that whatever thou sayest of God is untrue, he is not affirming that all theological statements are false. Insofar as there can be any correspondence between human symbols and divine fact, some theological statements are as true as it is possible for us to make them. Himself a theologian, Eckhart would certainly have admitted this. But besides being a theologian, Eckhart was a mystic. And being a mystic, he understood very vividly what the modern semanticist is so busily, and, also, so unsuccessfully, trying to drum into contemporary minds, namely, that words are not the same as things and that a knowledge of words about facts is in no sense equivalent to a direct and immediate apprehension of the facts themselves. What Eckhart actually asserts is this, whatever one may say about God can never in any circumstances be the truth in the first two meanings of that much abused and ambiguous word. By implication St. Thomas Aquinas was saying exactly the same thing when, after his experience of infused contemplation, he refused to go on with his theological work declaring that everything he had written up to that time was as mere straw compared with the immediate knowledge, which had been vouchsafed to him. Two hundred years earlier, in Baghdad, the great Mohammedan theologian, Al-Ghazali, had similarly turned from the consideration of truths about God to the contemplation and direct apprehension of truth the fact, from the purely intellectual discipline of the philosophers to the moral and spiritual discipline of the Sufis. The moral of all this is obvious. Whenever we hear or read about truth, we should always pause long enough to ask ourselves in which of the three senses listed above the word is, at the moment, being used. By taking this simple precaution, and to take it as a genuinely virtuous act of intellectual honesty, we shall save ourselves a great deal of disturbing and quite unnecessary mental confusion. Wishing to entice the blind, the Buddha playfully let words escape from his golden mouth. Heaven and earth are filled ever since, with entangling briars. There is nothing true anywhere, the true is nowhere to be found. If you say you see the true, this seeing is not the true one. When the true is left to itself, there is nothing false in it, for it is mind itself. When mind in itself is not liberated from the false, Dio Kokushi, there is nothing true, nowhere is the true to be found. Huaneng. The truth indeed has never been preached by the Buddha, seeing that one has to realize it within oneself. Sutralamkara. The further one travels, the less one knows. Lao Tzu. Listen to this, shouted monkey. After all the trouble we had getting here from China, and after you specially ordered that we were to be given the scriptures, Ananda and Kajyapa made a fraudulent delivery of goods. They gave us blank copies to take away. I ask you, what is the good of that to us? You needn't shout, said the Buddha smiling. As a matter of fact, it is such blank scrolls as these that are the true scriptures. But I quite see that the people of China are too foolish and ignorant to believe this, so there is nothing for it but to give them copies with some writing on. Wu Chengen. 
The philosophers indeed are clever enough, but wanting in wisdom. As to the others, they are either ignorant or pure real. They take an empty fist as containing something real and the pointing finger as the object pointed at it. Because the finger is adhered to as though it were the moon, all their efforts are low saint. Yoka Daishi. What is known as the teaching of the Buddha is not the teaching of the Buddha. What is the ultimate teaching of Buddhism? You won't understand it until you have it. Diamond Sutra. Shi Tou. The subject matter of the perennial philosophy is the nature of eternal, spiritual reality, but the language in which it must be formulated was developed for the purpose of dealing with phenomena in time. That is why, in all these formulations, we find an element of paradox. The nature of truth the fact cannot be described by means of verbal symbols that do not adequately correspond to it. At best it can be hinted at in terms of non sequiturs and contradictions. To these unavoidable paradoxes some spiritual writers have chosen to add deliberate and calculated enormities of language, hard sayings, exaggerations, ironic or humorous extravagances, designed to startle and shock the reader out of that self-satisfied complacency which is the original sin of the intellect. Of this second kind of paradox the masters of Taoism and Zen Buddhism were particularly fond. The latter, indeed, made use of paralogisms and even of nonsense as a device for taking the kingdom of heaven by violence. Aspirants to the life of perfection were encouraged to practice discursive meditation on some completely non-logical formula. The result was a kind of reductio ad absurdum of the whole self-centered and world-centered discursive process, a sudden breaking through from reason, in the language of scholastic philosophy, to intuitive intellect capable of a genuine insight into the divine ground of all being. This method strikes us as odd and eccentric, but the fact remains that it worked to the extent of producing in many persons the final metanoia, or transformation of consciousness and character. Zen's use of almost comic extravagance to emphasize the philosophic truths it regarded as most important is well illustrated in the first of the extracts cited above. We are not intended seriously to imagine that an avatar preaches in order to play a practical joke on the human race. But meanwhile what the author has succeeded in doing is to startle us out of our habitual complacency about the homemade verbal universe in which we normally do most of our living. Words are not facts, and still less are they the primordial fact. If we take them too seriously, we shall lose our way in a forest of entangling briars. But if, on the contrary, we don't take them seriously enough, we shall remain unaware that there is a way to lose or a goal to be reached. If the enlightened did not preach, there would be no deliverance for anyone. But because human minds and human languages are what they are, this necessary and indispensable preaching is beset with dangers. The history of all the religions is similar in one important respect, some of their adherents are enlightened and delivered because they have chosen to react appropriately to the words which the founders have let fall, others achieve a partial salvation by reacting with partial appropriateness, yet others harm themselves and their fellows by reacting with a total inappropriateness, either ignoring the words altogether or, more often, taking them too seriously and treating them as though they were identical with the fact to which they refer. That words are at once indispensable and, in many cases, fatal has been recognized by all the exponents of the perennial philosophy. Thus, Jesus spoke of himself as bringing into the world something even worse than briars, a sword. Saint Paul distinguished between the letter that kills and the spirit that gives life. And throughout the centuries that followed, the masters of Christian spirituality have found it necessary to harp again and again upon a theme which has never been outdated because homo loquax, the talking animal, is still as naively delighted by his chief accomplishment, still as helplessly the victim of his own words, as he was when the Tower of Babel was being built. Recent years have seen the publication of numerous works on semantics and of an ocean of nationalistic, racialistic and militaristic propaganda. Never have so many capable writers warned mankind against the dangers of wrong speech, and never have words been used more recklessly by politicians or taken more seriously by the public. The fact is surely proof enough that, under changing forms, the old problems remain what they always were, urgent, unsolved and, to all appearances, insoluble. 
All that the imagination can imagine and the reason conceive and understand in this life is not, and cannot be, a proximate means of union with God. Saint John of the Cross Chichun and barren speculations may unfold the placators of truth's garment, but they cannot discover her lovely face. John Smith, the Platoni Saint In all faces is shown the face of faces, veiled and in a riddle. Howbeit, unveiled it is not seen, until, above all faces, a man enter into a certain secret and mystic silence, where there is no knowing or concept of a face. This mist, cloud, darkness, or ignorance, into which he that seeks thy face and breath, when he goeth beyond all knowledge or concept, is the state below which thy face cannot be found, except veiled, but that very darkness revealeth thy face to be there beyond all veils. Hence I observe, how needful it is for me to enter into the darkness and to admit the coincidence of opposites, beyond all the grasp of reason, and there to seek the truth, where impossibility meets us. Nicholas of C.U.S.A. As the Godhead is nameless, and all naming is alien to him, so also the soul is nameless, for it is here the same as God. Eckhart. God being, as he is, inaccessible, do not rest in the consideration of objects perceptible to the senses and comprehended by the understanding. This is to be content with what is less than God, so doing, you will destroy the energy of the soul, which is necessary for walking with him. Saint John of the Cross To find or know God in reality by any outward proofs, or by anything but by God himself made manifest and self-evident in you, will never be your case either here or hereafter. For neither God, nor heaven, nor hell, nor the devil, nor the flesh, can be any otherwise knowable in you or by you but by their own existence and manifestation in you. And all pretended knowledge of any of these things, beyond and without this self-evident sensibility of their birth within you, is only such knowledge of them as the blind man hath of the light that hath never entered into him. William Law What follows is a summary by an eminent scholar of the Indian doctrines concerning Jnana, the liberating knowledge of Brahman or the divine ground. Jnana is eternal, is general, is necessary, and is not a personal knowledge of this man or that man. It is there, as knowledge in the Atman itself, and lies there hidden under all avidya, ignorance, irremovable, though it may be obscured, unprovable, because self-evident, needing no proof, because itself giving to all proof the ground of possibility. These sentences come near to Eckhart's knowledge and to the teaching of Augustine on the eternal truth in the soul which, itself immediately certain, is the ground of all certainty and is a possession, not of AORB, but of the soul. Rudolf Otto The science of aesthetics is not the same as, nor even approximate means to, the practice and appreciation of the arts. How can one learn to have an eye for pictures, or to become a good painter? Certainly not by reading Benedetto Croce. One learns to paint by painting, and one learns to appreciate pictures by going to picture galleries and looking at them. But this is not to say that Croce and his fellows have wasted their time. We should be grateful to them for their labors in building up a system of thought, by means of which the immediately apprehended significance and value of art can be assessed in the light of general knowledge, related to other facts of experience and, in this way and to this extent, explained. What is true of aesthetics is also true of theology. Theological speculation is valuable insofar as it enables those who have had immediate experience of various aspects of God to form intelligible ideas about the nature of the divine ground, and of their own experience of the ground in relation to other experiences. And when a coherent system of theology has been worked out, it is useful insofar as it convinces those who study it that there is nothing inherently self-contradictory about the postulate of the divine ground and that, for those who are ready to fulfill certain conditions, the postulate may become a realized fact. In no circumstances, however, can the study of theology or the mind's assent to theological propositions take the place of what law calls the birth of God within. For theory is not practice, and words are not the things for which they stand. Theology as we know it has been formed by the great mystics, especially St. Augustine and St. Thomas. Plenty of other great theologians, especially St. Gregory and St. Bernard, even down to Suarez, 
would not have had such insight without mystic super knowledge. Abbot John Chapman Against this we must set Dr. Tennant's view, namely, that religious experience is something real and unique, but does not add anything to the experiencer's knowledge of ultimate reality and must always be interpreted in terms of an idea of God derived from other sources. A study of the facts would suggest that both these opinions are to some degree correct. The facts of mystical insight, together with the facts of what is taken to be historic revelation, are rationalized in terms of general knowledge and become the basis of a theology. And, reciprocally, an existing theology in terms of general knowledge exercises a profound influence upon those who have undertaken the spiritual life, causing them, if it is low, to be content with a low form of experience, if it is high, to reject as inadequate the experience of any form of reality having characteristics incompatible with those of the God described in the books. Thus mystics make theology, and theology makes mystics. A person who gives assent to untrue dogma, or who pays all his attention and allegiance to one true dogma in a comprehensive system, while neglecting the others, as many Christians concentrate exclusively on the humanity of the second person of the Trinity and ignore the Father and the Holy Ghost, runs the risk of limiting in advance his direct apprehension of reality. In religion as in natural science, experience is determined only by experience. It is fatal to prejudge it, to compel it to fit the mold imposed by a theory which either does not correspond to the facts at all, or corresponds to only some of the facts. Do not strive to seek after the true, writes a Zen master, only cease to cherish opinions. There is only one way to cure the results of belief in a false or incomplete theology and it is the same as the only known way of passing from belief in even the truest theology to knowledge or primordial fact, selflessness, docility, openness to the datum of eternity. Opinions are things which we make and can therefore understand, formulate, and argue about. But to rest in the consideration of objects perceptible to the sense or comprehended by the understanding is to be content, in the words of St. John of the Cross, with what is less than God. Unitive knowledge of God is possible only to those who have ceased to cherish opinions, even opinions that are as true as it is possible for verbalized abstractions to be. Up then, noble soul! Put on thy jumping shoes which are intellect and love, and overleap the worship of thy mental powers, overleap thine understanding and spring into the heart of God, into his hiddenness where thou art hidden from all creatures. Eckhart. With the lamp of word and discrimination one must go beyond word and discrimination and enter upon the path of realization. Langkavadara Sutra. The word intellect is used by Eckhart in the scholastic sense of immediate intuition. Intellect and reason, says Aquinas, are not two powers, but distinct as the perfect from the imperfect. The intellect means, an intimate penetration of truth, the reason, inquiry, and discourse. It is by following, and then abandoning, the rational and emotional path of word and discrimination that one is enabled to enter upon the intellectual or intuitive path of realization. And yet, in spite of the warnings pronounced by those who, through selflessness, have passed from letter to spirit and from theory to immediate knowledge, the organized Christian churches have persisted in the fatal habit of mistaking means for ends. The verbal statements of theology's more or less adequate rationalizations of experience have been taken too seriously and treated with the reverence that is due only to the fact they are intended to describe. It has been fancied that souls are saved if assent is given to what is locally regarded as the correct formula, lost if it is withheld. The two words, filioque, may not have been the sole cause of the schism between the Eastern and Western churches, but they were unquestionably the pretext and casus belli. The overvaluation of words and formulae may be regarded as a special case of that overvaluation of the things of time, which is so fatally characteristic of historic Christianity. To know truth as fact and to know it unitively, in spirit and in truth as immediate apprehension, this is deliverance, in this standeth our eternal life. To be familiar with the verbalized truths, which symbolically correspond to truth as fact in so far as it can be known in, or inferred from, truth as immediate apprehension, or truth as historic revelation, this is not salvation, but merely the study of a special branch of philosophy.
Even the most ordinary experience of a thing or event in time can never be fully or adequately described in words. The experience of seeing the sky or having neuralgia is incommunicable, the best we can do is to say blue or pain, in the hope that those who hear us may have had experiences similar to our own and so be able to supply their own version of the meaning. God, however, is not a thing or event in time, and the time-bound words which cannot do justice even to temporal matters are even more inadequate to the intrinsic nature and our own unitive experience of that which belongs to an incommensurably different order. To suppose that people can be saved by studying and giving assent to formulae is like supposing that one can get to Timbuktu by poring over a map of Africa. Maps are symbols, and even the best of them are inaccurate and imperfect symbols. But to anyone who really wants to reach a given destination, a map is indispensably useful as indicating the direction in which the traveler should set out and the roads which he must take. In later Buddhist philosophy words are regarded as one of the prime determining factors in the creative evolution of human beings. In this philosophy five categories of being are recognized, name, appearance, discrimination, right knowledge, suchness. The first three are related for evil, the last two for good. Appearances are discriminated by the sense organs, then reified by naming so that words are taken for things and symbols are used as the measure of reality. According to this view, language is a main source of the sense of separateness and the blasphemous idea of individual self-sufficiency, with their inevitable corollaries of greed, envy, lust for power, anger, and cruelty. And from these evil passions there springs the necessity of an indefinitely protracted and repeated separate existence under the same, self-perpetuated conditions of craving and infatuation. The only escape is through a creative act of the will, assisted by Buddha grace, leading through selflessness to right knowledge, which consists, among other things, in a proper appraisal of names, appearances, and discrimination. In and through right knowledge, one emerges from the infatuating delusion of I, me, mine, and, resisting the temptation to deny the world in a state of premature and one-sided ecstasy, or to affirm it by living like the average sensual man, one comes at last to the transfiguring awareness that samsara and nirvana are one, to the unitive apprehension of pure suchness, the ultimate ground, which can only be indicated, never adequately described in verbal symbols. In connection with the Mahayanist view that words play an important and even creative part in the evolution of unregenerate human nature, we may mention Hume's arguments against the reality of causation. These arguments start from the postulate that all events are loose and separate from one another and proceed with faultless logic to a conclusion that makes complete nonsense of all organized thought or purpose of action. The fallacy, as Professor Stout has pointed out, lies in the preliminary postulate. And when we ask ourselves what it was that induced Hume to make this odd and quite unrealistic assumption that events are loose and separate, we see that his only reason for flying in the face of immediate experience was the fact that things and happenings are symbolically represented in our thought by nouns, verbs, and adjectives, and that these words are, in effect, loose and separate from one another in a way which the events and things they stand for quite obviously are not. Taking words as the measure of things, instead of using things as the measure of words, Hume imposed the discrete end, so to say, quantiest pattern of language upon the continuum of actual experience, with the impossibly paradoxical results with which we are all familiar. Most human beings are not philosophers and care not at all for consistency in thought or action. Thus, in some circumstances they take it for granted that events are not loose and separate, but co exist or follow one another within the organized and organizing field of a cosmic whole. But on other occasions, where the opposite view is more nearly in accord with their passions or interests, they adopt, all unconsciously, the Humean position and treat events as though they were as independent of one another and the rest of the world as the words by which they are symbolized. This is generally true of all occurrences involving I, me, mine. Reifying the loose and separate names, we regard the things as also loose and separate, not subject to law, not involved in the network of relationships, by which in fact they are so obviously bound up with their physical, social, and spiritual environment. We regard as absurd the idea that there is no causal process in nature and no organic connection between events and things in the lives of other people,
but at the same time we accept as axiomatic the notion that our own sacred ego is loose and separate from the universe, a law unto itself above the moral dharma and even, in many respects, above the natural law of causality. Both in Buddhism and Catholicism, monks and nuns were encouraged to avoid the personal pronoun and to speak of themselves in terms of circumlocutions that clearly indicated their real relationship with the cosmic reality and their fellow creatures. The precaution was a wise one. Our responses to familiar words are conditioned reflexes. By changing the stimulus, we can do something to change the response. No Pavlov bell, no salivation, no harping on words like me and mine, no purely automatic and unreflecting egotism. When a monk speaks of himself, not as I, but as this sinner or this unprofitable servant, he tends to stop taking his loose and separate selfhood for granted, and makes himself aware of his real, organic relationship with God and his neighbors. In practice words are used for other purposes than for making statements about facts. Very often they are used rhetorically, in order to arouse the passions and direct the will towards some course of action regarded as desirable. And sometimes, too, they are used poetically, that is to say, they are used in such a way that, besides making a statement about real or imaginary things and events, and besides appealing rhetorically to the will and the passions, they cause the reader to be aware that they are beautiful. Beauty in art or nature is a matter of relationships between things not in themselves intrinsically beautiful. There is nothing beautiful, for example, about the vocables, time, or syllable. But when they are used in such a phrase as to the last syllable of recorded time, the relationship between the sound of the component words, between our ideas of the things for which they stand, and between the overtones of association with which each word and the phrase as a whole are charged, is apprehended, by a direct and immediate intuition, as being beautiful. About the rhetorical use of words nothing much need be said. There is rhetoric for good causes and there is rhetoric for bad causes, rhetoric which is tolerably true to facts as well as emotionally moving, and rhetoric which is unconsciously or deliberately a lie. To learn to discriminate between the different kinds of rhetoric is an essential part of intellectual morality, and intellectual morality is as necessary a precondition of the spiritual life as is the control of the will and the guard of heart and tongue. We have now to consider a more difficult problem. How should the poetical use of words be related to the life of the spirit? And, of course, what applies to the poetical use of words applies equally to the pictorial use of pigments, the musical use of sounds, the sculptural use of clay or stone, in a word, to all the arts. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. But unfortunately Keats failed to specify in which of its principal meanings he was using the word truth. Some critics have assumed that he was using it in the third of the senses listed at the opening of this section, and have therefore dismissed the aphorism as nonsensical. Zn plus H2SO4 equals ZnSO4 plus H2. This is a truth in the third sense of the word, and, manifestly, this truth is not identical with beauty. But no less manifestly Keats was not talking about this kind of truth. He was using the word primarily in its first sense, as a synonym for fact, and secondarily with the significance attached to it in the Johannine phrase, to worship God in truth. His sentence, therefore, carries two meanings. Beauty is the primordial fact, and the primordial fact is beauty, the principle of all particular beauties, and beauty is an immediate experience, and this immediate experience is identical with beauty as principle, beauty as primordial fact. The first of these statements is fully in accord with the doctrines of the perennial philosophy, among the trinities in which the ineffable one makes itself manifest is the trinity of the good, the true, and the beautiful. We perceive beauty in the harmonious intervals between the parts of a whole. In this context the divine ground might be paradoxically dent as pure interval, independent of what is separated and harmonized within the totality. With Keats's statement in its secondary meaning the exponents of the perennial philosophy would certainly disagree. The experience of beauty in art or in nature may be qualitatively akin to the immediate, unitive experience of the divine ground or Godhead, but it is not the same as that experience, and the particular beauty fact experienced, though partaking in some sort of the divine nature, is at several removes from the Godhead. The poet, the nature lover, 
the esthete are granted apprehensions of reality analogous to those vouchsafed to the selfless contemplative, but because they have not troubled to make themselves perfectly selfless, they are incapable of knowing the divine beauty in its fullness, as it is in itself. The poet is born with the capacity of arranging words in such a way that something of the quality of the graces and inspirations he has received can make itself felt to other human beings in the white spaces, so to speak, between the lines of his verse. This is a great and precious gift, but if the poet remains content with his gift, if he persists in worshipping the beauty in art and nature without going on to make himself capable, through selflessness, of apprehending beauty as it is in the divine ground, then he is only an idolater. True, his idolatry is among the highest of which human beings are capable, but an idolatry, nonetheless, it remains. The experience of beauty is pure, self-manifested, compounded equally of joy and consciousness, free from admixture of any other perception, the very twin brother of mystical experience, and the very life of it is supersensuous wonder. It is enjoyed by those who are competent thereto, in identity, just as the form of God is itself the joy with which it is recognized. Visvanatha What follows is the last composition of a Zen nun, who had been in her youth a great beauty and an accomplished poetess. Sixty-six times have these eyes beheld the changing scenes of autumn. I have said enough about moonlight, ask me no more. Only listen to the voice of pines and cedars, when no wind stirs. Ryonin. The silence under windless trees is what Mallarmé would call a croonian musician. But whereas the music for which the poet listened was merely aesthetic and imaginative, it was to pure suchness that the self not contemplative was laying herself open. Be still and know that I am God. This truth is to be lived, it is not to be merely pronounced with the mouth. There is really nothing to argue about in this teaching, any arguing is sure to go against the intent of it. Doctrines given up to controversy and argumentation lead of themselves to birth and death. Hui Neng. Away, then, with the fictions and workings of discursive reason, either for or against Christianity. They are only the wanton spirit of the mind, whilst ignorant of God and insensible of its own nature and condition. Death and life are the only things in question, life is God living and working in the soul, death is the soul living and working according to the sense and reason of bestial flesh and blood. Both this life and this death are of their own growth, growing from their own seed within us, not as busy reason talks and directs, but as the heart turns either to the one or to the other. William Law can I explain the friend to one for whom he is no friend? Jalaluddin Rumi When a mother cries to her sucking babe, Come, O son, I am thy mother. Does the child answer, O mother, show a proof that I shall find comfort in taking thy milk? Jalaluddin Rumi Great truths do not take hold of the hearts of the masses. And now, as all the world is in error, how shall I, though I know the true path, how shall I guide? If I know that I cannot succeed and yet try to force success, this would be but another source of error. Better than to desist and strive no more. But if I do not strive, who will? Chuang Tzu Between the horns of Chuang Tzu's dilemma there is no way but that of love, peace and joy. Only those who manifest their possession, in however small a measure, of the fruits of the spirit can persuade others that the life of the spirit is worth living. Argument and controversy are almost useless, in many cases, indeed, they are positively harmful. But this, of course, is a thing that clever men with a gift for syllogisms and sarcasm, find it peculiarly hard to admit. Milton, no doubt, genuinely believed that he was working for truth, righteousness, and the glory of God by exploding in torrents of learned scurrility against the enemies of his favorite dictator and his favorite brand of nonconformity. In actual fact, of course, he and the other controversialists of the 16th and 17th centuries did nothing but harm to the cause of true religion, for which, on one side or the other, they fought with an equal learning and ingenuity and with the same foul-mouthed intemperance of language. The successive controversies went on, with occasional lucid intervals, for about two hundred years, papists arguing with anti-papists, Protestants with other Protestants, Jesuits with quietists and Jansenists. 
When the noise finally died down, Christianity, which, like any other religion, can survive only if it manifests the fruits of the spirit, was all but dead, the real religion of most educated Europeans, was now nationalistic idolatry. During the 18th century this change to idolatry seemed, after the atrocities committed in the name of Christianity by Wallenstein and Tilly, to be a change for the better. This was because the ruling classes were determined that the horrors of the wars of religion should not be repeated and therefore deliberately tempered power politics with gentlemanliness. Symptoms of gentlemanliness can still be observed in the Napoleonic and Crimean Wars. But the national Molochs were steadily devouring the 18th century ideal. During the First and Second World Wars we have witnessed the total elimination of the old checks and self-restraints. The consequences of political idolatry now display themselves without the smallest mitigation either of humanistic honor and etiquette or of transcendental religion. By its internecine quarrels over words, forms of organization, money, and power, historic Christianity consummated the work of self-destruction, to which its excessive preoccupation with things in time had from the first so tragically committed it. Sell your cleverness and by bewilderment, cleverness is mere opinion. Bewilderment is intuition. Jalaluddin Rumi Reason is like an officer when the king appears, the officer then loses his power and hides himself. Reason is the shadow cast by God, God is the sun. Jalaluddin Rumi Non-rational creatures do not look before or after, but live in the animal eternity of a perpetual present, instinct is their animal grace and constant inspiration, and they are never tempted to live otherwise than in accord with their own animal dharma, or imminent law. Thanks to his reasoning powers and to the instrument of reason, language, man, in his merely human condition, lives nostalgically, apprehensively, and hopefully in the past and future as well as in the present, has no instincts to tell him what to do, must rely on personal cleverness, rather than on inspiration from the divine nature of things finds himself in a condition of chronic civil war between passion and prudence and, on a higher level of awareness and ethical sensibility, between egotism and dawning spirituality. But this wearisome condition of humanity is the indispensable prerequisite of enlightenment and deliverance. Man must live in time in order to be able to advance into eternity, no longer on the animal, but on the spiritual level he must be conscious of himself as a separate ego in order to be able consciously to transcend separate selfhood, he must do battle with the lower self in order that he may become identified with that higher self within him, which is akin to the divine not self, and finally he must make use of his cleverness in order to pass beyond cleverness to the intellectual vision of truth, the immediate, unitive knowledge of the divine ground. Reason and its works are not and cannot be approximate means of union with God. The proximate means is intellect, in the scholastic sense of the word, or spirit. In the last analysis the use and purpose of reason is to create the internal and external conditions favorable to its own transfiguration by and into spirit. It is the lamp by which it finds the way to go beyond itself. We see, then, that as a means to approximate means to an end, discursive reasoning is of enormous value. But if, in our pride and madness, we treat it as approximate means to the divine end, as so many religious people have done and still do, or if, denying the existence of an eternal end, we regard it as at once the means to progress and its ever-receding goal in time, cleverness becomes the enemy, a source of spiritual blindness, moral evil and social disaster. At no period in history has cleverness been so highly valued or, in certain directions, so widely and efficiently trained as at the present time. And at no time have intellectual vision and spirituality been less esteemed, or the end to which they are proximate means less widely and less earnestly sought for. Because technology advances, we fancy that we are making corresponding progress all along the line, because we have considerable power over inanimate nature we are convinced that we are the self-sufficient masters of our fate and captains of our souls, and because cleverness has given us technology and power, we believe, in spite of all the evidence to the contrary, that we have only to go on being yet cleverer in a yet more systematic way to achieve social order, international peace and personal happiness. In Wu C. A. Chengen's extraordinary masterpiece, so admirably translated by Mr. Arthur Whaley, 
there is an episode, at once comical and profound, in which Monkey, who, in the allegory, is the incarnation of human cleverness, gets to heaven and there causes so much trouble that at last Buddha has to be called in to deal with him. It ends in the following passage. I'll have a wager with you, said Buddha. If you are really so clever, jump off the palm of my right hand. If you succeed, I'll tell the Jade Emperor to come and live with me in the Western Paradise, and you shall have his throne without more ado. But if you fail, you shall go back to Earth and do penance there for many a culpa before you come back to me with your talk. This Buddha, monkey thought to himself, is a perfect fool. I can jump a hundred and eight thousand leagues, while his palm cannot be as much as eight inches across. How could I fail to jump clear of it? You're sure you're in a position to do this for me, he asked. Of course I am, said Buddha. He stretched out his right hand, which looked about the size of a lotus leaf. Monkey put his cudgel behind his ear, and leapt with all his might. That's all right, he said to himself. I'm right off it now. He was whizzing so fast that he was almost invisible, and Buddha, watching him with the eye of wisdom, saw a mere whirligig shoot along. Monkey came at last to five pink pillars, sticking up into the air. This is the end of the world, said Monkey to himself. All I have got to do is to go back to Buddha and claim my forfeit. The throne is mine. Wait a minute, he said presently, I'd better just leave a record of some kind, in case I have trouble with Buddha. He plucked a hair and blew on it with magic breath, crying, change. It changed at once into a writing brush charged with heavy ink, and at the base of the central pillar he wrote, the great sage equal to heaven reached this place. Then, to mark his disrespect, he relieved nature at the bottom of the first pillar, and somersaulted back to where he had come from. Standing on Buddha's palm, he said, Well, I've gone and come back. You can go and tell the Jade Emperor to hand over the palaces of heaven. You stinking ape, said Buddha, you've been on the palm of my hand all the time. You're quite mistaken, said Monkey. I got to the end of the world, where I saw five flesh-colored pillars sticking up into the sky. I wrote something on one of them. I'll take you there and show you, if you like. No need for that, said Buddha. Just look down. Monkey peered down with his fiery, steely eyes, and there at the base of the middle finger of Buddha's hand he saw written the words, the great sage equal to heaven reached this place, and from the fork between the thumb and first finger came a smell of monkey's urine. From monkey. And so, having triumphantly urinated on the proffered hand of wisdom, the monkey within us turns back and, full of a bumptious confidence in his own omnipotence, sets out to refashion the world of men and things into something nearer to his heart's desire. Sometimes his intentions are good, sometimes consciously bad. But, whatever the intentions may be, the results of action undertaken by even the most brilliant cleverness, when it is unenlightened by the divine nature of things, unsubordinated to the spirit, are generally evil. That this has always been clearly understood by humanity at large is proved by the usages of language. Cunning and canny are equivalent to knowing, and all three adjectives pass a more or less unfavorable moral judgment on those to whom they are applied. Conceit is just concept, but what a man's mind conceives most clearly is the supreme value of his own ego. Shrewd, which is the participial form of shrew, meaning malicious, and is connected with beshrew, to curse, is now applied, by way of rather dubious compliment, to astute businessmen and attorneys. Wizards are so called because they are wise, wise, of course, in the sense that, in American slang, a wise guy is wise. Conversely, an idiot was once popularly known as an innocent. This use of innocent, says Richard Trench, assumes that to hurt and harm is the chief employment, towards which men turn their intellectual powers, that where they are wise, they are oftenest wise to do evil. Meanwhile it goes without saying that cleverness and accumulated knowledge are indispensable, but always as means to proximate means, and never as proximate means or, what is even worse, as ends in themselves. Quid facerat eruditio sign dilection? Says Saint Bernard. Inftarit.
Quid, absci erudition dilectio? Erarit. What would learning do without love? It would puff up. And love without learning? It would go astray. Such as men themselves are, such will God himself seem to them to be. John Smith, the Platoni Saint. Men's minds perceive second causes. But only prophets perceive the action of the first cause. Jalaluddin Rumi. The amount and kind of knowledge we acquire depends first upon the will and, second, upon our psychophysical constitution and the modifications imposed upon it by environment and our own choice. Thus, Professor Burkett has pointed out that, where technological discovery is concerned man's desire has been the important factor. Once something is definitely wanted, again and again it has been produced in an extremely short time. Conversely, nothing will teach the Bushmen of South Africa to plant and herd. They have no desire to do so. The same is true in regard to ethical and spiritual discoveries. You are as holy as you wish to be, was the motto given by Ruiz Broke to the students who came to visit him. And he might have added, you can therefore know as much of reality as you wish to know, for knowledge is in the knower according to the mode of the knower, and the mode of the knower is, in certain all-important respects, within the knower's control. Liberating knowledge of God comes to the pure in heart and poor in spirit, and though such purity and poverty are enormously difficult of achievement, they are nevertheless possible to all. She said, moreover, that if one would attain to purity of mind it was necessary to abstain altogether from any judgment on one's neighbor and from all empty talk about his conduct. In creatures one should always seek only for the will of God. With great force she said, for no reason whatever should one judge the actions of creatures or their motives. Even when we see that it is an actual sin, we ought not to pass judgment on it, but have holy and sincere compassion and offer it up to God with humble and devout prayer. From the Testament of Saint Catherine of Siena, written down by Tommaso di Petra. This total abstention from judgment upon one's fellows is only one of the conditions of inward purity. The others have already been described in the section on mortification. Learning consists in adding to one's stock day by day. The practice of Tao consists in subtracting day by day, subtracting and yet again subtracting until one has reached inactivity. Lao Tzu It is the inactivity of self-will and ego-centered cleverness that makes possible the activity within the emptied and purified soul of the eternal suchness. And when eternity is known in the heights within, it is also known in the fullness of experience, outside in the world. Didst thou ever descry a glorious eternity in a winged moment of time? Didst thou ever see a bright infinite in the narrow point of an object? Then thou knowest what spirit means, the spire top, whither all things ascend harmoniously, where they meet and sit contented in an unfathomed depth of life. Peter Sterry